introduction. We already had our meeting on Thursday. So just so, and then also obviously introduce Joe. Uh, even though he's not going to be on. Yeah, yeah. Just to make yep. the, the presentation yep. or introduction. Yep. Right. He's not going to be on tonight. Oh, not at all? No. Oh, okay. No. All right. So we, we still have our uh, four. I'll and back, then I'm going to, yeah. I'll back channel that on you. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. And um, I guess the... Uh, there's going to be a couple, you know, I'm going to be, I know I'm going to be recusing from one. So it's a, I believe it's a special permit. So you'll have to assign two of the alternates for that one. What, uh, what are you recusing on? That is nine Arlington Muldoon. Oh, okay. The, the standalone garage. Yes, correct. Yep. And then, uh, so I don't know if anybody else has any recusals. Um, um, well, I didn't mull it in for Westmore and Joe didn't either. So I think Steve, and um carl will be sitting on that one okay that right, steve sounds good great you you started it last not last two meetings ago right yeah and same with you carl correct for up uh, you're muted yes mr okay. chair what? so so you guys what? will be go I, ahead i just logged on uh dave what is the question um Neither Joe nor I mulled in for um, Westmore. So it's going to stay with Steve and you. Okay. okay. So we're looking at, uh, so what, if you need to for that, since the vice chair, Joe, will be gone. If you'd like me to handle that, I will, um, Dave, if you're um, not. I don't have to recuse, but. Oh, I that's right. You can still handle it. You yeah, just, can, yeah, yeah run still, it. Of course. Yeah. So still... then it will just be Nat Barry, myself, Steve and Carl, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, Abby's out. Ab Abby's out on that. I don't oh, think she was. She, she... Was, I don't believe she was included. I think it was. I think it was you and Steve. Is what I got oh, from. Steph. Okay. Got it. And when Megan gets on, she can confirm. Right. Okay. So we're almost there. We're waiting for Megan, and then we'll get going. Wish, wish me luck, guys. Wish me luck. Good luck. You got, it oh, you, you got this. <laughs> got it. You're a natural. <laughs> I like your, uh, your backdrop, Dave. Huh? <laughs> your backdrop says a lot for your first day as chair. It looks there great. <laughs> <laughs> I could go See, lots of places with that. Yeah, I know. Sometimes you're you're in <laughs> Hawaii in a hammock, and <laughs> you look like you're serious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ah, oh, the gang is all here. Mm -hmm. All righty, this is uh, the June twelfth planning mm -hmm. board meeting, twenty twenty three. My name is David Iverson. I am the new chair. Joe Topham will not be with us tonight, but he is the new vice chair. Okay. Um, we're using Zoom in this meeting, which allows for the public to participate in the meeting as an attendee. The chair can request members to provide their names for the purpose of keeping accurate minutes. Attendees must register to participate. The registration link is unique to the meeting. The registration link can be found in the description on Nantucket TV YouTube feed for the meeting, as well as on our agenda. Attendees will join in the listening mode and they can click to raise their hand if they wish to speak. The chair will call on those who have raised their hands in the order they were raised. All questions must be directed through the chair. As a preliminary matter, <clears throat> this is David Iverson, chair of the of the planning board, permit me to confirm all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. John Trudell? Aye. Matt Lowell? Aye. Stephen Welch? Aye. Barry Rector? Aye. Carl Borcher? Aye. Um, staff, could you please uh, respond in the affirmative as I call your name? Megan Trudell? Here. Catherine Ancero. Here. And Billy Sott. Here. Great, thank you. Um, I am going to pass by the anticipated speakers because the list is long. We have over 20 um, public hearings today. So um, <clears throat> please remember to speak clearly in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. 
If members wish to engage with other members, please do so through the chair, um, taking care to identify yourself. After members have spoken, the chair will afford public comment for those members of the public who have joined the meeting via Zoom. Members of the public who wish to speak must state their name and be acknowledged by and speak through the chair. Um, as I mentioned, this is a meeting very heavy on public hearings. So I would like whoever wishes to speak to keep it to two minutes and please don't repeat yourself or I will interrupt or repeat what the previous person has said. Okay. So I, I guess I need to call this meeting to order, right? Well, yeah. And I'll make a motion to, or uh, you make a motion to approve the agenda. Second. <laughs> yep. Do I have an motion to approve the agenda? Second. I'll make a motion. Okay. John May, Barry seconded. John? Aye. Barry? Aye. Nat? Aye. And I am an I myself. Unanimous. Um, meeting minutes. Has everyone read the minutes and okay with it? Yeah. Any adjustments, changes? Barry. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to make a motion at this point. We approve the minutes of May 6th, May 8th, um, both ATM, uh, May 8th, regular, and May and March 20th as submitted. Second. Second. Made by Barry, seconded by John Barry. Aye. John? Aye. Nat? Aye. And I'm an I as well. It's unanimous. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to go by these first two items um, because we'll have them in a public meeting, in a public hearing, correct, Megan? Yeah, so two Eli Place second dwelling is tied to the approval of the special permit. Same with the 13 Surfside tertiary dwelling tied to the special permit. The two Nobadir Way tertiary dwelling was inadvertently left off of Thursday's agenda. So that's why um, it's on this agenda. It's not a public hearing item. It's just a standard tertiary dwelling approval. It's R10 limited, but they did protect themselves with a freeze plan. So that's why they're allowed to move forward with the tertiary. Um, so we would recommend approval of that tertiary dwelling as proposed. Okay. With the standard language that goes um, into the letter. If I may, Mr. Chair, I'll make a, a motion to approve the Knob Act LLC to Nobadier Way tertiary dwelling. Second. Uh, do I have a second? Second. I'm made by John, seconded by Barry. John. Aye. Barry. Aye. Matt. Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Unanimous. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to start off with the public hearings here. Um, the first one is Act Mid Island LLC. That is had a request to continue with an action deadline of 6 30. Have you heard from the. <clears throat> Mr. Sherman? Yes, Barry. Yeah, it's it's really up to the applicant to, to to make sure that they're adequately filing extensions at this point. Um, we do it sometimes just to remind them, but that's as simple as that. It really is inherent upon the applicant every time. But pending that, I'd like to make a motion that we uh, accept the continuance to our next meeting of July 10th. And also, Barry, if I may, to amend to make sure the action <clears throat> deadline is going to be in the July meeting, so we have to extend the uh, the action deadline. Is right, but the opponent. I think it's been it's been extended. It's been extended through August, but typically, okay. while it's we appreciate um, so much dialogue going into that, it's really something that's handled behind this. Okay, great. So, so that's been dealt with. They, they okay, perfect. All yes. right. So, on to the first. Um, but, Mr. Chair, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Point of order. You want it? You want to dispose of the fact that we're just. I made a motion you. and second yes. to, to continue. Did John I'll second? Your... Second, Barry, yes. I'll second. So uh, Barry made, John seconded, Barry. Aye. John. Aye. Nat. Aye. And I'm an I as well. Okay, we're on to the first public hearing, 181 Pulpus Road, Trust, 181 R Pulpus Road. 
So Rick Padet is here to represent the applicant. Great. Thank, thank you, Megan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations on the new title. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Uh, 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 Rick Bodet, I re actually represent the contract purchaser of this property. Uh, Jesse Brescher represents the owner, uh, but she is on vacation having way more fun than the rest of us on this call. And she asked if I, I would present it because it was a pretty simple application that I asked her to file. So um, <clears throat> essentially uh, the Mack family owns uh, all of this property, uh, all four of these lots that you uh, have in your packet. I believe there's a plan in your packet. And uh, in 2012, they came in for, uh, yeah, there are the four lots. Uh, the one we're speaking of is 4515 highlighted in blue there. Uh, they came in in 2012 uh, to create a uh, covenant lot, which mm -hmm. is uh, lot two. Uh, it's the, the L-shaped lot uh, they're right there. Yes, thank you. And, uh, and lot one is the market rate lot. That's just to the left. Thank you. Uh, it, they, they created four lots. The lot we're speaking of in blue, that's lot four. And that one is a wet lot. And, and lot three up on the corner is a wet lot as well. Uh, they all four lots are referenced in the the covenant decision, and specifically the issue I had with the decision is my client owns 183 Pulpus Road, which is behind this lot. You can see uh, my client's tennis court. Uh, we wish to they my client wishes to buy this lot and merge it with uh, their lot instead of these lots. Um, uh, that the Mac family owns. Uh, and the issue with the decision is that the is twofold. One, that it's this lot is included within uh, that decision, which is, is unnecessary, and we want it to be uh, merged with our lot. And the second issue is, is that the decision states that this lot four is unbuildable. Um, it certainly is unbuildable, not having any frontage on its own, um, but it is dry enough closer to my client's property that a small portion of it could be used. I don't know if it ever will. But anyway, um, what uh, what Jesse filed was a request to <clears throat> to eliminate any any reference of this being unbuildable in the decision, and also um, we want to make sure it just isn't included. Lot four is not included in this decision, so we'd like to amend the decision just to state that. That's all. That's the um, the gist of what we're trying to do here. So I'm happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> Through you, Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, um, to Rick. Rick, once uh, once we convey this over and say that it's uh, allowed uh, a buildable, um, obviously we'll increase the ground cover availability for the uh, butter, which is you know fine. Uh, obviously, it's not going to be built on on any kind of wetland area or things like that. Conservation that has a problem with it. Uh, but in the event that we change this over, uh, is, is there a restriction for future subdivision? So it goes over. Then once we approve it, make it buildable. Then you put a dwelling on there and then you subdivide and then you sell off the dwelling yeah um the, the, you know we're not proposing anything and i think the the reason is because um uh, it's so i mean we, we're certainly happy to have that be a condition if if you think it's necessary but it's so wet it's only the only upland portion is really closest to our lot. In other words, there's a little sliver that's outside the 50 vote buffer on this lot. Most of it is actual actual wetland. So I think if you tried to create two lots out of this and my client's lot, um, the issue you would have is there wouldn't be a 90% upland um, in this zoning district, which is lug three. Um, you know, you'd need essentially 110,000 square feet of upland and you'd never get it. Uh, you'd never mm -hmm. get two of those. So, um, but having said that, you know, that's uh, we're, we, the, the purpose of us doing this is to get the ground cover, as you mentioned. Right. So, um, <clears throat> so we're, yeah. we're happy if you want to. Yeah, uh, I, have no problem. I have no problem with that. I, I know the intent. I'm fine with it. Uh, you're just trading one for the other. We're removing a definition. Uh, but again, I don't, uh, you know, not to sway uh, what the public's thinking. Why are they doing this? I, 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 if you don't have a problem, your client doesn't have a problem, 
I would ask that you you put that in so that there's no hidden agenda for future subdevelopment. Uh, we understand that there's an immense amount of ground cover that could be helped with the uh, abutter. Right. Yeah, and I don't think yeah, it's your client, Rick. It's a it's a you know for the future. Who knows who's going to buy that and, and what? Yeah, true. True. Right. right. Mm -hmm. you, your client can have all the great intentions, but we don't know after that. So we're fine. Mm -hmm. Anybody else questions? Mm -hmm. uh, I would entertain a motion to open. Yep. Uh, yeah. Barry? Oh, anybody from the public? Public. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Anyone from the public? Anyone out there? Megan? Yeah. So Emily Molden. So we need to open the public hearing first. Correct. You don't no? need a motion for that. You can well, just start making public I, comment. I you will when you close the public I, I, hearing. I, I, you do need a motion. Hi, Emily. How are you? Hello, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Emily Molden here for the Nantucket Land Council. Um, thank you. I just had a, a couple questions in understanding this um, request. One was just the looking at the um, original special permit that was in the packet. I guess I just wanted to confirm if the other conditions in there um, are being met and just with regard to the dwellings on the other lots. And then um, I guess you guys did just kind of talk about this. I was trying to understand, um, I mean, it, it's not really, it's not, well, it's not listed as a finding that lot four, lots three and four aren't buildable because they're, they're wet and there's wetlands on them. It's actually listed as one of the conditions that lots three and four shall not be buildable. And those are the conditions upon which the previous approval was based. So I mean, I wasn't, I don't, I don't know what the discussion was at that hearing for that proposal or why that was specifically listed as a condition, but I guess I don't really understand why the planning board would undo a condition from a prior permit just to grant additional ground cover to an abutter. So I'm just trying to better understand um, the reasoning behind that. Thank you. Anyone like to speak to that? I mean, that's, I mean, you can think of about six reasons why this would happen now and not in 2012. You know, family situations, the value of that land, even though it's unbuildable, it has a value. Um, I mean, I don't believe this owner, that was Meadows, is right, Rick, before? Yeah, a long time ago, yeah. Yeah. Steve, yeah. I can't think of the new owner, but I've been out there many times. Um, and they have a lot of unbuildable as well. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of peaks and valleys and water out there. So I can see how this could happen because we've had decisions before. We had a, a person, before, when we had the tertiary just came in and someone put it in their decision on Longwood Drive to not allow a tertiary. And I remember saying to the person, are you sure you want to do that? There isn't any place else to build. You know, it's, you know, there's a lot of strange decisions that were made even 10 years ago, 12 years ago. So this is, I see this as an evolving way to utilize land, even though it's going to remain open. It counts as we saw this happen in Monomoy with that jiggling around of that huge gigantic lot so that it could even out the ground cover. I mean, it wasn't more building, it just spreads out the building. In this particular case, it will give the guy more buildable land with current ground cover. Yes, that's true, what Emily's saying, but um, I don't see this as, I see this as a family decision and a way for them to, to keep their property and, and get paid for something that you can't build on. So that's how I see it. There isn't too many local families in Polpus. Mr. Clement. Anyone Mr. else from the public, Megan? Oh. You had Mr. Pocanet. Em yeah. Emily has her hand raised. <laughs> Emily? I can't see you. I'm sorry. There we are. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that, Nat. I guess maybe just to rephrase my question, 
I'm just curious if um, the planning board or, or staff, if anyone is aware, or remembers why that lot was conditioned to not be buildable. I guess I'm sort of just as concerned about undoing a condition that may have been made for a certain reason during that previous permit, um, unless there's sort of an understanding of why that was conditioned that way that's no longer appropriate or, or necessary. Thank you. John, I'll come to you in a sec, Rick. Let, let's have John. Yeah, um, sorry, I can't raise. Well, actually, there it is. <laughs> Some sometimes my screens have a hand raised. <clears throat> um, no, I I don't know. In 2012, I was not on the board. Uh, I think that was a little bit little bit before my time. Um, but again, when you're looking for a subdivision, and it looks like and appears that 90 some odd percent of the 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 subdivision was uh, pretty much non buildable because of wetlands. Uh, you generally say to get the subdivision, we're just going to put this on, a, you know, non-buildable because for the for the most part it is. Um, and then, as Nat would say, you know, uh, 10, 11 years later, you realize, oh, it, there there is a small little section of it that, you know, it, under the definitions can be built upon. Although the the abutter um, already has buildings and such. And they're obviously not going to be building in the heart of the, the land. It's still going to be preserved. Um, but we might, maybe that's where our tennis court is. Maybe we'd like to build a hut there. Maybe we, you know, maybe there's a, uh, a tertiary out there or something on that back portion, but combining it into the overall size of the lot makes it appealable, you know, appealing to, to the homeowner. And it gives privacy and distance, which, you know, nobody wants a tertiary uh, if they're going to be renting out to a year round person right smack on top of their other primary house. So there's a lot, like Nat said, a lot of different things happen. And I, I don't see this as really a, um, a, a, you know, something, an off offensive application because they, it is really the wetlands. It is going to add ground cover. And there's a family that's going to um, benefit from a value standpoint where before it might not have had any value because you're not going to be building on it. So um, all of that with, as I mentioned earlier, I would like to put that, um, that, that, extra finding to prohibit future um, subdivision on that. So it makes everyone sort of happy. And I think it's a really good compromise and we're not really affecting too much and kind of, you know, uh, for, for better, for worse, uh, duping the public and, and with a hidden agenda. This is really something that I believe is a, a fairly reasonable application. I hope that answered a little bit. <laughs> good, good job, Don. Uh, Rick. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, I, th I think a couple of people have kind of taken the words out of my mouth. I mean, I, I think, first of all, you know, the better question is why, why was it in there to begin with? And who, and who knows? <laughs> probably, probably because, um, you know, it's certainly, it's definitely not buildable from, from the other side of it, right? Because the, the wetland um, goes right up to the lot line. I think, and in terms of allowing us to have more ground cover on, on our lot, my client's lot, nothing changes, folks. Right, because right now, even with this lot being turned unbuildable, it's a part of those other lots. So really, yeah. um, it, lot one could build as big a house as they want, use all of this for their ground cover. The only difference is it's shifting over to my client's lot. So um, there's no change in, there's no increase in ground cover, just a change from it being available to one pro party to a different party. So um, I think there's really nothing to this. No, I think the danger is is small here. I think both properties are pretty inhibited by by wetlands, and so I, I don't see a, a huge change for either property. Megan, I just wanted to clarify. I just pulled the minutes from that meeting, and it looks like um, those two lots were called out in the decision as unbuildable because that's how the applicant applied for it in the first place. So it doesn't appear it was. A lengthy conversation or a condition that the planning board felt was appropriate to impose. It looks as though it's simply because the plan itself was proposed that way. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Megan. That that gives some clarity. Um, <clears throat> any more hands up in the public, Megan? Hmm. Yeah. I would entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. Second. 
Made by John, second by Barry. John. Aye. Nat? Aye. Barry? Aye. And I'm an aye, so that's unanimous. And if I could, I would like to make a motion to approve the application with the two, <clears throat> two findings. Now, one, that the applicant's request is in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the zoning bylaw, and two, to pro prohibit future subdivision. Second. Motion made by John. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, sorry, quick no? quick point of order. You need to activate um one of the oh, orders, please. Okay. Yeah. Um I'm gonna activate Abby <clears throat> on this one. We think Carl and Steven got one coming up. <clears throat> I'll restate my motion <laughs> or as stated. <laughs> as stated, seconded by Barry. Mm -hmm. John. Aye. Barry. Aye. Abby. Aye. Nat. Aye. Mm, and I'm an aye, so that's unanimous. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, on to uh, Julie Matthew Ranamo to Eli Place. Do we have a represent someone representing them, Megan? I'm, I'm not seeing Mr. Ranamo here, but this has been continued several times because of our in-person meeting and then town meetings, I can go ahead and present. And if there's something for some reason I can't answer, then we can consider a different option. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me pull up the plan. All right, bear with me just a second. So this is gonna be twofold. The first part is a request for a rear lot special permit. And the second part is a request for a second dwelling. Um, to Eli Place here, you can see it's a lot serviced, a single lot serviced by this roadway lot here. Um, they're requesting that that AR subdivision be converted to a rear lot so that the, the roadway lot can be incorporated into this lot and they can place yeah. a second dwelling here. So that's essentially the ask. Um, mm -hmm. As planning staff, we don't see an issue with that and would recommend approval um, with the standard second dwelling mm -hmm. conditions. And that, of course, it would meet all dimensional requirements of the underlying zoning district for as far as setbacks are concerned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we looked at this already when know what's going on here so it's just <clears throat> it's an undoing the old way of doing something which this is a better option for them as well any other comments from the board barry yeah i'm gonna make a motion at this oh but you gotta open yep. public hearing whoa yep. okay sorry Yes. Anyone from the yeah, public? This is public. This is a public hearing. Yeah. Yep. And and also assign someone, I believe, from the. Yeah. Um, so we'll need to permit. activate an alternate for the special permit component, but the second dwelling component will only be the four members. Correct. Okay. And we're on the special permit portion yes. now. Correct. Mm -hmm. so, Mr. Welch. Sir. Not on this one, my friend. Uh, anyone from the public, Megan? I'm not seeing anybody with their hand raised. Yeah. Motion to close the public hearing then. Second. Motion made by Barry. Second by Nat. Barry? Aye. Nat? Aye. John? Aye. Stephen? Aye. Mm. And, I'm an, and I'm an aye as well. All right. To the merits. So I'll make a motion that we approve the conversion to an AR sub uh, from an AR subdivision into a rear lot subdivision um, with the findings as denoted by staff. And the conditions. And yes. Conditions. And I'll second. And conditions. Barry. Yeah. I'll Thank you. Second Barry. Barry seconded by John. Barry. Aye. John? Aye. Nat? Aye. Stephen. Aye. And I'm an I as well, unanimous. Um, so we circle around, or no, stay on the same one, Megan, for the second dwelling. Oh, yeah, so we can dwelling. move forward now Now that there is a place to put the second dwelling. Um, mm -hmm. We can move forward with, with taking that up. 
Okay. So should we wait to the end or should we take that up now? You can do it now. That would be great. Okay. Um, so this is again Julie and Matt Ramo, two Eli Place, um, second dwelling application. <clears throat> Any comments from the board? Motion to approve the um motion. I'm sorry, I just had some interesting news. Uh motion to approve the secondary dwelling. Second. Oh. All right. Made by Barry, seconded by Nat. Barry. Hi. Nat. Hi. John. Aye. And I'm an I, unanimous. Mr. Can I just ask a question to Megan? Megan, they're gonna come in with an A and R next month, right? Is that yeah. how that they works? will have to? Okay. All right. They'll have to Thank before you. they before they're eligible for a building permit for the second dwelling. Right. Deal yep. With that. yep. Thank you. All righty. Okay. Uh, moving on to public hearing for Sam Piper Place One. <clears throat> bringing over Andrew Burek as the representative for this application, I would suggest that um, although they're technically another? two separate applications and they'll require two votes, um, I would suggest you discuss them together because they're interdependent on one another. Perfect. So this is Sam Piper Place One. Workforce Housing Development for Blewett Court and Simon Piper Two Workforce Home Home Ownership Development Twenty Six Huckle Honey Suckle Drive. Um, Andrew. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you. So this application is for uh, an amendment to both, as Megan mentioned, both special permits for the Sandpiper 1 and Sandpiper 2 workforce home ownership developments. This is similar in nature to the relief that was requested by the Capitol Hall Group and Nantucket property owner when they uh, modified the permits to obtain the community pool facility lot. We're merely looking to make an exchange between Sandpiper 1 and Sandpiper 2 to make a lot that is formally 175% restricted market rate and make the market rate in Sandpiper 1 and the Blue Court portion of our subdivision restricted at the same AMI level, 175%. Great. Questions from the board? Um, I, I have one. Andrew, did, did... Have you had to seek approval from DHCD for this? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, this is um, this portion of our program. The local initiative has only is only um, oh, it's a one seventy administered through the town. We have sought yeah. approval through the town's housing director, Tucker Holland, and we fully expect that. Um, assuming a favorable approval at the special permit process, we'll be going before the select board to have our regulatory agreement modified accordingly. Perfect. Um, anyone from the board again before I go to the public? Megan, do we have anyone in the public? No, I'm not seeing anybody. All right. Entertain a motion. Motion to close the public hearing, sir. Second. Motion made by Barry, seconded by Nat. Barry. Aye. Nat. Aye. John. Aye. And I'm an I. Um, I need to pick a person for this, correct? Carl, you're up. Okay, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair? Yes. If I may, uh, Meg, we're going to take two separate votes here uh, for two separate motions for, um, for approval. Um, for the first one, Sandpiper 1, is there any, before we get to the second one, where I see that we have uh, a couple of individual conditions and findings, uh, is there anything in particular that you'd like me to state for the Sandpiper One South uh, workforce housing, just to approve that application? I, yeah, I think just as the as the finding and condition as detailed, in the, the staff report because the, the page, John. yeah because Sorry, the relief, i see the second page but i didn't want to group those together i wanted to individual put an individual motion for one and an individual for the other and i see that the finding and conditions are listed twice or or once under the second of uh, sandpiper two. Oh, i think so, for for blue it i just didn't write sandpiper two 
So okay. honeysuckle, 26 honeysuckle is sandpaper one. So okay. the staff recommended finding would be that the request is in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the zoning bylaw and the recommended condition specific to 26 honeysuckle is that the affordability restrictions shall only be removed if an affordability restriction is then placed on Blewett Court, on Fort hmm. Blewett Court. Okay, so that would be for the second one. <laughs> Mr. Chair. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Andrew. Um, yes, may I be recognized? Yes. I just wanted to correct, uh, Megan, the 26 is in 26 Honeysuckle. That's in Sandpiper 2. I just want to make sure the motions are correct. 26 Honeysuckle is in Sandpiper 2, 4 Blue, it's in Sandpiper 1. I mm -hmm. see what I did here. Okay. Oh, I wouldn't want to have to retake a vote. That's <laughs> I see. Okay. So the, the agenda item is correct. So, Megan, so let, me drive stand by two. let me just correct. try this and you can correct me or interject if you need to. Uh, for the first one, Sandpiper Place One Workforce uh, Home Ownership Development for Blue Court uh, would approve the ap application with the finding uh, of one that the applicant's request is in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the bylaw. Is that all we need for that particular motion? Mm -hmm. Great. I'll second. Great. Made by John, seconded by Barry. John. Aye. Barry. Aye. Nat. Aye. Carl. Was it Aye. Carl? Yes, Carl. Aye. Great. And we're going to keep you on for the second vote, too, Carl, please. Andrew, and I think your hand you up. Say I, a, um, oh, I, I'm you? sorry. And I'm an I as well. Okay. Andrew, Mr. is Chair. your hand up errantly or you have a comment or a question? It is errant, Mr. Chair. I. No, Excuse no, me, I'm a technologically a restrained here and can't figure out how to unraise my hand. <laughs> <laughs> it's down there somewhere. Um, okay, uh, motion on the second piece. All right, I'll make a motion to approve the second application um, in Sandpiper 2, 26, 26 Honeysuckle Drive, with the finding that the applicant's request is in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the by zoning bylaw and the condition that 175% affordability restriction shall only be removed if an affordability restriction shall be placed on the Fort Blewett Court. Mm -hmm. Second. All right, motion made by John, seconded by Barry. John. Aye. Barry. Aye. Nat. Aye. Carl. Aye. And I'm an aye as well, unanimous. Thank, Thank you, you Andrew. All. Um, on to 40 Old South Road, LLC, 20A, I'm sorry, am I going to the right? I'm looking at the, yep, 20, mm -hmm. 2A and 2B Forest Act. Bear with me while I bring some folks over, okay? All righty. Mm -hmm. But just um, for clarification, it's 40 OSR, LLC. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. okay. It gets confusing because of the one that's up next. Yeah. All right, who else should be on this? I'm bringing over Arthur Reed, correct? Please, uh, and Matt McEachern. I'm trying to bring Matt over as a panelist in it. Nothing's happening. Hmm. We'll just allow him to talk, okay? Mm -hmm. Barely, Matt. Uh, uh, there we go. That's way better. Is that better? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And my, my camera works too, if it uh, helps. But if you can hear me, that's fine. Yeah, either way. Um, so who would like to, would, okay, are we uh, ready? Arthur, we're ready. Okay. Me too. Oh, uh, oh there he is. Perfect. This application, uh, was submitted a while back and has changed from the original submission. And what we're now proposing is a 51 seat 
restaurant uh, on the combined two lots uh, that are known as 2A and 2B Forest Avenue. Uh, the, in addition to the restaurant, there will be uh, six uh, two bedroom uh, residential units in the building. Uh, and we are asking for a waiver of three parking spaces overall. In discussion, I know with the uh, applicant in the next application, the uh, 40 Old South Road LLC application, not to be confused with 40 OSR LLC. I, I can understand how people do wind up with that uh, confusion, but uh, we had our name first and they picked theirs second. Uh, in any event, the lots are adjacent to each other. And I know that when this was before the planning board on, the, on their application, uh, that there had been a great deal of discussion about the desirability of there being some uh, coordination of access uh, between the two parcels and working uh, with them and assisted no little bit by the fact that Art Gaspar was the engineer and surveyor for both projects. We've been able to work out a plan which uh, is not in your packet because it was only uh, agreed upon subsequent to the deadline for that, but Megan has it, and I would hope that she could uh, post it on the screen. Um, in any event, it provides for there to be uh, a shared uh, driveway, uh, an entrance, a, a, a two-way entrance uh, for vehicles to both lots uh, from Forest Avenue, uh, a one-way in, uh, uh, driveway to serve both both properties at the uh, northerly end of uh, of two B Forest Avenue, and in addition to that, there would be um, free passage over the walkways in with uh, in the uh, parking area in between the uh, uh, the two ownerships. Uh, we're not specifically calling for there to be. Uh, shared parking, but rather shared access. Uh, I don't think we're going to wind up shooting or put the tires out on uh, any any car that uh, may be crossed on the other side of the line. But uh, I think while we see how it works out, we'll simply deal with it as being an access uh, easement, including the pedestrian access point that's shown uh, from uh, Old South Road. The uh, parking spaces that would serve employees of the restaurant and also the uh, residents of the uh, uh, apartments on the site will be under the building. Uh, you can see that there is a ramp that's proposed and uh, the vehicles will be able to pass into that. We're not proposing that, obviously, for uh, use by the public. I think that would be uh, difficult and confusing, uh, but it will be uh, available and will provide the parking uh, for the uh, residents and the uh, employees. That's essentially what the project consists of at the present time. This shared access plan is not as yet the subject of any easement. Uh, we uh, would obviously like the input from the planning board as to any comments that you may have and any tweaks and obviously uh, it would be a condition of the decision uh, that uh, the um, shared access plan, uh, as it's finally agreed upon, would be uh, uh, part of the decision. Uh, and obviously, one thing that would be uh, that would be subject to would be that there would be no changes in the overall use of either parcel. That uh, uh, this arrangement is based upon the assumption as to what each property is is going to be and what the nature of the use is going to be. So with that, I would turn it over to uh, Art to address some of the uh, issues that have been raised regarding the uh, layout of the property and uh, uh, matters that uh, Ed Pesci weighed in on and so on. Thank you. Um, through you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, so we have um, been uh, diligently working on the on the site plan since and um, uh, revision since receiving Mr. Pesci's uh, comments. I believe that we can uh, satisfy all of those. 
Um, we've also filed uh, the plans, including the joint access with the fire department, received some feedback from them. And um, we did reduce um, the layout by one parking spot in order to accommodate the required setbacks for a subsurface propane tank. It also has the additional benefit of creating a little bit more open space uh, and a little buffer next to um, the entrance to the um, uh, to, to the facility. Um, <clears throat> we're working to, we will, we understand we need a certificate of water quality. Uh, we didn't uh, initially show um, water quality treatment um, uh, structures, but those have been added uh, and will be on the next set of plans that you see. Uh, mm -hmm. We're again amenable and uh, working with, um, you know, to, to, to meet the comments that were raised. Um, we have um, provided the required open space and again, actually um, have increased that a bit more with the um, uh, reduction of a parking spot uh, for um, for that uh, at that entrance. Um, Mr. Pesci wanted a little bit more in information on that, and I can certainly provide it. I've done rather detailed worksheets for myself to make sure that I could calculate those. So I'm confident on those. Um, there was also some comments uh, generally um, about um, the the ramp, which is going to again not to be confused with uh, an ADA ramp. That's a ramp to the subsurface to go uh, drive under uh, the structure, which would again not be for the for the public, but for um, the um, the employees of the building and the in the occupants. Um, and uh, in terms of being able to access that. It's essentially the same size as a parking spot, so it's really no different. If you can pull into a parking spot, you can pull into uh, into that ramp and and drive under the building. Um, I don't see any any engineering concerns there beyond um, uh, you know the actual structural design uh, of the building to accommodate that, and which will of course meet all required building codes. And Matt and his team are are you know on board for that, um, and I believe that that addresses uh you know the bulk of of sort of what was out there we've shown um our screened uh dumpster area we've shown bike racks um the loading zone as shown on that um uh shared access plan would be shared between the two buildings i think that makes a lot of sense for these projects combined uh you could see that for each of the projects the um the screened refuse area would be uh, just sort of um, in between the buildings behind those lotting areas. So that's where the, you know, the trash trucks could be picked up, uh, 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 food delivery could be made um, and sort of keeps it all, I think, uh, combined and a bit out of sight, if you will, for, for both of those. So um, I hope that we've uh, addressed the concerns of, of the board uh, with the application, though we're certainly here to take any additional questions that you may have. Uh, one, I'm sorry, one last point was there was an architectural plan that I had filed um, uh, with, with with the application uh, that was to clarify the, um, the, the ramp and uh, slightly revised building footprint and the open sections that you see on there. Uh, that had included a, a seat layout from a previous design. We've since revised that. We understand that our seats are uh, are limited to 51 based upon the number of parking spaces that we're provided. And we will mm -hmm. provide you, we actually already have it. We just didn't want to submit it the day of the meeting, honestly. Um, uh, we could either put it up on the screen if you wanted to see it, or you could just know that it exists and we will be providing to you uh, a plan that shows a revised seating layout that uh, is uh, in harmony with the number of sp parking spaces that's being provided. Uh, and with that, I'll uh, turn it back to the board. And Matt uh, is also here. Should you have any questions for him? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, John. Uh, yeah, first, I'd like to comment. Um, uh, it's not rare, but it's refreshing that an applicant kind of reviews our suggestions and, and tries to accommodate. And I see that there's a lot of things that were um, spoken and asked to consider, and the applicant has uh, actually taken the suggestions and incorporated into the plan. Um, that being said, it's you know shared shared access. Um, I think the the flow safety 
Um, the uh, when you're looking at parking, you don't necessarily assume that when you put up a barrier where the lot lines were, and then you assume that everybody that's going to go to one building is not going to go to the other. Um, you have the required space. However, you know that during the course of business hours, someone's going to park somewhere in the other. By allowing it to uh, um, kind of open up and be inclusive, I see even the shared uh, loading was a was a you know a, a suggestion that um, I, is for the benefit of of both if they can do that because you're not taking up more space that would be otherwise utilized for you know taking away parking spaces. Um, so I you know it seems like a lot of the things that we had talked about um, the applicant has revisited and, and applied to this application. So again, I, I compliment and um, I think it's refreshing that uh, the applicant is going forth. That being said, I was just curious about the. Uh, the, the parking, the underground parking, um, not that I'm uh, opposed to it. I just think that it has, uh, you know, when you're putting a ramp, um, access to that is maybe taking away a parking place to add a parking place in underground. And I, I, again, I don't have a problem with it, but I think uh, obviously it would open up concerns for any kind of, you know, water going down there through this ramp or, you know, something. And I just wonder if the, 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 you know the cost for that that space has been really um, researched to see if it's really changing anything or adding something that otherwise wouldn't be uh, just with that parking space or or you know not by blocking off that ramp you know uh, uh, appropriated uh, without that but uh, that is the uh, the owner that's an expense uh, I'm not going to stand in the way of that I do like uh, how everything else was uh, opened up and. With the fire department um, giving their two cents, I appreciate that. Uh, I know it, it was mentioned that you lost the space, but if the turning ratio was needed, then so be it. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Great, thanks, John. Any other questions? Barry? You can let Carl go first, that's fine. Okay, Carl. I would yield to you, Barry, first, but I'll go if you want. Okay. I'll do our Chippendale routine, okay? <laughs> um, just had a question about 2A and 2B regarding some information from the Butters letter. I did look at the plans. Is there an elevator in the basement right in the way of the ramp? That's the first question. Um, I would echo some concerns about water and, and interest. Uh, there must be some kind of drainage plan for the base of the ramp. Uh, taking water down the ramp um, toward the basement. Um, I'm uncomfortable with 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. in a uh, mostly residential neighborhood. Um, there are some commercial properties further back here, but there are some residences nearby. I would be more comfortable with 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, for to respect a quiet uh, residential area. Um, and the last thing would be um, in a shared operation of parking, um, do we have an adequate uh, protection for the wellhead district that will be re revealed in the certificate of water quality for TSS for total suspended solids? Um, and art, do we need to go with a storm scepter for both or two storm scepters or your thousand gallon drainage pits, for, um, uh, two catch basins per parking lot? Is that going to be enough or is will, will that satisfy the water quality certificate without the storm scepters. I think they're a little bit more advanced, uh, if I'm not wrong. So that's basically it. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Uh, Arthur, you wanna? Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to to, to address the, those. Um, and I think I could take both Mr. Fidel's, Mr. Borshit's first comment about ramp drainage. Yes, we certainly will have um, most likely a trench drain at the bottom of the ramp to, um, uh, either by gravity or to a small pump chamber that would evacuate that any any water there uh, up to our um, uh, infiltration system, and um, that would the grading of the parking lot would be such that it would only be the ramp itself. We wouldn't allow any water to to flow down there, so we'd just be capturing essentially uh, that you know two hundred square feet roughly of, of of surface area. So it's it's not a, a huge volume of water, but we we are going we can't have the water obviously flow into the structure and 
we're aware of that. So the plan would be a trench drain across there. Um, uh, yes, we are adding um, a, a different technology, but essentially a storm scepter. That was the comments from Mr. Pesci that we, we, that we were working on. Um, and um, we, we understand that the capacity of the uh, system is there. Mr. Pesci did have a comment uh, about that. So we will uh, provide some revised calculations, the exact sizing. The leach bits are, the, the layout's probably going to be generally the same. We might uh, increase the amount of gravel if necessary around them. Obviously we're in a, the outwash plane, very, you know, sandy coarse soils, great infiltration rates there. So um, we'll work through those small details, but ultimately uh, until understanding the board, we're not gonna, you know, we, we need Mr. Pesci's sign off on that. And uh, following which, yes, we will also um, uh, apply for and be required. We understand to receive a certificate of water quality from Wana Comet uh, Water Company, which would include, um, those um what we call water quality and let's the uh storm scepter or the like and the function uh, primary function that they serve two functions really is uh oil gas uh and grit separation so to get any floatables out of there where they could be collected and then to uh remove sediment total um uh total suspended solids or grit if you will uh to settle uh and that's really a secondary to the deep sump cash basins, so which would also have a hooded outlet. So you've got a place where I don't want to get too technical, but certainly the drainage is, is given the um, uh, wellhead protection district. Um, you know, there's a, a double layer, if you will, there where sediment could settle into the catch basin. There is a, a pipe or a hood, as we call it, so that anything that's floating can't go straight down the pipe. Uh, the issue is, of course, if there is a very high intensity storm, there could be some turbidity or stirring up of that. That's followed by uh, a storm scepter type unit, which essentially is a swirling type of a thing that's got a baffle to then also catch those materials and uh, and be be um, uh, then cleaned out. And that's why we've also included the operations and um, uh, maintenance uh, requirements that you know would be fat, um, uh, a condition of your approval, uh, which we, we fully understand and, and accept. So. Uh, um, I could either you or Matt address the point that Carl raised about uh, the neighbor's concern regarding the location of the elevator shaft? Sure, I, I can. Um, so we do show an elevator that goes down to the uh, lower parking level. Um, it, it was not obstructing the uh, driveway access. It got a little tight. It was about uh, 10 foot six. We are not required to have that elevator uh, go down to that lower level. So as part of the revised plan, we've omitted uh, that elevator. Um, so it shouldn't be an issue. And, and part of the revised plan with uh, 51 seats reflected in the plan, we've also eliminated or omitted that elevator shaft uh, on that lower level, but it, but it wasn't obstructing um, the driveway axis. Thank you, Matt. Any, uh, Barry, are you? Yeah, just, just a few things. Um, I'm Going to look forward to looking for the site plan for the garage as well as the landscape plan that that i think we need to address um in the garage itself the underground garage are, are there going to be utilities located down there as well that'll need to be serviceable or will that serviceable utilities will be above ground i i can jump in there yeah. um i think in terms of uh AC condensers, compressors, those would be at grade. Mm -hmm. uh, there may be some utilities inside the um, parking garage, probably specifically the um, the uh, fire suppression system, the uh, uh, pump mm -hmm. equipment, if you will. So there's mm -hmm. likely going to be, there's also going to be HVAC, you know, duct work, et cetera, but um, there likely will be some mechanicals located on those subfloors. Okay. And correct me if I'm wrong here, the garage is primarily intended not for the public at this point, but for the individuals who will be living there and staff. That is correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. All right. So are you going to use a key card system for them? Or something that, that basically restricts that, that underground garage to just people who should be using it? Because I'm afraid if you leave it open, if you just leave it as an open thing, people are just going to be, you know, you're going to get the public going down there as well, too, and doing their thing. There That's be, a good point. No. We, we certainly can do something like that, Barry. Okay. No, I think that would be good. Um, so two more questions I have. Um, 
I'd love you to be able to address on street parking with me because as we see with other places, when things go awry a little bit, people see a streetscape, they see a sidewalk and they think, great, I'm going to park here and the heck with everyone else. So is there any thought, give thought or ideas about that? And if not, I think that's something we need to consider for our next meeting. So uh, if I may, through you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, <clears throat> We would agree um, and post signage along our frontage that mm -hmm. we control, um, and this would go for both projects, uh, essentially no parking here to corner, uh, mm -hmm. you know, no parking this side, followed by a no parking here to corner, um, and, you know, to, to essentially, um, you know, call in any violators of that. Yeah, I know that's about the best you're going to be able to do, but that's, that's good to know that that is at least on the table. Last thing I just wanted to check in with, and I need to have Megan back on board for a sec, or Leslie for that matter. Either of the two, you'll be great. Is there Forest Lane itself has got connections that are running? Are there any, sorry, are there any improvements that we need to be thinking about for Forest Lane as, as we look toward the future of what's going to happen further down that roadway system? Um, if not, I mean, it's certainly something for us to contemplate at our next meeting, but I, I just want to make sure that as this area is being developed, that, that we're taking a proactive stance um, and trying to look toward the future of, of Forest Lane itself and its interconnectedness. So Forest Avenue, oh, through you. Sorry. Here. Uh, Forest Avenue does connect back to Hinsdale, but Hinsdale um, does not provide a connection out in either direction. Um, so mm -hmm. there's not really anything for it to connect to. Um, mm -hmm. The land around it has been acquired by the land bank. There were connections at one point in time if surrounding land was to be developed, um, but mm -hmm. those were longer necessary. I think the applicant could certainly make a provision to ongoing maintenance or amenities along the Old South Road bike path. Um, mm -hmm. People have done that before to, you know, we've used the money for maintenance or we've used it for benches or for um, water fountains, that sort of thing. So that's certainly mm -hmm. something that you could talk about if you haven't already. Good. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, Stephen. Uh, thanks, mm -hmm. Mr. Chair. Um, I guess just some general comments. Um, one is it'd be helpful to make sure, please, in the title block, these drawings are dated. So if this continues on, we have a record of the revisions to refer to. Um, no big deal, but just a small comment. Uh, I understand the water quality sure will get picked up with the um, stormwater management plan, and there'll be some, you know, quite a few drawings that relate to that. So that's helpful. Me mechanical ventilation and will get picked up under the building code review, sprinkler under fire and building review. Um, so other than that, I mean, this is a lot of program in a relatively small space, which I think actually mm -hmm. works out pretty well, considering the downsizing of the number of the restaurant seats. Um, I appreciate the fact that there's gonna be employee housing incorporated. I appreciate mm -hmm. the fact that the uh, parking waiver has been dramatically reduced to I think two perhaps. Um, and that in addition, there is a shared parking arrangement. Uh, I'm, I don't quite remember what the adjacent property will be used for, but I'm, I, for some reason I thought there was office space. And if that's the case, I think with the restaurant that will help with the parking um, that uh, being that there'll be a, um, the hours of use will not directly align. Uh, so that's helpful. And then um, I think my only concern would be, maybe Carl mentioned it, the hours of operation. Um, <clears throat> this isn't really a built up residential neighborhood, but from my reading of the plans, the first floor has kind of an open space and I would think that if there's going to be a 10 p.m., uh, that there uh, uh, hours of operation until 10 p.m., that there would be some provision that that area has some type of sound mitigation, so that it's not just directing sound out into the residential direction versus the other direction, which is the commercial building at 40A. Uh, those are my comments for now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Stephen. Um, <clears throat> anybody else? I I just have one question about um, <clears throat> about the housing you're providing. 
is the intention for that just to be for employees? Um, would you be opposed to a, a restriction on STRs? Tell me about it, please. Yeah, on that, um, we had some discussion about that among ourselves and our present uh, proposal is that of the, of the six apartments, six of them would be made available for rental through the um, ownership of the restaurant, the management of the restaurant for their employees uh, to the extent that they don't need them and don't ask for them for their employees. We could obviously rent them to others. One of the apartments would be uh, not included in that. So five would be available for the restaurant. Uh, one would not. And uh, again, if the to the extent the restaurant doesn't need them, we can put other people in them. Okay. I mean, I guess my question is: is if year round is what we're talking about, or, or something? Oh like yeah. That. There's no yeah. intention to have a short-term rentals in there. Oh gosh, no. Okay. Right. And you should prohibit that. We we will. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, anyone else before we go to the public? Megan, do we have anybody with their hand up? Seeing anyone. Oh, hold on. Uh, Sandra London. Hi, Sandra. Can you hear me? We can. Welcome to the meeting. Okay. Thank you. Um, one of the things that was raised was um, a concern about the hours of operation, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, I live maybe 300, 250 feet away from that building. And that's my, it's my residence. Um, obviously, I, I think that much fewer hours are important. Um, so that's a concern I have. And I don't know whether you actually got any word from the other gentleman about changing those hours. Um, the other thing that was never brought up is the sewer system. It's a private road and the sewer system could be a major issue. And I don't know whether that's been whether that's handled in any way, shape or form. Um, those were two concerns that I had. Um, and we're taking them separately. And I know the other building also has apartments in it. So I'm not sure where that goes with the a number of spaces. Uh, the last question I have also is, how many parking spaces will there be in this basement? That's it for me. Okay, thank you, Sandra. Uh, I'll go to Art Gasparo if you wanna answer the parking questions at least. Sure, um, we would have uh, at least 14 spaces in the basement and it's shown on our site plan. Um, I'd have to defer to Matt if there's any, any additional ones, but we're providing at least 14 uh, in order to um, uh, uh, meet the um, uh, requirement for uh, the uh, the apartments and the in the staff, um, and then um, hours of operation. You know, we've included those um, so that we'd be covered for employees showing up to prep. It's not necessarily that you know that 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 I don't know that the exact hours of the um, uh, restaurant being open are are those hours or not. But my understanding was we wanted to make sure we had a enough time. Uh, bracketed for to cover the activity. Um, I'd have to revisit uh, with the clients any kind of you know uh, restriction of that further. Again, I don't think that my general sense is cutting an hour off of that. Um, you know that the, it's more important to have good good neighbor practices in terms of sound mitigation and not disturbing anybody than the exact you know whether it's six or seven o'clock. But again. Um, you know, I couldn't commit to any kind of a change for that. Uh, the sewer system is adequate. Um, I was just trying to pull up the, um, uh, that's an eight inch main. So, um, there, you know, I can tell you the flow on that off the top of my head, but we're not going to, you know, that neighborhood is not going to fill an eight inch main with or without this project. 
Great, thank you, Arthur. And Sandra, this is this was not this is not going to be approved tonight. Um, and, mm -hmm. and the hours of operation are on the radar, and it will be a continuing discussion. So um, we hear you loud and clear, John. Uh, yeah, just quickly about the hours of operation. Uh, we, it's been brought up a few times tonight. Um, just with art, you know, when you have an op when you're applying for six to ten, um, that just opens the door for hours of operation to open up at six o'clock. Doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to have employees come there at five o'clock to prep. You're just not open for business. So I would feel comfortable even boosting it up, like you said, to be at least an hour um, starting at seven. And I'm not opposed to it. You know, closing at nine. Uh, for the residential area surrounding. But uh, again, when you close the doors at nine, it doesn't mean that their employees are going to lock up, clean tables, put away things, you know. So, um, you know, we're just concentrating on the uh, the hours of operations, not necessarily when people are going to, employees are going to be there. I'll have to clarify that with the, with the applicant. Okay. Thank you, John. Thank you, Arthur. Carl. I think there needs to be a, an awareness of the bar that's on the drawings for that 51 seat restaurant. Has that been cut or is that still there? And how late will that be open? I mean, will that be open till 10 or will it be open till 1 a.m. after the restaurant closes? I may Nine. be missing something here, but uh, I did see a bar on some plans and I apologize if I'm not up to speed on this, but Bars tend to be open longer than restaurants sometimes. So let's just think about that as far as hours of operation as well. Thank you. I think we're waiting for a redraw of, of the restaurant, Carl, um, because I saw some concerning things on those plans too, but I was going to wait until we saw the, the next set of plans. Arthur? Yeah, I could just quickly address that. So the, the, the bar remains on the updated plans. Again, I have those uh, with, I think it's 12 or 13 seats. So again, it's not a... Uh, it's it's ancillary really to the restaurant. If some people you know are more comfortable and want to sit at the bar to eat, might be by themselves that that kind of a thing. Um, it's not a bar, um, you know, nightclub or sort of separate operation. And certainly um, that that couldn't op would not be permitted to operate outside of any approved hours of operation for the overall facility, which uh, currently right now would be ten o'clock would be as late as anybody could be seated there. Um, Leslie. Here we go. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I'd just like to ask about the lighting for the site. I don't think you all have talked about that and I know that they still need to submit some additional plans, but we did have a significant um, change to our lighting bylaw that was approved by town meeting, which obviously hasn't been approved by the attorney general yet. And it has a designated date to go into effect on January 1st, 2024. But I'd like to ask the applicant if they would be willing to design the lighting to be in compliance with those regulations that were approved uh, rather strongly by town meeting. Through you, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, we did include a note on the plan that the outdoor lighting would comply with chapter 102 and I'll just confirm the applicant um, and have a look at the and, and work with Matt as well to, uh, with respect to the um, uh, pending bylaw. Thank you. Barry. Thank you. Just one other thing is as we're talking about hours of operation for the restaurant as well too. Um, there might be an opportunity because I believe you've got outdoor seating as well. Am I correct with that? Nonetheless, um, maybe. Matt, yeah. Uh, currently, we're we're not showing any outdoor seating. Okay, I, I just wanted. I'm sorry. I thought I saw something that caught my attention with that. But you may want to consider as well whether it's worth having two different time frames for both summer and winter. Um, whereas, you know, during the summer, we we do expect certain things to be happening out here for later hours. But during the winter, when things are quieting down, maybe that's an opportunity too. I just want to throw that out as some food for thought, not only just for you, but for the public as well too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
since we've already jumped into the plans and the concerns, I just I have a concern with a label on the plan that says event space. Um, and if that's going to change or if that's your intention, um, I think we need to dis to discuss that now if that's what's going on. Uh, I can respond to that. I, I don't think that's uh, any that's no longer part of the uh, program. And okay. that, I think that will be covered in the revised plans. All right, great. Thank you. We'll look forward to those plans. Um, anyone else on the board or on the public? Uh, we have Deborah Holgate from the public. All right. Welcome, Deborah. You're you're muted. There you go. We we can't hear you, Deborah. Still can't hear you. Do you have a volume on your mic or something? Maybe. Oh, dear. Oh, there we go. Okay, you can hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. To follow up on the on-street parking, I've been reading that Essex is having issues with it being posted no parking, but apparently the police will not ticket and tow because it's a private road. If that is the case, we're in that same situation on Forest. Hmm. Uh, what that has to do with this? They got rocks everywhere over there. <clears throat> so if you try to park, you're gonna drive over a rock and pop a hole in your oil pan. Hopefully not, but I mean. How wide is this road curb to curb, uh, Art? If you don't mind me asking, I I was out, I went out there and measured, but I can't remember what it what it is. Art, yes, you're Sorry. welcome. I just need a second to open a, a drawer and double check that, but I'm almost positive it's twenty feet. But I could get back to you on that one point. Yeah, so there's no there's no room for there's no room for on street. You got to have twenty eight feet. 27 and 28 to have one side and pass and repass. I read the one, I don't know if it was you, Debbie, or the uh, uh, who wrote, I forgot which one of you wrote it, but the, um, you know, Amelia Drive is 23 feet wide and it's kind of functions like West, West Justice Street. And, and that's, you know, done in 1987, I think. So this, I can hear you, but this is not wide enough to have on a street. So, I just oh, want to put that in the forefront and make sure that there is something in line. Um, I also had a question about the event space, but they're telling us that, quote, um, it is currently not showing. So I'm concerned about what currently means and what the future holds. I, I think that, that Deborah, we need to, to, to consider that when we see their next set of plans and and we are um we're aware of it and um when we see the next set at the next meeting i think it'll become more apparent on um what their intentions are and then my final comment was that um attorney reed has stated a couple of times that there were six two-bedroom apartments and looking at the current plans there are two two bedrooms and two three bedrooms so I'm just wondering if that's changing in the new plans. I, I can answer that. That that is the intent uh, uh, to have um, six two bedroom units. So and those plans, will be revised. Those will be revised as well. Yes. Okay. Just wanted a clarification on that. Great. Sure. Any other questions, Deborah? Ah, uh, no. I'm just looking at my notes. I don't think so. Not at this time. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Art. I, I just had one point. I realized I did not address um, Mr. Rector's uh, point on the landscape plan. And we have engaged um, uh, Elizabeth O'Rourke and um, who we're working with on that design. So we'll we'll get you a plan uh, from her that specifies the plan mm. things. Great. 
So it looks like we have a list of things to look forward to next month. Um, do we have any more comments from the public? Megan, anyone else out there? I'm not seeing anyone. All righty. Um, <clears throat> let's make a motion to continue to the yeah. July. Motion made by John, seconded by Barry. John. Aye. Barry? Aye. Nat. Aye. And I'm an aye as well, so that's unanimous. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay on to the next, <clears throat> which is 40 Old South Road, LLC, 40 Old South Road. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, oh. Again, um, oh, I'm sorry. Do you have? Go ahead. Oh, oh uh, Art's Art's representing this application. Okay. Oh, great. Thank you, Art. <laughs> Go for uh, it. For the applicant, uh, Alta Gasparo, Nantucket Engineering. Um, we uh, are really here, I think, to talk about the shared access plan that you saw um, mm -hmm. at the beginning of the last hearing. So, um, I am uh, I'm. Uh, working with Mr. Brescher on this, was not able to make the meeting tonight. But as you could see um, from that filed plan, uh, I don't want to, you know, overly rehash things. But uh, everything that you know, Mr. Reed stated in terms of, um, you know, the um, the shared driveways and the shared sidewalks and the connection to Old South Road has been um, uh, incorporated. And um, we're also not proposing any exterior seating. That had been a concern uh, that had been brought up because there was a plan that had shown some some seats on a patio, and so uh, there's no exterior seating that's that's proposed um, along with uh, this application. And I would um, I just mention uh, again from the last hearing that um, uh, these uh, apartments will be restricted to employees only. So we're providing really, I think, what the board would like to see in terms of, you know, um, uh, housing that is for the people that are going to support the operation. Perfect. Um, questions from the board? I had one more thing, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. We did receive a certificate of water quality from the Water Comet Water Company on this one as well. We, we have that. Great. Carl. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple of quick points. Um, here again, we have the 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. I don't object to employees coming in uh, downstairs or whatever um, to work before the open. I would like to see 8 a.m. to the public and 9 p.m. close to the public. They could stay an hour later and clean up and get ready for the next day or whatever. Um, how are you going to enforce no cars for employees? That doesn't make any sense to me. And um, last, um, there's four mature trees in this lot on the Forest yeah. Avenue side uh, and two banged up pine trees. Um, I would assume those are going to come down and um, that's too bad because the four trees uh, nice trees. The pine trees could probably come down. They're pretty banged up. Uh, they're right next to the sidewalk on Forest Avenue on uh, 40 Old South Road. So I don't know if you can save them or reconfigure the parking lot. It looks like the plan has them gone. Um, I just wanted to make that comment. Um, and I think we covered the storm scepter and TSS already in the last hearing. And that's all. Thank you. Great. Um, anyone want to address any of Carl's concerns? Um, <clears throat> again, the hours of operation. Um, <clears throat> it's tough if someone's going to do morning breakfast business to have an eight and eight o'clock opening, and that's that's my only concern. I 100% respect the neighbors. Um, this one's a little closer to Old South Road. I think that that the traffic itself will be loud enough that that an earlier open might not be as 
problematic as it would be next door but um those are my thoughts I, i'm just i'm just concerned that um this is a takeout breakfast coffee kind of kind of thing that that we're really eight o'clock is a tough one so john yeah so uh, i'm i'm in agreement dave i think uh you know, even seven o'clock is is more you know closer or appropriate for especially a breakfast place than eight o'clock. Um, I also just wanted to add in what Leslie had stated when we were talking about the previous application as far as lighting, um, if, to make sure uh, they would be uh, amenable to the dark sky compliance um, in that respect, especially since it's. Uh, you know, right next to the other one. Uh, so it's a, a lot of the conversations that we have with the previous application would be, um, uh, you know, relevant with this particular application. Anyone else? Art? I, I'll respond whenever you want me to, either one by one or if you want to wait for everybody. Oh, can, one by one's fine. So, um, uh, we did show the trees on the plan. We located them. They're on the edge of the proposed parking. It is our intent to do everything we can. The owners have asked me. Uh, they don't want to take them down. Um, and so we will uh, try to certainly try to accommodate them. Um, they're, um, uh, you know, fairly close to the edge of that that sidewalk. So uh, as we have them shown, it's our it is our intent to do our best to preserve those those trees. Um, the hours of operation, I couldn't commit to a to a change. I think that would be um, something that I'd have to talk to them about, but I don't think they really want to. These are the hours that I believe they um, have set that they that they want to to use. How will they control the no employee parking? Exactly what they told me is that it'll be family. Um, essentially, their employees are all their family. Um, I don't know how you work that in, but that was what was conveyed to me. Um, you know, and again, the intent is. Um, uh, uh, that they need that parking for their operation and they're not going to want, um, you know, cars sitting there so that they can't do business. Um, so I think there is a, 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 fa or a sort of a, almost a, a self check and balance, if you will, in, in that for a business to be successful. Um, this drain system is a little bit different. This has the deep sump in the hood, but not the storm scepter. Uh, this one is uh, not a MCD. It is in the wellhead, but uh, it was deemed acceptable um, with that arrangement um, for um, uh, for one of comments. So um, that we we do have that, and we did include a, um, a operation and maintenance um, for that system, essentially uh, sweeping and um, and cleaning of inspections and cleanings of the um, of the catch basin. It's not as large of a, a parking area either. Um, I think that addressed the, the questions that I that I heard. Barry. Thank you. Um, I, I think with the hours of operation, I, since they're in much closer proximity to 40 Old South Road, I, I might be willing to give them a chance to see how that performs. Um, again, keeping in mind, too, that this is a special permit. And if we're finding that, you know, the the um, the activity is, is so egregious in the neighborhood, there's no unearthly reason why we couldn't reopen the public hearing and modify the hours of operation. So it's just something, you know, it's not a one and done deal here. Um, and that's just something I think we need to keep our eyes on as well. Thank you. It, to be clear, Barrier, you're in favor of, of the hours that they're asking for. I think considering that they're they're strictly takeout, um that they're in much closer proximity to 40 old south road um you know i mean it, it's whatever the will of the board here is too but no, i just wanted to understand where your position is so that my 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 position yeah my position at the moment is for them to choose very wisely about their hours i'd be willing to give that a shot with them with the understanding up to that you know we will monitor that and you know if the if the board's truly concerned as well we can do like we've done with other things too is do a one-year review on it and see where that brings us to as well so i just want to throw that out of some potentials thank you great thank you very not yeah dave let's i just want to bring this back to at least close to earth 
Um, across the street is open at six. Espresso mm-hmm. to go. Mm-hmm. On, on a on a kind of a bumpy existing dirt road that has increased its use over time. Some light commercial activity on on, on the roadside. And I want to get back to something that we don't talk about very much is new build stuff like this. When it's a new build restaurant, which is a rare thing here, it's usually a building that's already built and gets converted to one or was one or something. No one knows exactly what's going to happen. Okay. We had, you know, West Creek road is the perfect example of a road where everybody was angry about parking tried to make it one way for a while that didn't work but then all of a sudden everybody became friendly and started opening up their parking lots to other other places that were open when they were closed so i don't like to get too hung up on this i mean i think this is a good plan the best thing is that they're at least they're connecting together that's key. Mm-hmm. Maybe Arthur Reed can talk to the Cumberland Farms property owners <laughs> and get them to come around. Yeah. Right? So, you know, the good thing about this is it's fresh. We have people involved that, that are not from somewhere else and they know the problems that we have in other places. They're all familiar with it. And I don't think that this is going to be like high intensity. This is a lot of money to build new stuff today on Nantucket. Forget about what a house costs to build. This is going to be really expensive. So let's give them a fair shake. There are other businesses all around it that are, if this was at the end of Forest Ave or in not on the road spot, that would be a different story. Um, there's a lot of walkability. There's a lot of, you know, street crossings, people parking in one place and walking. I mean, that happens all the time. Happens everywhere in the stop and shop area. People park at stop and shop and walk to other places. So I think this will be okay. I think, you know, we'll continue this obviously, but I think that they've made a lot of progress since that first hearing. So. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And, and I agree. And, and I wasn't arguing. I just want to understand where Barry's stance was, was on the hours. I, I'm not, not arguing either way. I just wanted to make yeah, sure. No, I know. So, yeah. Um, anyone else from the board before we go to the public? Barry. Thanks. Just one more thing. I was looking back through the site plan again. Um, Leslie, Megan, uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, is it worth thinking about putting in a crosswalk as well, too? in that vicinity, closer toward the, um, closer toward where the restaurants are and stuff as opposed to on the opposite side. And I'm just trying to think here a little bit. I think that's something we should look into between now and the next meeting. Yeah, I'm not suggesting we have an answer right this second, but I, it, it's just, I don't wanna let that run away without at least having given it to some thought. All right, thanks. Oh, good point, Barry. Um, anybody else? Um, let's go to the public, Megan. We have Sandra. Hi, welcome back, Sandra. You're muted. Yep. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. Um, how many apartments are in the latest plan? for 40 Old South Road. Through you, Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes, please. Um, uh, That plan hasn't changed at all. There's a second and third floor, um, which together uh, include a two bedroom apartment and a three bedroom apartment. So one two bedroom apartment and one three bedroom apartment is, is all there is for apartment spaces. Yes, ma'am. Uh, okay. Mr. Chair. Yeah. And will they be parking underground? No. This is a, this is a separate site, Sandra. I know. 
Okay. I know they're sharing parking, but they're or entrances, but not parking for apartments in that 40 L South Road. Am they're, I correct? They're sharing access. They are not sharing parking. Is okay. that accurate, Art? That's exactly correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Any other questions, Sandra? No, that's it. Okay. Thank you very much. Barry. I just uh, speaking about that parking for employees, I, I thought there was a representation that the uh, habitants of, of those apartments would be pretty much family at this point. So there may be an opportunity. Again, I just I, I want to throw that out because that may change the dynamic here a bit. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Do we have anyone else from the public, Megan? I'm not seeing anyone. Okay. Um, I think Barry, they represented it in, that that they were they were not providing any, and that makes sense, any employee parking because the employees are going to be living upstairs and they're all family. Mm -hmm. It's so. it's. And the only reason I'm bringing that up is it may be something that would ultimately we're going to, it may translate into the decision yeah. that we do as well, but um, there'll be time yeah. to work on that. I think it already is actually. All right. Thanks. Yep. John. Uh, yeah. I just want to uh, just let everybody know that I, although I appreciate family, um, we have to also think about the application as if, Maybe one year, five years, 10 years down the line, somebody might sell and it might not be family. Oh, so when we're reviewing things and, and you know, considering, uh, you know, any kind of decision that we make, we have to, you know, although it's appreciative that they're saying that and it, it's going to apply and I hope that they stay here for the next 50 years, um, you just have to assume that, you know, you know life is, uh, throws you curves and we just have to plan for that. Well, That's it's stated in the condition, so it, mm -hmm. if it does sell and they want to change, they'll have to come before us. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd, I'd like to also suggest adding no STRs in the decision just for that very reason in case it sells. Uh, Art? I, I, I agree. I think that... Um... You know, the they indicated to me that it, that it was family. I didn't put that as a sort of a, you know, restriction. I think the restriction would be um, employees only with the expectation that the way they operate and knowing them is that it is family. I'm not sure how you get into enforcing that. I think that could just get, you know, I'll defer to staff as well, but I, I don't know. But I think that, um, and I hope I'm not going out on a limb here with them, but given that they've told me it's employee housing, I think that the, uh, additional, um, uh, give a restriction, if you will, is, is exactly what you just hit on the, no STRs. Yeah. And That's the condition, the, the condition, or the proposed condition reads, the apartment should be occupied by employees of commercial space below and their families only. And, so, right. And okay, thank you. So, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the board's pleasure on this? Motion to continue July 10th, sir. Oh, Mr. Chair, um, sorry. Oh, is there sorry. a reason we have to continue? I thought we had everything on this one. I, I'm with you, Art. So I, I think we should. Oh, all right. You look at this, Barry, and make sure that there. I mean, I, I'm not opposed to continuing, but I think everything is in order here. We we should decide mm -hmm. on the hours of operation if we're all right with that. Um, okay. Making sure that they're compliant with the lighting. Um, uh, no STRs in the conditions. Is there anything else I'm missing, guys? And the the parking coming mm -hmm. back one. How is that going to get worded? The parking coming back, meaning more. a change of ownership, triggering a uh, something like that. A change of not yeah. owner, um, but you know what I mean, like use change or something. I mean, I think they'll have to come back to us for a use change anyway, right? So we could adjust the parking, Megan or or Leslie. I was just going to suggest. I think what a similar condition we placed on permits in the past is that any change in um, control ownership or use would require planning board review like a like a liquor license didn't we do that with meat and fish i think we did something like that with them i remember something but that's good so if we could add that in um 
Mr. Was Chair. Part? Yes, sir. Um, just a reminder, I think uh, Crosswalk came up. Yep. Mm. Um, that, <clears throat> or just a hook, if I may, uh, just a hook into a crosswalk. It might be the overall thing with both places. Yeah, not necessarily. You get it. I'm going to go to Leslie first and then come back to you, Barry. All right, since the planning board doesn't actually control the placement of a crosswalk, perhaps you could just put a condition in that you, you know, recommend the placement of a crosswalk and for the owner slash applicant to meet with the DPW to discuss uh, a proper location if applicable. Mm -hmm. Perfect. The coordinated review. Perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Very. And I forget, I'm sorry, did we talk about contributions to the bike path or improvements to South Road or um, just they agreed to a $5,000 donation. All right, great. I'm sorry. I, yeah, I thought I saw that somewhere and then I missed it. Yep. Nope. You saw it. Thank you. Um, is the board fine with the hours as, as applied for? Mm -hmm. I, I think we talked about it where the location is, especially with the uh, conformity of the building uh, with the hours across the street. Uh, it, it's okay for the operation uh, that they propose would take out. Unless all the board members had something opposed to that. Great, Carl. Was that to, was that to move it to seven, John? I forgot. No, no. I was I was saying I was saying seven would be better if you know employees would come in earlier. But I'm I'm honestly okay with the six o'clock. I know the businesses of this sort. Oh, okay. Got no. Yeah, I am too. Carl. Okay. You know, the only thing is, is I'm I'm not in favor of those hours as, as applied for, but I would ask Barry if he wants to put a condition in to review in a year mm -hmm. this permit. That I am in favor of. Um, if okay. if we're going to start with six to ten, maybe we could look at it in a year if it doesn't work. I so think that's fair, Carl. That's work. We've done that before. You know, mm -hmm. so. It's a fair request, and Megan will have that written yeah. in. I believe, yeah. Right, Megan? Okay. Great. Um, and also, to, to to Carl's point, just have to have a date of when that begins. Obviously, like the day they open or something like that. That's a ways from now. So, certificate of occupancy, maybe. Yeah, something something to that, that effect. We generally try to do it. Most of the places that we've done it at are seasonal type places, so we've done it in the fall. But in this one, we may need to be a little different. But Either way, I think that's a great suggestion um, to do. Okay. Kind of standard now. I, I agree. So, so, so we're, we're fine with the hours of operation. We're going to add no STRs, going to light compliance. Um, and they are going to meet with the DPW to discuss the possibility of a crosswalk. Also, uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, yes. uh, we talked about change in use of ownership uh, requiring planning board review yep. and mm -hmm. also under number four of the conditions with the hour of operations uh, review in one year. Yeah. From CO. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. So I think before yeah. we make any motions, we'd have to close out the public yep. um, I motion to close public if we're going to vote on this today. Yeah. Instead of and you'll want to activate someone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to activate Carl. Um, motion made. Oh, did someone second? Did yeah. I, if there's I'll, nobody else in the public, um, I, I would I would ask you to check with Meg. And if not, then I would make a motion to close. So Sandra has her hand raised. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sandra, welcome back. Can we add signage to that agreement on the road? No parking signage on the road. Yes. That's a yes by Arthur and 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 Meg will add that into the, the conditions. Okay. okay, thank you again, Sandra. Okay. So I need a second for John's motion, please. Second. 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 Nat. All right. Sec uh made by John, second by Nat. John. Aye. Barry. Aye. Nat? Aye. And Carl, since you're voting on this one? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. 
So, I'll try and take a stab at this, Dave, and I'll be happy if you correct me if I miss something. Uh, but I'll make a motion to approve the application with the uh, three findings and then the conditions uh, that are stated. I think we have 10 now, uh, one through five, or, or actually one through four, with four being uh, uh, amended to with the review of the one year with the uh, DPW, uh, I'm sorry, one, one year review with the planning board uh, for the hours of operation. And then um, the other ones, uh, as five is written with the contribution and then six being the uh, lighting dark sky compliance, uh, seven being no uh, STRs, uh, employees only, uh, eight being a change in use or ownership would uh, require a planning board review. Um, number nine being uh, the crosswalk uh, recommendation um, and for the applicant to um, uh, maybe meet with the uh, DPW uh, and also 10, uh, no parking signs. And if that is it, if there's something I forgot, I would ask for that. Job, John. Um, we have a second? Second. All right, made by John, seconded by Barry. John. Aye. Barry. Aye. Nat. Aye. Carl. Aye. And I'm an eye as well. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. We are on to Nantucket Old South Road, LLC, 33 Old South Road. Art still up for this one, as is Rick Bidet. It's the Art Gasparo show tonight. <laughs> Hopefully soon <to> end. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Megan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Rick Bodet for the applicant, uh, 26 Tacoma, LLC. Uh, obviously, I'm here with Art Gasparo, your local Old South Road specialist, it seems. Uh, and uh, I believe my client, uh, Clifford Shore, is, is on the call as well. Uh, the property is a portion of what was uh, 33 Old South Road. What you have before you is a definitive subdivision plan uh, for a 13 lot subdivision, one roadway lot and 12 buildable lots in the residential five zoning district it requires 5,000 square feet of lot area. 50 feet of frontage that all the lots comply with that, obviously. Uh, the roadway we're proposing is a one-way 20-foot wide layout, a 10-foot traveled uh, roadway, and uh, 10 feet dedicated to parking along the right side of the roadway. And uh, right, you can see it there. Uh, and in addition, a five-foot easement uh, on the left side for uh, a sidewalk and a, and a grass strip. Uh, the one-way roadway is proposed to travel eastward from Tacoma towards Old South Road. Uh, the 40 parking spaces you see on the plan uh, are proposed to be uh, deeded parking spaces, uh, and, and they also are uh, in addition to any required parking that would be on site for any, anything built there, uh, and, and not instead of. Um, in case anyone was wondering about that. Uh, I know there have been a couple of concerns uh, and questions from Mr. Pesci, uh, and, and also uh, I expect you'll hear from, from uh, Arthur Reed as well as a, as a neighbor. Um, some concerns and questions about the width of the roadway uh, being a 10-foot traveled way, uh, as well as the direction of the roadway. Um, I know that Art uh, has looked at the possibility of uh, widening the roadway a little bit, having say a 12 foot traveled way. I think we have enough lot space uh, to show you that maybe at a, at a future hearing. Um, in terms of the direction, uh, the, the, the direction of this roadway has been, uh, is something that's uh, you know, been developed in conjunction with staff for you know, uh, over, uh, over a course of a couple of years. Um, and, uh, and, and we think it's important to, to keep it moving in that easterly direction, um, <clears throat> primarily because we, we do want to sort of, 
um, isolate the, the residential component, component of this property from the commercial. Um, what you're looking at is the R5 zone, the residential. In front of this up on Old South Road, it's CN District. And you can see, thank you, Megan. Uh, that's all CN and we expect that to be de somehow developed commercially. Um, and uh, and we'd like it, the, the, the residential neighborhood to not be inundated by that commercial traffic. And if we switch the, the direction, uh, you know, we feel strongly that, that that's exactly what's going to happen. So, um, so this, again, it was, it was uh, well thought out and it, and it took some time. And um, now that uh, this portion of, uh, of Young's Way is public, um, you know, we put this together. So, um, so I, I'll turn it over to Art. I think Art will, will describe this from an engineering perspective and then I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have. Um, thank you, thank you, Rick. Um, just to expand on um, uh, what Rick uh, just explained, I do think that um, you know this process helps to refine and improve projects sometimes. And um, with some of the feedback that we've received, um, that what we have looked at is instead of proposing a 20 foot layout that we could change that to 22 feet and then increase that travel lane from 10 feet to 12 feet. And um, to put that in context, uh, you know, you don't typically have uh, on Nantucket roadways that are 24 feet wide, that is two 12 foot lanes. Most of the roads are 18, 20, and sometimes 22 um with you know 9 10 or 11 foot travel lane so you'd be looking at a travel lane that is even larger than uh, most of those that, that exist on the island and we think that would help um you know facilitate since it is a one-way road also facilitate those turning movements for vehicles using that parallel parking uh, we think the parallel parking and the direction of the road makes a lot of sense because uh, you know, it keeps uh, the, the folks parking parallel on your passenger or right hand side, uh, which most um, most drivers are, are most comfortable and accustomed to. Um, and that, you know, this really would help serve um, the, you know, we want to avoid uh, situations uh, such as some other roads in this in this area where the parking has uh, just sort of evolved on the road without the road accommodating that parking and this one way traffic flow really helps to uh to, to make that work um and uh so again from uh we will be ultimately requesting a continuance should there be additional questions or thoughts from the board and um uh working to provide the revised uh layout and uh address mr pesci's uh concerns and get him some more information on the uh, on the drainage with that, I'd be happy to take uh, additional questions or, or comments that may be out there. From the board? Yep. I might as well go first, because I'm probably gonna say something again. So, all right, thank you for this. This is not the first time we've looked at this. Um, I wanna ask, Leslie, a question through you, Mr. Chairman. Yep. When we originally looked at this land, I mean, we knew about this land being becoming available when we all found out that it went all the way to Tacoma, which not everybody knew. We talked about workforce housing bylaw over here. And I'm curious if that has been discussed at all with the applicant or in some manner with photo housing trust because of the funding so forth buy down etc cetera, etc cetera, to get maybe some more housing here and small lots and single homes and etc like we did in richmond that's my first question so I have not personally had a conversation with the owner. I don't know if he's had conversations with other people about that. Um, but, um, you know, this is in the R5 district and we would have to look to see if that even um, meets the requirements or if they're even interested in uh, doing that at this point. Uh, Leslie, if I oh. may, this is, this is Cliff. I don't know if you'd like me to step in because I can just add some color to the whole thing. 
Please. Go um, so as you may know, I, I, I built affordable housing on Nantucket when it took 10 years to litigate it into existence over at Dabram Quarry, uh, also called Compass Rose when we started it. And we had plans to do more workforce housing in those days when, when our affordables were $123,000 a single family house and our market rate houses were 549 with the full package. Uh, we were you know, half, half a million below market then, and now we're a million below market with what we sold. Um, so we've been working on this one for about five years. I actually met with Max about three weeks before he passed away. and We shook hands on this deal that this would become something that would take a long time because it would need two zoning changes plus the roadway ideas. And we shook, shook on it. And then unfortunately, Max passed away which added another year to the equation because his daughter had other plans. And in the end though, we were able to, we were able to put it together. What's happened since then is, is that we had two zoning changes. So the back of the property became R5 because there was a lot of sensitivity about what would happen in the back of the property. Again, when they found out that it ran all the way through to Tacoma, there was a subdivision plan I think that was put through for 19 lots with a road that just went through the middle of the property which was about as inelegant as it gets, Art, with all due respect. Uh, I know that was what we were limited to, but it had a road that sort of went straight through the property, curved over and ended up exiting and entering off Old South, which was um, a, a, an incredibly difficult thing to think about because it would create another cut through from Tacoma in two directions. Plus, you'd have a right and left turn there, which is already problematic. So you'd have two on top of each other because Young's Way was private. So we were able over the course of five years to get the zoning changed to R5 in the back and CN in the front, uh, creating the 1.5 acre for CN in the front, which will involve workforce housing, small apartments. We're looking for studio apartments, one bedroom apartments, something that never occurs on the island, going to slightly larger apartments in the back of that, and then transitioning into a, more of a single family. And the other direction coming on the RC, uh, on the R5 direction, we talked about doing um, an overlay because we have an acre and a half of R5 with Andrew. And we talked about that that would create additional opportunities to do townhomes with smaller lots and larger open spaces. I liked that idea in principle, but I also thought we might be aiming too much density onto one very long site. So we decided to, to do a compliance application with R5 in the back and to, to really focus our attention on the, the CN in the front. So I think you'll be pleased with what Matt and, and I have looked at in terms of the CN piece, because that will involve very socioeconomically diverse housing, starting with literally one bedroom shared kitchens for workforce housing, going up to you know, two bedrooms at the top end of the offering. So I think that will be something that will be very much desired. The entrance there will be off Young's. The taking of Young's as a public way was something we had to work very hard to make sure happened because none of this could happen. It would have all been a single ribbon road through the middle of a hundred foot wide property, which would have really created a, a much less desirable property than what we have here. So I think as an infill use, I, I think we've created something that that has addresses all those levels of housing yeah. that you're talking about. And, you know, I, I think at this point, obviously, we could go further with the R5, I believe, based on Andrew's feedback and create another 33 percent, I'm sorry, 25 percent of additional inclusionary housing back there. But I think we may be sort of gilding the lily at that point because, you know, we're allowed 32 units of inclusionary housing on the front acre and a half. So I, I think here we're thinking about small cottage development, small housing development that is entry level single family offerings. So that's really what we're looking at. Thank you, Cliff. Nice to see you, by the way. How are you doing? You. Thanks. So what about second question? Thank you for that. I didn't, you know, obviously you've got it all figured out. That's great. Um, so the next thing is sidewalk on the one-way road is that in the plan art i'm assuming that it has to be uh through you mr chairman uh yes there is a sidewalk that is shown on the um on the west side of the road 
Um, yeah. uh, it showed yeah. right there uh, on the cross section. I know it's a little, a little hard to see there, but yes. Okay. Um, and improvements to Young's Way coming in from Old South. I'm sure that that's on your radar. And also, you know, I think that, I think John mentioned this earlier. This makes sense coming in that way. Um, it's going to be, you know, it's probably going to be some folks that don't agree. But you're going to be able to turn right at Young's Way and go out if you choose. You're going to have multiple directions to go. And Love is Land Improvement is going to make it so people will be turning right off of, you know, coming out. And they'll have a different option that they, that, that, that they don't have now, which will help this um, neighborhood uh, spread the vehicles out and keeping that one way idea intact. And, and I, I think that's a good, that's a really good idea. Um, if just get you used to thinking about it for a few minutes. So that's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody else from the board? Ooh. Arthur, how wide is the sidewalk you are proposing? Three feet. Um, I, and, and I don't know if it can work in your plans, but I, I think it would be interesting to, to explore maybe widening it and, and making it a, a, you know, a more of a multi-use path that would connect through to Tacoma, would connect farther back on to um, fairgrounds. I, I think that that would be a, a big bonus for the area and the community. So um, I, I would like to see you look into that if it's possible. Barry? Yeah, so just a few things. Um, I didn't initially sit on, on the preliminary plan for this. So I, I, I think a lotting plan might be kind of good in terms of what are we looking at for each lot in terms of what type of dwellings, how many dwellings per lot, um, if there is CN, I'd just like to make sure that, again, if you're just going to do strictly residential with something a little more creative, that that is that's the level of restriction that gets put in place. Um, I, I maybe I don't know, and I'll, I'll defer to Leslie on this one. If um, it would be a good idea to get. Um, Mike Burns involved just with looking at a traffic flow pattern for the area and see which, because this was raised to my staff, to see which methodology works best. Um, the other thing, too, is that I think as we get further down into that area with both Tacoma, Young's Way, and Old South Road, there, there may be some improvements that need to take place there, too, to better manage the level of traffic flow that we're looking at. But again, that'll be all based upon the number of total dwellings that are being proposed for, for this uh, subdivision. So anyways, thank you. Anyone else? Oh, John. Yes, thanks. Uh, I, I just, there was something I mentioned uh, from, from Cliff about maybe uh, smaller residences and uh, just you know just the thought of you know how this could get overblown when you have multiple bedrooms and you know multiple units and then next thing you know there's three and four bedrooms and and then you have parking and then it overflows onto that you know on the space and there there is a segment of our population that really wants to be homeowner um they are not necessarily looking to house eight people and and share a house but that's the only way they can generally afford it but if we're looking at maybe one bedroom and two bedrooms for a couple a single a family uh you know with a child uh less less parking there's there's a need and i think you know there could be a, a premium to that because we're finding that quality of life right now is one of the the most important things and with the amount of lots that are going in here uh bigger isn't necessarily better and then we're going to get uh complaints about uh where we're putting this is going to overflow into the fairgrounds or and or the old south road and that 
those two roads have been taxed to a point where we were talking about earlier in a meeting um, this morning with a, a bunch of different boards and how that's getting backed up uh, beyond where the expectation. So when, when we're looking at maybe downsizing could be a good thing. If we're looking at all of these, you know, m multiple more lots, but smaller buildings to address the, you know, the smaller uh, couples and, and single uh, residents, uh, I think that could be a good thing. And it's just for consideration. That's all. Okay, thank you. I, I would say on the on the housing size, we the initial thing we looked at was actually doing a two bedroom cottage. So doing the secondary building as the as the only offering and allowing a homeowner to, you know, over whatever time it takes them to financially achieve the ability to build the main house to, to have a, a space for a main house. Um, much of what we've discovered, though, is that the construction costs get out of, you know, they, they continue to escalate faster than most people can afford to, to keep up with them. And, the, you know, building them most efficiently at the beginning is, is sensible for most, most families. But certainly, you know, R5 and those size lots don't allow a lot of, you know, as you say, eight bedroom houses with, you know, all of that. So, you know, I know there's at least one lot where we have a, a, a person who can afford only a two bedroom cottage that we were going to relocate to that site. Um, so I, I think there will be some diversity of that, but the smaller, really small units we're intending on for the CN, um, you know, and, and just to be very clear on that, we're intending on some ancillary retail use at the very front at the street, and then it transitions immediately to residential with some ancillary services for residential, like a gym and possibly even a small shared office, um, you know, shared like a multi-desk station office in an apartment type um, development. So, you know, the idea is they're very low intensity on the commercial side, but smaller residential. Um, and again, the design is all rentals because obviously the town then gets full credit for the rentals. So that's something I've worked on with Andrew, um, you know, in terms of the inclusionary. So I just, but I agree with you. I think there will be a diversity of housing sizes and types in the back. And as we really are going to be the entry level um, for the market, you know, no matter how you slice it in that location at that size, I think a lot of that will sort itself out. I think you're, you're, I think there's a great need for that. I think that, um, will be successful. Barry. Yeah. Just as, as we're talking about the front end, which will be along old South road, I mean, commercial makes sense because that's how the corridor is developing itself. But I think, think as we start looking at this project further from a planning board perspective, it'd be good to know how many, what kind of uses you're looking at, potential, maybe potential hours of operation, but I, I think that's going to need to be spec'd out too, because again, that's going to directly impact traffic on Old South Road. And as I said before, maybe there are improvements that we'll need to do to Old South Road too, which could, depending upon the, the density of, of what happens, be like a turning lane or something, a set of turning lanes or something like that to, to try to better accommodate traffic flow in and out of the area. So I just want to get those up on the table as we begin this process. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Um, anyone else before we go to the public? Megan? Arthur Reed. Welcome, Arthur. Welcome back, Arthur. Thank you. This this isn't the last you're going to see of me tonight. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think all in all, this is an excellent project. Uh, I think uh, Cliff does a great job with his projects, and uh, I wish him every success with this one. Uh, my concern is as uh, the uh, owner of the property at Six Young's Way, where, as I think most of you know, my law office is situated. I have spent a much greater portion of my life than I would like to uh, sitting at the edge of Old South Road or frequently a few cars back in Young's Way from the edge of Old South Road, trying to take a left turn. And uh, the traffic is heavy there. It is very difficult. 
to take a left turn from uh, Young's Way uh, into Old South Road, particularly in the summertime or, or uh, high, high traffic periods. And I think that the direction of travel should be the other way. It should be from Old South Road coming down to Tacoma Way. Uh, Tacoma Way is a much less heavily traveled road and uh, virtually all the traffic uh, would be turning right going toward town as the majority of traffic coming out of Young's Way is turning left going towards town. So I think that the <clears throat> direction of travel should be reversed. I think that uh, also you should look at the width of Young's Way at its entrance uh, from Old South Road, uh, entrance or exit, whatever you want to call it, where it meets Old South Road. I know that traffic coming out of Young's Way often seems to take up a fair portion of the width of the way, making it difficult for traffic turning into Young's Way uh, to get by. You can do it, but it, uh, the, the uh, road drops off a bit right at uh, the uh, intersection. There's not an adequate turning radius there. And I think that as part of this project, while uh, the owner is in control of the whole property, that there should be a widening of Old South Road, uh, either by an easement or by uh, granting a parcel to the town to be added to the newly created public way or whatever. I think that that uh, would uh, take care of all the concerns that I have. Again, uh, I was concerned about the width of the road uh, as being uh, only 10 feet. I think that would be unsafe. I'm very glad to hear that it's now being widened out the traveled lane to um, 12 feet. I think that takes care of that uh, issue. I do think that depending upon how the traffic uh, direction is handled, that there may be the need for some uh, stop signs Stop, uh, stop lines and whatever to be uh, included in the traffic mix. And I think that having Mike Burns and uh, any other people who are uh, uh, experts in, in the traffic uh, field take a look at this situation would be a good idea. Again, I applaud the project. I'm all in favor of anything that is going to be providing desperately needed housing stock for Nantucket I just think that uh, the, the, the direction of traffic is a problem, and I think it's important that the project be done right. Thanks very much. Thank you, Arthur. Um, uh, Billy Cassidy. And then Harvey Young. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Rick real quick because he has his hand up, and then, then I'm going to go back to the public. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to clarify through you, Mr. Chairman. I know Arthur mentioned um, the widening of Old South Road. Did he mean Young's Way? He yeah. must have meant Young's Way. Okay. I just <laughs> just wanted to make sure. I'll I'll save the rest of my comments for if he wants to clarify real quick. But I, I'm pretty <laughs> sure he meant Young's Way. Thank you. And, and Rick, Rick, I just also would like to add that, that Young's Way is, uh, you know, in its recent taking is actually quite a bit wider than it is improved. Um, so I, I think there's there's something that could be looked at there. I mean, that that's a newly taken town way, which had historically been private. Um, but what has been taken is quite wide. Okay. So. Arthur, you want to clear up? Yeah, obviously, I meant Young's Way. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But, needs to be widened. And obviously, to the extent that it can be done within the existing layout, that's fine. Uh, one way or another, I think it needs to be wide. needs to be wider right now, granted uh, the amount of traffic that comes through it at the present time, and with this additional traffic, uh, all the more. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Uh, Megan, who do we have again? I'm sorry, I can't see on my screen. That's okay. We have Billy Cassidy followed by Harvey Young. Okay, Billy. Hi, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I'm glad I lingered on here for a moment. And uh, although I have no position on direction of travel or, or those particulars, um, I'm glad that I don't have to argue with Arthur about this. I, I've never met Mr. Shore. I know that he has made a positive difference in a lot of people's lives on the island. And I'm very, very happy that he ended up with this property and is the developer. And, and he's got a great engineer. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Thank you very much. Harvey. 
Hi, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my call. Uh, Harvey Young, 21 Highbrush Path. I also own a piece of property at One Young's Way. Um, I guess my main question is, is a couple of things about the width of Young's Way from Old South Road into, I'm not sure, is this going to continue as Young's Way all, to, all the way to Tacoma? Is it going to get another name where it curves around the Verizon building? And how, how wide is the layout up at uh, the north end of Young's Way? Do you know? Um, Art, do you have the answer for that? Yeah, let me just, um, I, I think I know it off the top of my head, but just give me a minute to double check that if you want to carry on and I will absolutely get back to you. Yep. Not a problem, Harvey. Do you have uh, anything else to add, Harvey, while he's... Yeah, no, I appreciate that you're looking into that. And I think it's important that that end of uh, Young's Way is as wide as is as wide as it can be. Um, and if it needs to be a little wider to accommodate the traffic, that, that any expansion of the road is on the west side of, of this development. I'm definitely in favor of this development. I remember when I saw their first plan and they had a road on their property coming onto Old South Road. And myself and other people in our family said, boy, why don't you use Young? We don't need another road coming onto Old South Road. And um, so I, I hope that road gets nice and wide at that end of Young's Way. And I also wanna ask, is that end of Young's Way now gonna be one way or will that end be two way and the rest of the road will be one way? I, I think that that portion is two way. And then as it goes into the new development, it will become one way. All right, thank you very much. That's all I have at this point. Thank you. Art, did you get a chance to find that or are we still on hold? Uh, no, yeah, yes, Mr. Chairman. So the um, the road layout up there is 30 feet wide and um, the, the pavement width is a bit variable. Um, but averages after your your past the turn and radiuses that that do exist there uh, about nineteen feet wide. Well, it sounds like there's plenty of room to widen. There is a yes, about you know very again varies seven or eight feet along along one side uh, and two to three feet along the other within the layout. Uh, again, not perfectly centered, but approximate. Great. Thank you, Arthur. Rick? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, you know, just a couple of things in, in response. It's um, first of all, it's it's nice to hear um, uh, people supporting the project and and uh, and, you know, really rewarding good behavior. Um, but uh, just a couple of, of um, responses in terms of the, the widening of um, Young's on that on the old south end um you know i think that might be uh, uh more appropriately looked at when we when we do the the front portion because that will be two-way traffic um but obviously you know we would support mike burns um giving us some opinions as well um about what what could help the situation and we'll support you know whatever the whatever the board requires um and i think art will tell you um that 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 turn is a is a good radius. Um, it certainly sounds like it could use a little widening, and um, I think that's fine, particularly you know in the future once we get into the, the commercial aspect of the front. But um, uh, but I, I think currently it is good radius. I mean, I, my office is is right here across the street from this property as well, and um, and we use it nearly daily. So um, and I haven't had a problem other than you know sometimes we escape out the Young's Wayside. So. Um, and just to just to uh, clarify with Harvey's question is, um, you know, the only one way portion will be on, <clears throat> excuse me, the property Mr. Shore owns now, um, the property coming from Tacoma um, uh, to uh, the old South Road side, um, unless that's that's changed. But either way, that's the only portion that's proposed to be one way. So Young's way would not change. <clears throat> Great. That's it. Thank you, Rick. Anyone else from the public, Megan? Um, yes, Harvey. Welcome back, Harv. Uh, thank you. Just one, one short thing, and I appreciate all those answers that cleared up a lot of what I was asking about. 
Um, at the at Young's Way, where it intersects with Old South Road, there's a crosswalk there and access to the bicycle path across the, across the street on Old South Road. Is there going to be any kind of sidewalk put in at this end of Young's or a multi-use path or anything that would connect for pedestrians to connect to that crosswalk to cross there at uh, Old South Road? And that's my final comment. Thank you. Uh, I, yeah, Harv, we've, we've had a little bit of discussion about that and we're urging the developer to widen the path to, to hopefully create maybe more of a multi-use path to, to create a connection. But I see Rick has his hand up, so... Yeah, yeah. In terms of a, a spot, I mean, obviously there'll be a sidewalk, and we'll we'll take a look at widening what's on um, uh, my client's property. If the question is, will we have a sidewalk across uh, the front of this property? I think that's probably something that the, the planning board will require at some point uh, when we come in for for the other piece of this. Um, but we'll certainly look at at, at the multi use path on this property. Excellent. You mean multi use sidewalk? Yes, sidewalk or whatever. Okay. Sidewalk to accommodate more. Yeah. Okay. I don't. I just want to that, add one thing, and uh, um, Mr. Chairman, I, Leslie stepped out for a second. Um, she's back. Oh, she's back now. Okay, we had. Oh God, I can't remember if this was part of the. Fairgrounds OSR fix, but the plan is to build a sidewalk from essentially, um, you know, the entrance to the island there to this actually to Young's Way was in part of something that we had going with. I can't remember if it was the combination of the fairgrounds old south improvement or this was a separate article or capital plan but that that there is a plan to do that it was a few years ago but not that long ago so um you know i think that that it will happen over time and possibly as rick said the next application for the front part for the stand part but either way that's going to be i think you'll see that get done at some point in the next decade for sure. So it is on a plan. It hasn't been, you know, just not looked at. I just just trying to say that because people think that there's nothing being done sometimes. That is actually been uh, proposed. It's just never happened yet for the town meeting or whatever the reason was. I can't remember exactly. We also need to consider a contribution for for, for right. that and, and maybe for that project itself. <clears throat> That's another thing that we as a board need to, to discuss. <clears throat> um, okay. Meg? Leslie? I just want, I'm not saying that usually when you all discuss a contribution to the bike path, it's when the person is not installing their own infrastructure. So in this case, they are proposing to put in a sidewalk or perhaps a wider path. So, okay. so that's their contribution. That sounds reasonable to me. <clears throat> okay, um, Rick, have you have you gotten what you need from us as far as information? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think we have some pretty good guidance here. And so from you guys, we're still looking for a waiver list, some landscape plans, drainage and grading, stormwater. Um, and I have not seen the Pesci review. Is he? It's in your packet. It's in the packet, okay. All right, so great. What's the board's pleasure here? Me too. Okay. I mean, are we going to continue this? I'm assuming. Yeah. Please. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I would entertain a motion. I will make a motion to continue to the July meeting. Second. Great. Motion made by Nat, seconded by Barry. Nat. Aye. Barry. Aye. John. Aye. And I'm an aye as well. 
Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Good, Good job, Clifford. Thank you. See you soon. Thanks. <clears throat>
uh, an affirmation of the reduction of the covenant lot to 20,000 square feet. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Stephen. Questions from the board? John. Not really a question. I'm just uh, generally, uh, I'm one of the, the biggest sticklers when it comes to tertiary and restricting and making sure size and um, and that we adhere to it, uh, what, what we've presented. Uh, this is totally different. It's existing. Uh, we're in an area of a lug three with that uh, couple hundred uh, uh, you know, thousand square feet. We're looking at really the waiver to the 20,000 square feet. So it doesn't meet the necessary percentage. But what we have to understand is in, in other areas that we give covenant lots, you might get 4,000 square feet of a 10,000 square foot lot. And the primary only gets 6,000 square feet. This is a substantial amount. This is a buildable 20,000 um, square feet, a buildable half acre. So when we're looking at this, it's a generous size. And I think we actually could benefit with more of this in a in the lug three area. I think the uh, the owner is being uh, really kind of generous to to offer uh, a restricted uh, covenant home with 10, 20,000 square feet. Uh, the size of it, it doesn't seem like it's it's going to matter to the uh, to the potential buyer, uh, which is a friend because they know this looking at the application. So they're satisfied with it. As far as the curb cut, we're not looking at any kind of safety issues where it's around a bend or core or corner or corner. Um, I there's not too much I can say negatively about this application. I'm in full support of it. Thank you, John. Yep. Matt, anyone else? Yeah, you know, I feel the same way. Um, I call these the airport lots. Um, the little airports out there. It's amazing. Yep. Um, it's, it's incredible how big some of these lots are, and you don't realize that until you look at the plans and know what you're looking at. Um, so I think this is great. Um, taking advantage of the double covenant scenario and our ground cover, I mean, our um, changes that we've made in the tertiary, but at the same time, in this case, as John said, an existingly, you know, something that's existing, when they built that little one bedroom, they weren't thinking about this. They didn't even, never even cross anyone's mind. They were just trying to be close to each other. Well, this allows something really good to happen out there. And um, Tom Nevis is where all the dirt is. So this is good. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. No, agreed. I mean, I, I'm not in favor of waivers for the most part, but this um, this is important and we need we need to get some some real locals in good secure housing. So um, do we have anyone in the public, Megan? I'm not seeing anyone. Motion to call. Motion. Oh, this is a special permit, so you'll need to activate someone there, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, we do. I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing, though. All right. I'll make a motion. We close the public hearing. So, uh, second. All right. Thank you, Barry. Made by Barry. Second by John Barry. All right. John. All right. Nat. Uh, and I'm um, and I as well. And you want to sign someone first, Dave? Mm -hmm. You want to sign yeah. someone first from the uh, alternative for the special yeah. permit? Who's should see? I think Carl did the last one. Mm -hmm. How about you, Abby? Okay. Um, if I may, um, Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion to approve the application with the uh, three findings. Um, and the uh, five conditions listed um, by staff. Um, I think that's it. I don't think we had anything new. Second. All right. Motion made by John, second by Barry. John. Aye. Barry. Aye. Nat. Aye. Abby. She might have got off for a second, Mr. Chairman. Um, Abby, you there? Or... I'm going to reassign to Stephen if I can. I yeah, this guy. Okay, and I'm an I, so that's unanimous. Was that all right, Megan? Did I? 
did that on the fly. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Great job. Congratulations Great job. on the new covenant owner. Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, I think you guys might know I actually live only, uh, you know, a few houses down and I'm excited to see that, you know, this nice uh, year round affordable unit going in the neighborhood. So it's good. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> next is 41 WMR Trust, 41 West Maya Comet Road. That would be you again, Stephen. It is. It is. Uh, so as the board recalls, uh, this is a MMD application. Um, we came in with a, uh, you know, fairly um, significant proposal last time. We got a lot of feedback and I hope that uh, the board will consider the changes that we made to be uh, responsive. I will go through some of them for, the, for you and for the record. Um, so just, you know, for the record, there's an existing uh, 1979 house. It's a three-story house of about 1,461 square feet of ground cover. And we're proposing to, you know, pick it up to add a basement, to make some changes to the fenestration, uh, to add about 430 square feet of second story space, but no additional ground cover. And that has all been approved by the HCC. Um, the dwelling has about 1,654 square feet of decks, and we are proposing to reduce those by 313 square feet, uh, about a 20% reduction, uh, which has also been approved by the HCC. Uh, the property previously had, uh, up until recently when my client bought it, uh, 120 square foot shed that was removed, and we're proposing to replace that with a 200 square foot shed in a different location, one that is designed to uh, act as more screening for the neighbors and the public uh, towards the road. Uh, there was a previous um, proposal for a cabana pavilion of about 224 square feet with 128 square foot pergola, so about a 360 square foot uh, structure that has been eliminated. So there's no impervious surface associated with that and there's no, there's no structure. Um, the prior application had an 18 by 36 square foot pool, which is 648 square feet of ground cover. Uh, the new proposal is uh, proposed at 14 by 32, which is 448 square feet, uh, you know, a 200 square foot reduction, about a third uh, reduction. And we've also altered the uh, coping and uh, patio area to have that uh, reduced in the way it's laid out. Um, previously, the pool equipment was in a fenced area that was behind the um, uh, cabana pavilion structure. Because that structure has been eliminated, we've decided to propose to move the um, pool equipment to an underground um, below grade section under the shed. So that would uh, obviously significantly mitigate any noise or nuisance by by putting it uh, under, you know, in a in a basement structure uh, for the for the shed. Um, there was previously an application to uh, do 8,960 square feet of revegetation of currently uh, disturbed area, but then to disturb 4,087 square feet of not disturbed area. And we heard from the board that that was undesirable. So we have a significant change, uh, which is now that we are going to revegetate 9,471 square feet of um, currently disturbed area and are proposing to only disturb uh, 950 square feet. That disturbance is only um, to change the shape of the driveway. Right now, there's a straight shot on the driveway and it makes the most visibility. And if you add a little bend to it, it will um, limit that visibility. So that's the intent is not to create any new buildable area and not, you know, it's just just add a little grace and screening by changing the shape of the driveway. The original application had a curve in it that the neighbor felt was going to be directing uh, headlights and whatever towards their house. So we changed the shape of it so that that would not be the case. Um, so that is a 10 to 1 ratio of uh, revegetation. And I believe that there's never been any kind of MMD application where uh, nearly 10,000 square feet has been proposed, 9,500 square feet of disturbed area has been proposed to be revegetated. Re um, I point out that that's basically the size of half the lots on the islands, 10,000 square yeah. feet um, is being revegetated. Uh, that is not um, common. Most of the MMD applications 
try to build within the disturbed area with very, very nominal uh, revegetations. So I think that is not uh, an insignificant um, uh, thing that we're doing. Uh, the property currently has a leaching pit, which I'm sure you're well aware of is not that great for the environment. Uh, the system is going to be replaced with a modern uh, system and um, the area where the leaching pit, where the septic system now is going to be allowed to uh, revegetate, uh, naturalize. So that is, uh, you know, not going to not going to be a disturbed area. I mean, it'll be disturbed when it's installed, but it'll be revegetated. Um, so that's where we are on the proposal. I, I think you um, hopefully all see that we're, uh, you know, trying to dial in something that's appropriate for the MMD. Uh, the other thing I want to just discuss on a technical suggestion, um, you know, one of the neighbors or maybe more than one of the neighbors has suggested that, you know, quote unquote, pools are not allowed in the MMD or that pools are inappropriate for the MMD. Um, and I want to point out that that's uh, not true on a couple of levels. W one of them is that the Nantucket bylaw that allows pools allows them in the um, zoning in the MMD zoning district. And in fact, when the town just changed the um, whole pool bylaw, you know, a month ago at the 2023 annual town meeting, that was affirmed. There was no change to it. There, there was certainly an opportunity to uh, make that change and no change was made. So as long as there has been an MMD district, it has always allowed pools um, under the bylaw. Um, secondly, there are only 15 residential uh, lots within the, the MMD district. And of those, four have pools. Of those, three were approved by the planning board within the past few years. And one of them was installed uh, back in 2007 without a permit, but that was affirmed in 2018. So you have a pool that was affirmed in 2018, a pool that was approved in 2020, another pool that was approved in 2020, modified in 2021. Um, at first, that, that pool was um, approved to be within a deck, and then it was modified to be um, allowed to be at grade. Um, three of those pools are on uh, non-waterfront properties, and one of those pools, the most recent one, is on a waterfront lot. So I would say that not only are pools allowed under the bylaw, but those pools have been um, approved by this board within you know, recent memory and most likely by people currently sitting on the board. Um, if you look at the MMD permits that the pool that the planning board has issued, the pool is always an issue. And what the board has always done is take pains to make sure that the noise and visibility and other nuisances that are associated with pools are significantly mitigated. And that's what we would expect to happen here. Um, I have suggested to the board, and I think uh, that you're all aware that um, since the MMD district was uh, adopted the VR district is an, is a newer district that is you know for smaller rural lots and um, a few years ago the town adopted a bylaw that says that VR district pools have to ha meet certain requirements including getting a special permit from the planning board and so the zoning administrator uh, several years ago uh, came up with a um, template for what an appropriate set of, of conditions is for approving pools in rural districts. And so that um, set of guidelines and conditions is, uh, is in every zoning permit uh, issued for a pool in the VR district. Uh, you know, there are obviously some changes that are made on a case by case basis, but it addresses noise, light, environment is environmental issues, you know, all the same things that are applicable in the MMD. And so I have requested and recommended that the board through staff adopt, you know, a similar version of that, uh, of those conditions. Uh, you know, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Your staff has already done it. So I think that's where we are. I am happy to take questions or, uh, you know, hear from the neighbors or the board, whatever you want. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, comments from the board. Carl. Having uh, listened to Attorney Cohen carefully, um, personally, I don't think pools in the uh, Moorlands Mar uh, Management District are appropriate. Um, having heard him, I would hope that the planning board 
uh, would use its discretion in this case um, uh, to reject this proposal for a pool. Um, I'm not sure I have the depth of knowledge of Attorney Cohen or of staff and some of you folks sitting on this board who have been involved in pool votes in the past. <clears throat> I don't agree with a pool in this place. Um, I also don't agree with uh, the large amount of disturbance of the uh, endangered species and uh, plants and animals. However, I did read the Executive Office of Environmental Affairs um, designation uh, that there was, a, you know, involving the take of uh, endangered species and uh, plants. So I have read that. Um, personally, I would uh, not be in favor of a pool, and I would be in favor of minimal disturbance of the Moorlands Management District. And um, I understand they're going to revegetate this with local uh, indigenous plants. That's noble, but uh, it's it's a tough line. I mean, you're talking about property rights for the new owner uh, to do with within the rules what they can with this property. Um, they're two or three hundred yards from the Atlantic Ocean. Um, that's uh, a place to take a swim. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. John. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, for point of order, um, I think if you hadn't, you should uh, assign a an alternate before discussion because clearly um, Carl has stated an opinion. I know. And we <laughs> want you to uh, assign him with bias. So, Carl, you say before no, anybody but... else speaks, I would assign someone. Is, is Abby? Is Abby? John's now. John's our in-house free here. attorney. Okay, you are you are assigned to this, Abby. Okay, and okay, and now for my, uh, thank, you. my thank you for the uh, for the pointer from an old friend. Yeah, uh, and now for my second, I would be curious to hear from Emily Molden. I'm sure she's on. She was on previously. I'd be shocked if she wasn't. Um, so before any other comments that I have, uh, I'd love to hear from her. On um, that being said, I know you're talking to the board, so I would uh, ask you to. Check with the board first, and okay, then yeah, let's, let's do it. Go around, and then we'll bring on um, Emily. Uh, anybody else on the board? Just a sign. Um, That's all we got. Yeah, I sigh several times with an MMD application, regardless of how many times it's the same one. Um, this again, this zoning district, and Steve did a pretty good job explaining the sort of the history. But there's one piece he left out, and that is how many of the lots were in Lug 2 originally. The Cudweed ones, he, he, one of them is one of the ones he talked about. He just didn't say it. That, I think, number three was it. And those were in the two acre. And I don't know how many square, how many square feet is this lot, this particular property, um, Steve? Uh, it was growing through the whole thing. Is this one of those, or is this one bigger? It's not huge. Give me a moment. Yeah, that's what I thought. I know it's not 10, that's for sure. It's uh, 2.9 acres. Yeah, okay. So I sort of, you know, as he mentioned the VR, I mean, what we did with VR, the special permit by the ZBA. Um, but that's it. A VR has a little bit of a height restriction, but they don't, they have 10% ground cover and they allow whatever they allow for that ground cover and that special permit. Um, we have plenty of areas of the island that are near the ocean that you can build a pool. Um, I, <laughs> This this district is essentially a special permit overlay district. It, it has so many rules way beyond the pool um, confusion is the decks. Everything requires a special permit. There's no second dwellings. Correct, Steve? Mm -hmm. Staff? Yeah, of course. yeah that's right? correct. They have, so there are just many things that you can't do. Um, I think because the 
district is sort of, I mean, it's, it's over restrictive. So it, it's, it's hard to, to um, come up with a yes and a no. It doesn't have a yes and it doesn't have a no to, to the pools and other things. It has a no to second drawings. It has a no to what you can't do, but there's maybes mixed into it. And it's hard to make a decision on these. I personally look at the neighbors can't see it. I, I like that you got rid of the cabana stuff. Um, the disturbed area is a big piece of these, in my opinion, that always comes up where existing landscaped or mode or whatever you want to call it area is what gets used and not any new natural growth, natural areas. During construction, we can put conditions on when they do the work. We can, it can be like downtown. We can put a restriction on when they do this. So there's a lot of leverage for that, but to outright, we haven't banned pools in MMD at town meeting. And these people own this property. And it, there is a way to get some kind of water feature. So I'm not opposed to a water feature outright. I just want to make sure that what we, you know, what we look at is, is fits all the other boxes as far as disturbance, time. I like the fact that the pool equipment's underground. That's where we should be headed anyway with a lot of places. It's not that difficult. You can afford a pool, you can afford to make it quiet. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, end my speech at the moment, but for now, but I just think that there's a way to get a pool into one of these places appropriately, if done right. That's it for now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, could I make um, one small point that Nat reminded me of, which is that we also changed the location of the pool. So instead of it being sort of free floating in the middle of the yard, it's now basically pulled up practically next to the house. Um, so I think that was a something that was intended to um, you know, mitigate the, the visibility. Um, yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Um, anyone else on the board before we go to the public? Um, so I, I have a, um, you know, I, I think that, that pools in the MMD have, have always been a hot button topic for our board. Um, I, I and to be fair, there's only one other pool on this street, and, and in some senses, we were duped into, in, in some way, into um, approving it as a medical need, and then after it was approved, it was changed and, and put at grade, and so that leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Um, Stephen is right by saying it is not illegal. That it's a special permit but if you read the purpose of the mmd it really isn't congruent with with that in my opinion um so i i just i, I would hate to to approve the first pool in a neighborhood in a stretch i know there's one at the end of the road in the ocean but none of the rest of the houses on that stretch have a pool so um i, I think that we as a board should think long and hard because we approve one there's going to be five so um with that said, uh, Barry. Thank you. All you, I, Thank you. I, I have to agree with Dave on a lot of the points you just raised. Um, I think I was surprised by the number of pools that went in somewhere around 2019, 2020, 2021. Um, that I was not aware of. So at a minimum, I... I I'd love to go back through those decisions and, and see what the rationales were for wanting to approve those and make those happen. Because I, I agree with Dave, it's it's a sensitive area, even though it's allowed. Um, this is one area that that I think we have to pay some particular and close attention to. 
the other thing is no matter what you wind up doing there i'm just hoping that you know pools generally also mean outdoor lighting and stuff as well too so that whatever you wind up doing on the outside now becomes compliant with our new um, lighting bylaws as well too and hopefully that that'll be taken care of thank you thank you barry uh, megan yep so we have john Bur we have John Barada followed by Emily Molden and then Whit Gifford. Okay. Um, Mr. Barada, welcome. Thank you. Good evening. My name is John Barada. I'm co manager of the 39 West Mayacomic Road LLC, a direct abutter to the applicant. I'd like to state for the record our family's response to 41 and West Mayacomic Road Trust's revised building plans. We appeal to the board shared sentiment expressed during the April 10th planning board meeting regarding the inappropriateness of pool installations in the Moorlands Management District. Although we appreciate 41 West Mayacomet Road Trust's changes to their previously submitted plans, the continued inclusion of a pool in the application suggests the applicant neglected to take note of the board's guidance during the April meeting that installation of a pool in the Moorlands Management District is incongruous to the natural habitat of the area. By agreeing to these revised plans, which continues to include a pool, such a decision would contradict the Moorland Management District's directive to conserve this rare endangered coastal pond landform and protect the area's scenic integrity. Were the board to agree to the installation of this or future pools, in the Moorlands Management District, it would simply encourage the introduction of non-indigenous trees and shrubs into this acknowledged low growth, growing bush ecosystem in order to comply with screening such development from public view, thereby creating an inappropriate stand of high growing vegetation for screening cover that interferes with the open expanse of heath and moorland the use and intensity regulation bylaw is designed to protect. By their very nature, heath and moorlands are areas of low growing shrub species dominating the habitat's vegetative cover. Introduction of non indigenous taller growing vegetation in this area will not only be visually inconsistent with the region, but risks spreading the introduced vegetation within the Moorlands Management District. 40 years ago, Bill Klein had the foresight to identify and mobilize the town to safeguard this irreplaceable coastal region by spearheading creation of the Moorlands Management District for this very purpose. One that now provides you, the planning board, with the authority to administer development in the area with an eye towards sensible growth and protecting the fragile scenic habitat so many enjoy visiting. I hope you agree there is no need for installation of pools in the Moorlands Management District. I would like to add our family has lived in Maya Comet since 1979 and understands firsthand the reasons for Bill Klein's passionate campaign to protect this area from unreasonable development and induce stress on its natural state. When established 40 years ago, the tenor of Moorlands Management District's bylaw language did not include treatment of pools or water features because they were foreign to island construction during that period. However, the spirit of the Moorlands Management District's intended purpose should not be compromised. I've always envisioned islanders who've grown up frequenting Maya Comet would band together for timeless protection of this unique Eden, regardless of the trend du jour influencing the island at the time. We hope the board channels Bill's fervent understanding of this area's fragility and uses this opportunity to definitively push back against the installation of this and future pools in the Moorlands Management District. Thank you for seriously considering our concern with the applicant's revised plans. Thank you, John. Um, Emily? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Emily Molden for the Nantucket Land Council. 
Um, I wonder before I make a few comments, could I through you just ask Mr. Cohen for some clarification on the plans in the packet? Yes. Um, I just, there's a couple of landscaping plans in there. One of them um, has sort of the pink color that shows more of a landscaped area. And I just wanted to confirm if that was a previous design or which is the currently proposed landscape design. Yeah, so the one that's on the screen now with all the green and the little bit of blue is the current plan. So the okay. green is the revegetated and the blue is the driveway. Uh, the prior plan had all that red on it. Okay. Um, that is not, so that was the, um, the red would have been the new disturbance and that is no longer proposed. Okay, great. Thank you for that clarification. That's what I thought, but I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so I have comments on a, a few different aspects of this proposal, and I certainly uh, appreciate the changes that have been made. Starting with the pool, um, we also still feel that it is just simply inappropriate at this site and that it really just is, is contrary to the intention of, of this district, which certainly was created before my time and carefully crafted because of its location on the island. And that this is just not the type of use that's consistent with maintaining the integrity of the surrounding, the surrounding ecosystem. Um, I think that Mr. Barada made some very good and valid point, points about the vegetation community out there and the importance of preventing or um, reducing or prohibiting additional landscaping that's not necessary or hardscaping um, based on the, the surrounding community and trying to maintain that protection. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry that I didn't propose that amendment at town meeting. <laughs> Um, I think as far as some of the other aspects go, the, I think that the, um, I appreciate the change in, um, proposed ground cover with some of the other structures. I still feel that the increased ground cover of the shed is not appropriate, um, adding that additional footprint. Um, the revegetation around the lawn is certainly, I think that's great, especially with the native species that have been provided and, and listed on the plan. I was a little bit, um, I did want to ask, there's a, a line on the plan that's labeled as limit of NHESP easement habitat of rare species. And I wasn't entirely sure what that is actually representing when I went onto the um, online maps um, of the estimated and priority habitat. I see this entire property as being mapped as priority habitat with natural heritage, although there are some adjacent properties that are that are not. Uh, so I wasn't entirely clear what that easement habitat is indicating, but um, I because of of where this is and what the online maps indicate, I'm also very concerned about the proposed driveway relocation. Uh, again, I just think that the additional disturbance and then um, attempt to, to reestablish that area with other species, if it's not necessary, is not something that needs to be done or, or should be done. Um, and I think that's probably most of my comments, um, but I do agree with, with what has been said. I was not in favor of uh, those other previously proposed pools over the last few years. and. Certainly, I'm not in favor with this one either. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Um, so we have Whitney Gifford followed by Thomas Verda and then Christine Donnellan. Okay. Uh, Whitney, welcome. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations on your uh, chairmanship. Um, a couple of technical points. Um, following up on uh, the Barrett uh, comments. Uh, first, the uh, the pools and the MMD, yes, they are allowed, and, and I think Emily had a good point because nobody has thought to explicitly exclude them, um, but they do require special permit approval, um, and there's an awful lot of allowed use language there that, that you, know, you guys have it in your toolbox to deny this. Um, if you look at the uh, language in the uh, MMD, it says to maximize the protection. And it says it three times. It maximize the protection of the endangered plant species, maximize the protection of the scenic views, 
maximize protection of the moorlands. And it's not a safeguard. It's not a best effort type standards. It's maximum. And you've 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 wrestled with this in the past. And I think this is a, a good area and a good case to draw the line and say pools are not appropriate in the MMD. Um, the, the, the proposals uh, are better this time in terms of the reduction in the uh, disturbed areas and the uh, decking and uh, those types of, of concessions, but I don't think it went quite far enough um, to, to get rid of it. Uh, one question through you, Mr. Chairman, to Megan. In the staff report update, it indicates that there was an 80 square foot uh, increase to the shed, which if that's true, then um, not only is the HDC approval of that uh, shed now come into question, but it is also a large enough structure that would have to meet the 50 foot sideline setback uh, in the MMD. Let me look back at the proposal. I actually wrote this up for the May meeting and it was all continued. So it's been a while since I've looked at this. Okay. Um, Stephen, is that, did I misinterpret something that you read or that you proposed? Oh. So there's there was a shed on this lot that was 120 square feet, and that has been removed, and it's proposed to be replaced with a shed that's 200 square feet. Um, so I, I, it's not 280; I, it's 200. But um, I believe that's correct. You know, and again, the point of the shed, as um, the commission, as the board is aware, is to put things like bikes and lawnmowers and gardening accoutrements in it. Have, having a property with no shed just means that most of that stuff is then exterior, which is not better for the environment or the stuff that typically goes in a shed. Um, you know, the shed is not the, uh, you know, swanky kind that, that people put next to a pool. It's down by the down by the parking at the at the you know driveway area, and it's going to have stuff in it. Um, I don't know that there's any benefit to the Moreland's management district by denying proper storage of those things. Thank you. Um, I'm going to I'm going to go to um, Christine because Tom has had a, had a shot, and I'll come back to you, Tom. Okay. It was okay. it was John that went. Oh, was Thomas that John? Was Thomas? Okay. Yeah. I'll I'll um, I'll I'll defer to Christine. No, Tom. No, Tom. Go straight ahead, please. Okay. Uh, Thomas Barretta, uh, uh, speaking in regard to this, um, you've already you've spoken enough about in regard to the pool. I just want to get some other points out there. One part thing of the uh, more than management is protection of the scenic views. The way they have the driveway set up. The vehicles are in front of the house. When the house was uh, transferred, there was a, a view easement that was there that was set up. And it looks like the cars are going to be in the front of the property at the front of the house. And basically, that's the view for the 39 Westmire Comet to be able to actually see the ocean. Um, it's also on the highest point of the property because that's the crest of the hill. So theoretically, the cars are that parking area will be at the highest point. Number one, number two, want to talk about the vegetation. Can we put a restriction in that no materials brought in that they stockpile all the topsoil on site so that we don't have to worry about knotweed and various other dirts that come in from other areas around the island so that we're not contaminating the uh, the heathland out there with uh, material from Sconset or Madiket or whatnot with vegetation landscape that doesn't belong out there. There's plenty of property out there of disturbed soil they're doing, so they should be able to stockpile the, the material on site until they need it. Um, those are my con those are my two major concerns. Um, you know, once again, the Moreland Management District's protection of the scenic views and the way they have this set up with the parking it's going to destroy the, the scenic view for, for us. And, you know, that wasn't really the intent that we had when we put the, um, 
request of the restriction when we or the easement when we when we uh, transferred. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Christine. Yes. Can you can you hear me? Yes. We can. Yes. Okay. Um, I appreciate the changes that were made. However, um, I Joe and I still don't believe that a pool is uh, appropriate in the MMD. Um, pools are noisy, children are noisy, and um, we can hear the music and crowds from the brewery, which is two miles away, um, not 300 to 500 feet away from our property. And as far as the shed goes, um, uh, your board was, uh, did approve um, a storage area under our shed a year ago. And in um, September, Marcus Silverstein denied um, us a permit. He said that a storage area under the shed, even though it's not full height, uh, constitutes ground cover. So, um, I, you know, I, I, so I don't believe that, um, that that would be possible for them to, um, to do. And, you know, we also have a problem with the third floor dormers. I mean, the, the building is beautiful. I mean, the design of the building is beautiful, but it really doesn't belong in our, um, in our quiet little neighborhood. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else with their hand up at the moment, Megan? No. All right, back to the board. Any more comments from the board? John. Uh, yeah, I just, I, I think from the April meeting, my position has not changed. Uh, I. I have a pool. I love a pool. Uh, I'm in a lug one um, neighborhood. Uh, I and I don't like denying pools um, just because if it's if it's the right, um, you know, you should be able to. If there's restrictions against it, then you should. That being said, this is a, a special permit, so we can take a case by case basis, which I will continue to do. However. Um, this is a very, very restrictive area and it's restrictive for a reason. Um, so for uh, many of the reasons, Emily's reasons, uh, Dave, you had your, your reasons I was following and I would replicate those. Um, I just don't, I, I appreciate the reduction of the application uh, with all the uh, revisions that they had made. Um, but I really would have liked to have seen the pool taken out of this. Uh, aside from that, um, I'm amenable to a lot of the things that they were proposing. Uh, even a shed without the, 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 the basement of the shed, uh, even the shed, I think, uh, it, you know, under that 200 square feet, as long as it didn't affect another, uh, you know, setback issue with 50 feet as we're wondering if that affected that. Uh, but even a shed, I agree. I'd rather have uh, a shed, uh, a nice uh, design shed, instead of having uh, bikes and, and lawnmowers and, and equipment, things like that being just, you know, put outside or trying to put in a different part of the house. It just doesn't work. So um, I, I appreciate a lot of the reductions uh, that the uh, and compromises that the owners have made, but I'm just not in favor of this pool and this uh, Moreland's um, Management District. Great, thank you, John Barry. Um, you know, I hate to put things off. We've got a large agenda and I know there's a significant number of items that we've kind of moved off to our next meeting, but on this particular one, I'd just love to have some more time to do a little bit more research on some past decisions and, and try to grapple with where, who, what, when, and why, most importantly, why. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to bring you back Steven. Barry's idea and take a motion to continue. I think Stephen sees where we're at and uh, we'll make some appropriate changes here. Um, I, you know, I think the pool is not looking good for you. Um, yeah. I, 
clean fill was suggested. I think that's that's a smart um, smart yeah. move in this area. Yeah, the, I think protecting the environment in any way we can is uh, something we'd be amenable to. I I, I would I would say that that you know the board obviously has no role in private deed restrictions, but but certainly the point about making sure that there's no invasive species introduced through soil is a, is a good idea. Yeah. Um, and, and how you do and how you deal with the view easement is between you and your neighbor. Yeah. So I would request, uh, unless the, as any other public comment, I'd request that the board continue to the next regular meeting. Now, do you have something yeah. to say? Yeah, I just want to, I just want to ask one thing that just popped into my head a little bit. Um, the town meeting, we define pool sizes, you know, what a hot tub is, et cetera. And that was, a, you know, a good move for us. In the ROH district, you can't even have, you can't have a puddle if it's a water feature. Okay. So what I was going to ask the board or, you know, whoever's out there that wants to comment, is what about the size of a pool? That's a pretty big pool in this picture, in this, I mean, in this application. Are we considering MMD the same as ROH? Nothing, not one thing for swimming of any kind, except the ocean. Because I mean, I could care less. I'm not going to ever live out there. I got, I'm very pleased with how lucky I am to live where I do. Very fortunate. Um, but this, I'm sick of this conversation. I hate it. What is it, every two years, Leslie, that this comes up, maybe three? And it's just frustrating because we're sort of trying to do something that it is allowed, but we're pretending that it's not. And it's ridiculous. I mean, I, I hate, I, I, you know, this zoning district wouldn't pass town meeting today. It would be, it wouldn't even make it if we tried to do something like this now. This is one of those real strange things that happened in the past. I don't agree that, you know, anyone had this great vision, by the way, for this. I think it, you know, this was, you know, the middle of nowhere not too long ago. So, um, I think that we need to just it, just get rid of the pool if that's what everybody wants without even telling me and just say, you know, I think the planning board's decided that we don't agree with pools even though it's allowed. I mean, is that radical? It sounds like that's what everyone wants to do. So I figured I'd throw it out there. Now that we have a defined tiny pool in the zoning bylaw, if none of those are acceptable out here, then we should have that conversation. So the applicants don't spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to try to have a pool. Well, so I, this is like a second curb cut that's really extra controversial, but it's allowed, but we're not supposed to say yes. So that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the time. Matt, thank you for being you. I can't help it. I'm sick of talking about this. <laughs> no, it, we love it. John. Or I'm sorry, Leslie, do you have, you want to jump in? Okay, John. You're muted, John. Oh, sorry. Uh, I don't want to dis disagree with Nat, but um, it's not that it's allowed. It requires a special permit. So if it was allowed, you wouldn't need to come before the board to get a special permit. So it's kind of like, you know, we're going in circles. That's why I had stated you want to take a case by case basis. And if we're going to change something in its entirety to to not just restrict, but to eliminate, that would be an article that would be presented at town meeting in the future. So we're not there yet. Um, but one of the things that we haven't mentioned also, which is this is a very sensitive area, uh, vegetation species, uh, you know, you have, you know, we also haven't restricted at the town level, the discharge and the um, uh, of pools and how we treat them and service them, um, which should be probably another topic at another time. Uh, but 
when we when pool companies they drain pools they just take a hose drain it wherever and and that's where it goes um, yeah. it's not like they pull it out and and treat it or send it off somewhere to be treated so we're sensitive in the areas that it is so uh, again i just go back and i'm not disagreeing i, I have a pool i love a pool <laughs> i like people that have pools to have pools you know it's just it's i don't want to be hypocritical but in this particular area the sensitive area the special area that has all these restrictions for a reason I'm going to be supportive of not having a pool for this particular pro project and maybe other projects that come before us. But I believe what Dave said also, you know, in this strip of land, uh, you know, you approve one, the next one, the next one, the next one. We set a precedent for making it common practice that we can put a pool there. This is not allowed. This is you, you come before a special permit. If it was allowed, everybody would be doing it and wouldn't be here to the planning board to discuss it. Great. Thanks, John. Let's sure. uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. B. Succinct. Uh, yeah, very quick. Uh, just uh, since we, we're discussing legal standards, I do want to point out that um, the idea that a special permit is especially is essentially that nothing is allowed unless you grant it uh, is not quite correct. It's It's almost the opposite. It's that Things that, that are allowed under a special permit are allowed as long as they're meeting the standard within the bylaw. And I don't want to suggest that, oh, you have to 100% do this, but you have to do is look at, are we meeting the standard in the bylaw, you know, which is, are we miti properly mitigating and protecting the environment? So, you know, that point being taken, um, I think that, you know, again, I would request a continuance to the next regular meeting so I can review tonight's meeting with my client and see where we want to go. Great, Stephen. Uh, yeah, I mean, listen, I think it's appropriate, appropriate structures and appropriate places, I think sums it up. Leslie. Thank you. I had to gather my thoughts for a second. That's why I took my hand down. Um, and actually, my comment dovetails perfectly to Stephen's comment. Um, in the special permit section of the code, which is section 30, it says the special permit granting authority shall issue special permits for structures and uses which are in harmony with the general purpose and intent of this chapter, subject to the provisions of such chapter. So if you're going to choose to not grant the permit, then you need to make the finding that it's not in harmony and you need to clearly designate why. So there are performance measures in section 13 in the Moreland's Management District that I think you all should take a really close look at and think about before your next meeting, um, because that, um, those are the findings that you'll need to make and cite whether you do grant it or don't grant it. Great. Thank you. Uh, John, and then I'd entertain a motion, please. Okay. I'm um, sorry. Just one more. Um, it, yes, I agree, Leslie. And, and you know, looking to maximize protection, some of the reasons would be scenic views. Um, pools aren't necessarily part of the scenic view in the Moorlands Management management uh, district uh, protection of the moorlands does it make it um are we protect by adding a pool are we protecting the moorlands i don't think so if anything we're creating a potential um hazard for it and also a disturbance of species when you're digging up uh, a pool uh it, you know no i don't think we're uh, protecting any species whether it be under that 32 by 14 area or within uh, a certain setback. So under the uh, the maximum uh, maximizing the protection for the um, MMD, uh, I would say there's a there's a reason for there could be a one of all three reasons why we could deny a pool. Um, so I, I'd happy to look into that and and cite those if if needed. But I think you can find something under all of those for this particular application. Thank you. Great, thank you. Barry? I want to make a motion we continue to our July 10th meeting. Thank you. Second. Great. Uh, made by Barry, second by Nat. Barry? Aye. Nat? Aye. John? Aye. Abby? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Thank you. Thank you uh, to the board. Thank you, Holly Way. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Surfside Road 13, Ack LLC, 13 Surfside Drive. Um, 
Okay. Issue against Stephen. Again, Stephen Cohen for the applicants. Um, 13 Surfside Drive is a um, 11,155 square foot lot, slightly oversized in the R10 district at the corner of Surfside Drive and Pine Grove Road. So it has um, about 120 uh, linear feet of frontage on one road and another 100 linear feet of frontage on the other road. Um, and um, it currently has a three bedroom duplex, three, un three bedrooms in each unit. Um, and that has about 1,352 square feet of ground cover, which is uh, about half of the 25% of ground cover that's allowed in that uh, district. The property currently has two curb cuts, one on each of the roads. Uh, according to the GIS, uh, it looks like those predate the uh, 1998 photographs. So I believe that they are pre-existing, not conforming. Uh, there is a shed on the property um, that is proposed to be removed and replaced with a tertiary dwelling. Um, the tertiary dwelling is proposed to be 500 square feet of ground cover and up to 900 feet of gross living area. Um, and it's proposed to be a two bedroom structure. So um, the bylaw allows for um, one bedroom per 1400 square feet of uh, lot area. And that would require 11,200 square feet of ground cover of a lot area in order to have eight bedrooms which is only 45 square feet short of what is required um, uh, of what the lot provides. So in other words, the, the lot, in order to have eight bedrooms, we need 11,200 square feet of lot area, and we have 11,155 square feet, which I think is a relatively de minimis uh, difference. The bylaw provides for the planning board with the ability to grant a waiver in these situations, uh, which we are requesting. Um, and I would point out that the um, eight bedrooms would uh, require, um, I think it used to be seven parking spaces and now it might actually be down to five parking spaces under the new town meeting. Uh, but regardless, my client intends to provide nine parking spaces, which would be um, in excess of the requirements uh, for you know better livability. And so uh, typically the board has, when, uh, the, the, when the lot area is sufficient to provide uh, enough parking, uh, granted these waivers when it seems to be close. Uh, so that is essentially what we're looking for, a two-bedroom tertiary and a waiver for that for the second bedroom in that building based on the fact that we're only 45 square feet short. And, and they were providing excess parking. Thank you, Stephen. <clears throat> Comments from the board, please. Carl. Just a clarification, please. Um, one, two, three, four, five, and all cars are in those spots. How are you going to get them out if they're stacked? We've had this discussion many, many times over the years. Um, if you can't back into number five to turn around and pull out, are these vehicles going to back out into Surfside Drive? And that's a safety hazard because that road is really busy. And can someone bring me up to speed on stack parking? And if there's a vehicle in number five there, um, how are they going to get out? besides backing on the Surfside Drive. Otherwise, I mean, this is fine. There's nothing wrong with this at all. Thank you. Yeah, Carl, if I could respond to that. Um, you know, uh, stack parking is allowed in residential parking, um, but if the board wanted to put a condition requiring for an on-site turnaround exclusive of, you know, because I think your point is five doesn't count as a turnaround because it's a parking space we could certainly adjust the uh, design to provide for an on-site turnaround in those spots. Um, I think that that is a smart condition for traffic purposes. Uh, I do want to point out that that's Surfside Drive, not Surfside Road, but uh -huh. it's still a good point. It, I'm yeah, sorry it's, if I said road. I apologize. Um, John, are you, Carl, are you done? Okay, John. No, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, no, that was a great um, suggestion, Carl. And um, Stephen, uh, if if you would provide that, um, you know, as a condition, or we can put that in as a condition, I think that would be great. Um, also, this is uh, generally a year-round neighborhood. Um, I don't have really an issue with any of the proposals. Um, however, I'm just curious if we can put a restriction on no short-term rentals that we've done in, in previous applications, because uh, obviously this is going to really uh, appeal to local year-round uh, residents. 
And if we could put that restriction, if it's if it's our right to do that, and the applicant is in agreement with that, um, I really don't have any uh, objection to any of the uh, proposals. Uh, sure, I have a, a question, uh, Mr. Chairman, through you. Yes. Um, the, the tertiary itself requires a year-round restriction. So I just mm -hmm. want to clarify, is John talking about the other structures? Yes, I will. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, so my client uh, specializes in year-round and workforce housing. So um, as, as long as that condition ran with the tertiary permit, um, then it would be fine. Because as long as my client owns this, it's going to be year-round and workforce housing. Great, thank you. I think I was going to say, I think the owner here has a long history of providing year year-round housing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so a, a short-term restriction tied to the tertiary permit is totally acceptable. Okay, good. Um, uh, my one concern here just to, is in parking as well. And I, I hate to see more yard get used up in parking, but I also hate to see cars lining the street. So if yeah. if we could ask, you know, your, your client to, to be sensitive to that and, and to make sure that doesn't take place. And I, and I think the extra turnaround um, that Carl brought up uh, is probably prudent. Um, yeah. I'm just concerned about cars lining the street. Yeah, I know that Dan Malloy is listening because he's got matters later in the meeting and he's the surveyor and engineer on this. So I have full faith that Dan could design something that would be uh, better in that way. You know, approved through staff with your condition. Great, thank you. Um, any other staff, any other, I'm sorry, any other board member? <clears throat> Megan, do we have uh, any anyone in the public? No, I'm not seeing anyone. All right, Barry? So with that in mind, do you wanna activate someone? I am going to activate Carl. <clears throat> Great. And so I could I make a motion at this point to uh, close the public hearing? Please. Second. So, <laughs> great. Made by Barry, seconded by John. Barry. Aye. John. Aye. Nat. Aye. Carl. Aye. And I'm an aye as well. To the merits. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to make a motion that we approve the special permit with the findings and other um, notifications that were delivered to staff for us at this point. Thank you. Is that to include short-term rentals and a turnaround? To be yes. Staff? Yes, indeed. Thank you. A second. Great. Made by Barry, seconded by John. Barry. Aye. John. Aye. Matt. Aye. Carl. Aye. And I'm an I as well. Unanimous. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Stephen. Um, <clears throat> Keep Real Keeper LLC. Pile. Mr. Mr. Oh, Sherman. okay. I'm sorry. We got to move on to the tertiary approval. Correct. Yep. And so okay. with that, I'm going to make a motion at this point that we approve the tertiary dwelling as conditioned by uh, and with the findings that are made by staff. Second. Great. Um, motion made by Barry, second by Nat. Barry. Aye. Nat. Aye. John. Aye. And I'm and I myself. We only needed four of us for that, correct, staff? Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so thank you. Real, I'm sorry. Someone said oh, I, I just said thank you. Okay, great. Stephen, thank you. Uh Real Keeper LLC, Pile Lane, Subdivision, 10 Surfside Drive. Is this you again, Stephen? No, nope, you get a break. You get a little breather. Oh, okay. Who we got? Dan? Uh, yeah, Dan, Dan Malloy. Malloy. Good afternoon. Great. Thanks. Welcome, Dan. Good afternoon. I'll be quick because it's been a long night. Uh 10 Surfside Drive, you've got a definitive subdivision application in front of you uh, looking for approval of two lots. The purpose of the application, I'll get right to it, is to show the two lots are possible so that we can then proceed with a rear lot subdivision. Uh, <clears throat> so obviously you do have to look at this as if it's a real subdivision could actually happen, but our intent and I believe what's in the staff report is conditions is it's very clear that we intend to go with a rear lot subdivision. 
and a draft of that rear lot plan is included in the package just to give you an idea of what that would look like. Uh, in essence, the property is zoned R10, uh, just over 22,000 square feet in size, and would have two lots. So that's the configuration you're seeing now on the definitive plan with a road, 20 foot right of way down one side, and then two lots coming off of it. Under the rear lot plan, which you'll see in a future date if this is ahead, uh, very similar layout, two lots. Obviously the right of way goes away and we have the strip uh, to get to the rear lot. So that sums it up very quickly. It is the intent of the owner to keep the existing house. We're going to move it to the back of the property. Uh, you probably spin it and put it out back, but the existing house is staying, just moving out to the back. Uh, we did ask for a bunch of waivers to get this, excuse me, to show that this is possible. I can go through those if you'd like, but I believe it's uh, pretty straightforward. And I'd just like to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think it is pretty straightforward. Uh, John, yeah, this is almost identical to a uh, a, a a plan that was approved on Cato Lane. Um, it really looks like it's a copy. Uh, I don't have any problem with this whatsoever. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, anybody else on the board? Barry. Just one thing very quickly, uh, we had talked about a contribution for area improvements at this point. Um, I don't know what the thoughts are of staff about our contribution, maybe $5,000 to accomplish that. But let's I just want to get it up on the table this, and then. It, this is going to end up being a, a, a rear lot. Do we do that with rear yeah. lots? Yeah. We have well, Yes. Okay. All right. I, I'm not. I'm not going to say that we shouldn't ask for something. In this particular case, they're spending a lot of money to move that house that got built in the wrong spot. They got half acre of land more, with the house plunked right in the center of it, mm. and they're not rich. And I just, I'm just giving that. You know, there's a lot of issues with the Surfside Drive and lining up with Maya Comet and the telephone pole gets reset right in the same bad spot every time it gets replaced, which I'll never understand. And I don't know if a contribution from something like this is going to fix anything. But if if there's something that they can do to improve something small or put towards something that we're doing currently, then I'm fine with that. But this is... This is going to be, this is a big move for, for people like this to do, locals. So I appreciate the fact that it can even happen, you know? So that's sort of how I'm looking at this one. I, I could add something to that just to make it easier. So tonight we're before you for the definitive subdivision approval. Uh, so obviously you can condition it uh, if you choose any which way you want. And uh, if you do decide to vote in favor of the application, we will be coming back before you in a month for a real life special permit. So we'll be able to have this discussion again. Mm -hmm. Yep. 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 All righty. Um, any, anyone else from the board? Leslie. I just want to point out, I think that discussion would probably be better as part of the special permit only because the subdivision is mm -hmm. not going to get exercised. They're just using this the subdivision to get to the special permit. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Great, great suggestion. Thank you. Um, Megan, is there anyone in the public? There is not. All righty then. Thanks. Um, Barry. Yeah, motion to close the public hearing, sir. Oh, um, I'm sorry, this is special permit, so we need to- No, nope. nope. no, I'm sorry. AR, AR subdivision. Thanks, okay, I'm sorry. I lost oh, track second. there. I... Second, Barry. So. All righty. Uh, motion made by Barry, seconded by John. Barry. Aye. John. Aye. Nat. Aye. And I'm an aye as well, unanimous. Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dan. We'll just close. Um, on to uh, Westmore Club, 105 Westchester Street, 109 Westchester Street, and 10 Westmore Lane. 
Um, we're going to continue with um, Stephen and Carl on this. I did not mull it in, and um, nor did Joe. So, and and Joe's not here. So, mm -hmm. um, just to inform you of that now, um, Stephen. Hi. Okay. Thank you uh, again, Stephen Cohen, for the applicant. Um, so, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Can you just uh, give me the who's on the board? The five people. Uh, so John, Barry, Nat, Stephen, and Carl. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so I will go through a little background and then I will go through what we have done to be responsive to the comments for the uh, commission. Um, before I do that, I do wanna explain why it's been several months uh, since you've heard from us. Uh, and I wanna say that you know we have um, spent a significant amount of time communicating with the neighbors and trying to resolve some issues with them. Uh, and we also have spent some time working with uh, the state DEP to make sure that we're all on the same page on some environmental issues that are unrelated to the planning board's uh, application. But obviously, we wanted to uh, have them in place because they affect the location of the structures. Um, so we, we think that um, we have, you know, are now prepared to come back to the board. So there are uh, three uh, structures being proposed here. One of them is a new maintenance building that's 1,375 square feet, and that's in the southern side of the Westmore Club property, which is the Westchester side. Um, that structure is uh, currently is being proposed at a place where there is currently storage of maintenance equipment exterior, and we are proposing that that equipment and those activities would get a uh, building for them to uh, both protect the equipment and the materials and also to lessen um, any kind of uh, disturbance that's created by them. Um, I know that uh, one, one or two of the neighbors uh, turned up at, at the first public hearing and said they'd rather there be no structures, but, but I do think that uh, having a structure that takes exterior maintenance and makes it interior uh, maintenance and storage is a, is a benefit. Uh, so there did not appear to be any concern from the board on that structure, so I won't spend much time on it. Um, the second set of structures that were, oh, but before I do, I just want to point out that that structure um, is about 150 feet from the road. So it is not, it's not right up on the road. It's 150 feet from the road. Um, the second uh, uh, proposal or the second portion of the proposal is for a small cottage and uh, garage slash maintenance building um, on the uh, northern side of the structure, essentially directly next door to the existing um, tennis courts. So uh, the garage building I'll start with is um, a single story garage building and half of that is designed to hold a uh, car and half of it is designed to hold, uh, you know, lawnmowers and those kind of things that are already being used in that area and would be added to um, the uh, you know, the structure. So there would be a residential portion and a, um, a, you know, commercial portion, both one for the storage of vehicles and one for the storage of the um, landscaping and maintenance equipment that's already currently being used there. Um, there do not appear to be any concern about that structure. Um, however, the, the more um, discussed structure is the four bedroom cottage that's being proposed. So that cottage is uh, proposed to be um, at uh, 1,537 square feet approximately, uh, which is a reduction of about 30% from the 2,250 square foot building that was originally proposed. Um, I would point out that a 1,537 square foot cottage is a very, very modest building. Um, and the elevations have been pro provided to show you that. Um, we have also reduced the height of that structure from uh, 24 feet to 22.2, uh, which again is a very modest uh, ridge height um, we've moved the structure about nine feet to the south and west, uh, which is away from the neighbors to the north, obviously. And um, part of that move was to accommodate the um, buffer zone related to the um, wetlands in the area. Um, there was some suggestion by the neighbors that there was, uh, you know, some kind of um, inappropriateness with the prior permitting for the um, uh, wetland buffers. And what I'd like to be very clear about is that that is not the case, that the um, work that was done a year ago was done at a period of um, drought, 
uh, which was island-wide and historic, meaning that every single application before the CONCOM at that point was all using the same data that our clients used um, and the same formulas, which are approved by the Conservation Commission and DEP. And that because we are now at a point where there has been uh, more uh, rain, that there was an ability to go back and double check it. And when that was done um, under the appeal, we discovered that um, we should move the boundary line based on having you know better data. data. And that's fine. Uh, it's, it's, uh, my client doesn't object to that and we are now using that data to come up with the, with the boundary. So, you know, again, I think that any suggestion that there was anything done that was inaccurate or untruthful or against the rules is really something that should not be, uh, suggestions that should not be made. Um, it's also somewhat, irre it's, it's irrelevant to uh, the board, but I just wanted to clarify that since that point seems to be made uh, repeatedly. Um, so the stormwater requirement, the stormwater um, systems have been proposed. And uh, I'd note that even though this is a four bedroom residential structure, because it is part of the uh, commercial property, it's meeting commercial standards. Um, I would um, note that the HVAC system is designed to be located and screened in a way that would be significant uh, reduction to any um, noise, um, that there's a small bump out to the um, garage structure that I had previously mentioned. It went from 578 feet to 630 feet. Uh, but that minor increase in size was so that we could fit both uh, the commercial and residential uses into a single structure and also have it be a single story structure. It was previously two stories uh, or a story and a half, and now it's one. Um, so there's a suggestion that's been made um, that what's going on here is some kind of endless expansion of the Westmore Club and that this is a massive disturbance uh, of you know, biblical proportions. Um, and I'm reminded of my uh, sister-in-the-law, uh, Sarah Alger, who is on the other side of this here, who went through a, a process with this board. I think some of you sat on it when she was representing Stop and Shop, where people, uh, you would have thought they were building a maximum security prison, the way people were describing uh, the Stop and Shop. And, you know, I think I heard Sarah say over and over, this is a supermarket being proposed in the location of a supermarket. It's just going to be better. Um, it's going to have the same people doing the same shopping, you know, with more parking and <laughs> maybe it'll be clean. Um, so uh, I think that that's what's going on here. The Westmore Club was established in 2004 and it has had uh, numerous permits, the uh, modifications to its permits. But I think if you look at the um, summary that I provided in my submission, you'll see that really only two or three of those are significant changes, and most of them have been very minor. So just, just to, for the record, I want to go through it that, you know, in 2004, they, uh, the club added three new employee housing units. In 2006, the club added two acres of land, and then it added some tennis courts and parking and a lap pool and a pool structure on that new land. Uh, excuse me. And then in December 2019, the club um, added two employee dorms. It altered its, its putting green, expanded the fitness center by about uh, uh, 1,056 square feet um, and removed the putting green and, and uh, replaced the staff housing unit. Um, so, but I do wanna point out that that increase in the uh, gym really was just to make more space for the same stuff that's there. It's not didn't really, they weren't, you know, doubling the size of the gym or anything. They were just trying to move, make space for things that were too crowded. Um, all of the other permits that have been, upon permit modifications, have been relatively minor. Um, you know, in 20, 2005, there was, they added a couple of bedrooms within an existing um, uh, employee housing unit. You know, in 2008, they removed a dwelling and added a small addition to a maintenance building. Um, and and built a tennis court that had been previously approved but but not constructed. In 2012, they added two hours of playing time to the tennis courts. Um, in 2019, they did some reconfiguring. There was a you know an elimination of a tennis court, a relocation of a court that had been approved but not constructed to a different location, um, uh, an alteration to a maintenance building, um, a removal of an employee dwelling unit that was not you know, uh, in good condition, 
and a reconfiguration of the parking. Uh, in 2020, the club added 180 square feet to a covered porch at the snack bar. You know, again, nominal, nominal changes. In uh, May of 2020, due to COVID, the club sought permission to do uh, food service curbside and also to, to operate as a um, dry goods market uh, out of the dining room since the dining room was not being used for um, food service and that, that market was for, you know, for their members. Um, in June of 2022, we got a, approval for a tent for, for outdoor dining because of COVID. Um, and then in November 2022, there was a small piece of land at the northern end of the property that was removed from the special permit. Um, at, you know, it's about a 5,000 square foot piece of land that, <laughs> excuse me, we got permission to remove. So if you look at this history, you know, most of those permit changes are really small things that just require changes because they're legally significant, but they don't really change anything about what's going on on the ground or how the club impacts the neighborhood or, or any of those kind of things. This, this is not a, just because there's a large uh, number of changes doesn't mean they're significant. And, and several of them were required because of COVID. So I would, I would reject the idea that this started out as a small club and then turned into a big club. It, it's basically the same club it's always been. And if you really look at the one thing that has changed on the property since its inception is that um, there's significantly more employee housing on the property than there was. That's the big change. And I think that that is, you know, in line with how Nantucket has changed since 2005. It used to be that people could reliably put, uh, have employees and not provide for housing for those employees. And then it became necessary to provide for employee housing. And the club has gone through um, a, a, an evolution in the same way that others have, where providing that uh, employee housing is absolutely necessary. But one of the advantages to providing <coughs> employee housing on site is that it significantly reduces the number of vehicles coming and going and uh, you know, otherwise <coughs> allows for more control and more um, um, supervision um, by, the, by the club. Um, but again, those people work there anyway. They're not, it's not really changing what's happening there. It's just changing where they sleep and how many cars there are going back and forth. Um, and, you know, I think that that is more of a uh, sign of how running a business has changed on Nantucket. It, you know, nobody, nobody thought what I really want to do with all this club land is put more employee housing on it. That is not, that is not what the club thought, you know, the members want to see. Uh, the members want to see more amenities and, you know, having that employee housing there has taken up space that would have been for, for amenities, but it's absolutely critical and necessary. Um, so we're, we're happy to have it to be able to provide secure, safe housing for those employees. Um, right. But I think that's really the, the, the significant change that you see. So, <coughs> excuse me, um, the neighbors that are um, complaining or, or opposing this, there, there are six of them. I want to know that all of them have moved to the area since the club has existed. None of them predate the club. And in fact, most of them moved to the moved to this area since 2017. Um, so, you know, the club has not significantly changed uh, that much since 2017. You, you all, I know everybody on this board knows what Nantucket looked like six years ago. And that's not, you know, I don't think the net, the, the, Westmore Club from 2017 was considered to be some quiet pasture, and now it's exploded. I mean, it's disingenuous to suggest that there's been those kind of changes since these people moved there. Um, I'd also like to note that the structure that's being proposed, this you know 1,500 square foot cottage, is basically a guest cottage compared to the uh, structures that are at the at the properties that are are the people are complaining about. So, you know, just looking at the GIS information, the, the assessor information, I haven't pulled, um, you know, plot plans to get exact numbers. And I've rounded off these numbers just to keep it all simple. But at 8 Old Westmore Farm Road, the house is 2,600 square feet of ground cover and 3,700 square feet of gross living area. At 4 Old Westmore Farm Road, their house is 4,000 feet of ground cover and 8,350 square feet of gross living area. Uh, they also have a pool, I'm sorry, at Westmore Farm, they have a pool that's a thousand square feet 
of pool at four old Westmore farm. They have a pool that's 800 square feet of pool. Steve, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I, I think that we get the picture. You get the idea? Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> All right. I, you'll I, take I it appreciate it. I don't mean to be rude, but. No, that's fine. I'll, I'll move on. I'm going to try to, try to, um, try to keep the, the comments short from the public. Yeah. So I don't want to let you run away with it. Okay. That, okay. That, that's fine. Um, when this board approved this special permit, one of the things that it noted is that if there were residential lots, that the structures could be as close as 10 feet from the lot line in the R20 zoning district that this is in, and that the um, application, and, and you know these neighbors are 10 feet from each other and they have large houses with pools and fire pits and those kind of things. And the club provides a significant buffer. Um, there seems to be some suggestion that there's a formal uh, buffer zone and that that is uh, being violated here. And that, that's just not the case. There was a finding in the original permit that said that it's a benefit that there is such a significant amount of land that's a buffer. And it's a benefit that there's a significant amount of land that won't be developed, um, but there's no requirement for it. Now, the, uh, plan that the plan that was submitted shows that the houses that are complaining are between 275 feet and 350 feet from the house that they're complaining about. So I think Why don't that we let you respond directly to them when they complain, Stephen. And, yeah. And, and let's get this moving along, if 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 that's all right. And I don't mean to cut you off, but I think there's going to be plenty of opportunity for you to respond to the neighbors' complaints and to Mr. Bailey because I think he is on this call too. So. I'm, I, I'm sure he is. Um, I, I'm happy to um, to uh, do that, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you, uh, Board. Nope. Oh. Oh, Carl. And Matt sighs again. Mm. Oh, Carl, okay. Carl, you're on. I'm up. Um, yesterday, I did a site visit to this area on the northern side of Pilgrim Road and to the Westmore Club. Um, They're very gracious to let me take a look at this. Um, they were respectful and courteous, and I was too. Um, the houses on Pilgrim Road, Pilgrim Road and Cliff Road back up to the wetland, uh, which I could see was a vernal pool, a large one. Um, and it dries out in the summertime. Um, I took a look um, at the road and the site. Um, there's enough room for the cottage down there and there's adequate uh, access for the cottage. Uh, it could be employee housing or, or use at the club's discretion. Um, MCD modifications, uh, no problem with that. Um, as Barry always says, we can reopen the public hearing if needed. We can uh, put a one-year review uh, on this um, as a condition. I have no problem with multiple openings and MCD modifications. Um, the planning board has the authority to reopen MCD public hearing at any time if complaints. Um, that's basically it. Um, there's some compromising going on here, um, which is important in any uh, dispute about what the club's doing and what the neighbors are perceiving. Uh, the, um, the cottage has been reduced significantly in size. Um, and I did, once again, I, I drove down Pilgrim Road from the north to the south, um, and I looked um, carefully. And I, um, like I said, they allowed me to walk down the access road to the site and look at it. Um, and um, I don't think this is asking the moon. Um, I think it's uh, important for employee housing, uh, perhaps um, part of the time um, and perhaps other uses of the cottage. And that's basically all I have to say, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Anybody else on the board? Stephen. <clears throat> You're muted, Steve. Thank you. Just sitting here talking to myself. I um, uh, agree with uh, what Carl had said and um, familiar with the area. I think for me, given the history of uh, neighbors' concerns with noise and uh, not really having a noise bylaw that addresses short-term rentals, that the short-term rental 
uh, carve out or uh, prohibition on this would be an important one. And um, certainly interested in hearing what the neighbors say, but I do support this concept of um, additional housing and um, having it be for employees or uh, uh, business owners. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Matt. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, I agree with everything Kyle said. Very, very well said. And as Steve said, and I just want to add a couple things that were mentioned by, by Steve um, Cohen and also the ground cover under 5%. I realize that this is a commercial use and a special permit in residential zoning, but you got to go back to what this place was originally to what it is now. I mean, this was a commercial property before zoning. Um, not to the extent it is now, obviously, but it was. Um, I want to talk about a Old Westmore Farm Road. I, I just visited one of the properties Steve mentioned, and I still can't believe how beautiful and how big it is, but how beautiful it is. These properties are fascinating. Pilgrim Road, every year, every, you know, every, you know, one cycle through, there's just more and more built out modern properties. So when you look at this neighborhood as a whole, and we complain about this tiny change that they do every so many years, I mean, this is kind of a nothing, in my opinion. This neighborhood is not what it was when I was in my 30s, let alone when I was a kid. Um, it's the expansion of this is minimal. It's really a business decision that has to be made. As, as, as um, Steve noted, actually, that was pretty interesting when he said, used to not worry about on-site housing. That's a, that's a great point because that's true. No one even thought about stuff like this. So, you know, this is very small and they've made a lot of concessions. They've moved the building, saving some trees. They've already made the decision at a previous meeting, which was quite a while ago. I don't remember when it was, but it was a while ago that that, that house is not gonna be rented uh, it's going to be strictly for upper management, ownership, people, et cetera, that type of thing. Um, and again, back to something Carl said, which I think is really important for us as a board is this whole, this whole list of changes in special permits. That, that always gets thrown at us. Like you're supposed to build something and never do anything for 20 years. You just sort of sit there and do nothing. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. And the key is that it's a special permit, um, that they have to come back to us for everything, okay? Which is, which is the most important part of it. Um, so I don't, you know, totally okay with what they're doing. I think that they've done a great job in mitigating the impacts of um, their, their expansions over time. Um, Etc. So I, you know, totally agree with what was said previously as well. So thank you very much. Thanks, Nat. Um, any more staff? I mean, Scott, any more board or staff comments before we move on to the public? John? I was going to wait until the public because it's a long meeting. I'm sure there's uh, going to be discussion. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of reiterate or, or um, I I agree with a lot of uh, what my um, fellow board members have stated. You know, this is uh, it's 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 actually employee housing, but it's not employee housing. Um, you you don't expect to have young kids partying there. These are for owners and and um, uh, supervisors. Um, there's uh, they've had they've made a lot of concessions. You know, the the cottage is going to be even some a couple of feet. Uh, lower than the um, allowed 24 feet to 22 feet. Um, there's no pool there, which is written in. Um, there are no events at this particular cottage. So 
really it's uh it's going to be used in a in a light capacity i think um when you look at the other structures that they're proposing for maintenance and and sheds uh it's not going to really drastically affect the the uh what the club is doing as far as is it is it adding any anything to the facility facility that's going to um, have something that's different from how it's operating no it would it uh, uh these particular buildings going to help uh the club to manage it better and maybe uh you know store and hide things yes so this isn't a significant change and I was going to start, you know, stating with a joke that, you know, there's a, a couple of things that are uh, that are that are definitive in life, death, death and taxes, and an application for the modification of a special permit through for the Westmore <laughs> Club every year, um, because it seems like they are before us every year. However, this particular application does not significantly change the use, how how it's operating, and um, you know the the things that they're proposing. Um, you know, as they're proposing, I don't have a big issue with, but I'm anxious to hear what the uh, the public would have to say. Thank you. Great. Um, if there's no one else on the board, I'm going to open it up to the public. I'd like just to remind the public um, to try to keep their comments within two minutes. Um, please do not repeat yourselves. And um, Sarah Alger. I, I want Sarah and Dan over, but Dan's on twice, so I don't know which one's yeah. the real Dan. Uh, and, and can you hear me? I can hear you, Dan. Yeah, I'll I'll try to delete delete the other Dan. Sarah, I can't hear you, and and Sarah, I will give you you and Dan extra leeway here because can can um, you hear me now? I can. Yes. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. And, you know, I, 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 I yield the floor to Sarah. <laughs> Well, that's a first. We all yield to Sarah, don't we? So, so I don't think so. But would that that were the case. Um, Dan and I, as I think you know, represent a number of neighbors who are concerned with this project. Um, they are William and Ann Farrell at 94 Foot Road, Laurie and Robert Champion at 40 Westmore Farm Road, uh, Jean Francois Formella at 8. Over Westmore Farm Road, Peter Halley and Carol and Lamb at 24 Golden Road, Michael and Jane Cato at 92 Coop Road, and Tom Holland at 34 Golden Road. Um, we have some slides to show you. I'm just going to start by saying um, that despite what you have all said leading up to this, um, this project I think has reached a tipping point. This is the ninth proposed amendment to a major commercial development special permit in a residential zone. It's time, I think, to say enough is enough. This is a for-profit commercial development. It's already having negative impacts on the residential neighborhood that, it, that it's in. Um, there's noise, there's traffic, and there are impacts to quality of life. And with the addition of these new structures, it's just pushing it over the edge. And I think if you look at each discrete change, if they don't seem like that big a deal, you know, what's a dwell, what's a cottage and what's this and it's not that. But when you add them all together, there's a cumulative impact. It's like death by a thousand cuts. So the first slide we have, um, and I don't know that I can see, see them as you put them up, but it's an overview of the project. And I'd, I'd like you to look very carefully at the scale of this for-profit commercial development smack in the middle of a residential um, neighborhood. The applicant has only provided you with two plans. One shows the proposed maintenance building down on Westchester, and the other shows the proposed dwelling and a that dual purpose garage and maintenance structure. But there's no overall site plan. And, you know, honestly, I think there should have been. And I think under the bylaw, this requires um, site plan review. And I didn't see that the applicant had either gone through that process or asked for a waiver. I think that would be a benefit because we don't know, looking at these plans, where they are in terms of their open area requirement. 
there's an awful lot of area that's covered here. And when you take into consideration the fact that game playing courts at grade are considered structures and therefore can't be considered as part of your open area, I'm really wondering um, where they are with that. There is really an intense development happening here. Um, when it first started, there was a quite a buffer. And now the only remaining buffer is where the wetlands are. And now they want to further infringe in that area. So I think our concerns can be broken into three areas. Um, one is historical. And we're really concerned about sort of the creep, the commercial creep into the residential neighborhood and its impacts. The environmental issues and I don't believe that they they have resolved all of their issues with DEP. I think it's possible that they will have to do further um, changes to their plan. And then technical, um, because of a restriction that was imposed by this board as part of the original special permit, this proposed dwelling can only be used for employee housing. But how is that restriction going to be enforced? I haven't heard anyone discussing enforcement. And we don't have any, we don't have any baseline. We don't, we don't know because nobody's taken a look at the cumulative impacts if they're currently in compliance with all of the conditions that they're permitting. I think that should be part of what you're looking at when you're looking at um, an amendment to an MCD. Um, there are no details as to open area compliance. There are no details on the driveway specifications. How are emergency vehicles going to get down this extremely long driveway? How will, what will the construction status be of that driveway? How will it be constructed? And then how will the construction vehicles get to the site? Um, Again, I, I think an analysis as to the cumulative impacts of the eight prior modifications and this ninth proposed modification would really be of benefit to this board in making its decision. So when the project was first approved, it was based upon a number of findings. And one finding, more than saying that it was just a benefit, the finding was that a significant buffer would be would be maintained. That was the basis on which the original permit was granted. Now there's virtually no buffer left. Everything's been everything's been improved, and the areas that haven't been improved improved are used. For example, they have 172 parking spaces. But when they have events, they do overflow parking in the open space. They use the open space for tents and events and summer camps. One of the other findings at the time of the initial approval was the traffic impact would be less um, than the neighborhood. I, I think that was probably a flawed premise at the time, but it's now it's just patently untrue. Um, there's so much traffic impact here. And bear in mind, you know, they now have 580 members. That was an increase over what was originally approved. And those 580 members, for the most part, represent families, not just one person or two people. It's, you know, mom and dad and two or three kids, maybe more, their guests. That translates to thousands of people using this facility every year. That impact is far more than just a residential um, development. So if you look at um, what Westmore is today, which is I think the next slide. So you have the fitness center and the full service spa expanded by over a thousand square feet in 2019. Clubhouse with restaurant, bar, three employee housing units and eight guest rooms. A total of 15 to 16 tennis courts, two paddle tennis courts, six pickleball courts and a croquet court. 
Again, the 580 uh, members, a 20% increase from the original special permit. Two large pools, a waiting pool, a bathhouse, an outdoor pool, snack shack, 172 parking spaces, plus overflow parking in the open area. That's a 36% increase. Accommodations for 80 employees, eight outdoor events per year with amplified music, summer camps, and other permitted, but as yet unbuilt improvements. I can't, I honestly can't think of a club on Nantucket that has more happening and more impact and is more centrally located smack dab in a residential neighborhood than the Westmore Club. And because of that, I think, you know, when I think of it, if this project came before this board today, like everything that they have, if they wrapped it into one application and presented it to you, I don't think that you would approve it. And so that leads me to my conclusion, which is that this is a residential neighborhood. It's an intense for profit commercial use. It's negatively impacting the neighborhood. It's degrading the quality of life. The incremental changes add up. And I think you probably should have said no a few modifications ago. You didn't. But I think now it's time for you to say enough is enough and to deny this, this modification. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Um, Thanks. It, Mr. Bailey? Um, I don't have much to add other than what Sarah has said, uh, other than to say that, you know, this is, as you can tell from some of the slides that we put up, it's it, this is a commercial development in a residential district, which, you know, your bylaw does allow. But as it grows and as it expands over time, it's important for the board to consider the concerns of the residential neighbors. You know, this is not a commercial zoning district. And the, the original premise here was that the project would not have more impacts than if this was built out as single family residence. It's got more parking spaces than the stop and shop. It's a, an, an intense commercial development. They have summer camps. They have, which as far as I can tell are not approved under any special permits. They have overflow parking, which as far as I can tell are not approved under any special permits. Um, you know, no one, the board has never evaluated the cumulative impacts over these, what, what Mr. Cohen describes as eight minor changes over time. Well, what's going on today? What's the traffic today? What's the traffic study today? If this came into you anew today, you would require a full peer review, traffic study, drainage impacts, et cetera, et cetera. We think you should do that because we think you will find that when you do that, the impacts in a residential neighborhood are very significant. And, you know, I also have to respond to the comments, you know, and, and you know, Nat, I, I always appreciate your comments, but, you know, I don't care if it's a 500,000 square foot house in a residential neighborhood. That is an as of right use. It's Ooh, very granting to get into a special permit use, you know. You know, so, you know, and finally, the, the other thing I want to add is how is this board going to enforce the employee housing only? Do you know how many employees are there right now? They are authorized for 80. Do you know how many are there? Have you ever checked? You know, uh, anyway, it, it, you, you can hear my frustration. You can hear Sarah's frustration. You, and in a couple of minutes, you will hear our clients' frustrations. So I, I will move on to that. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Okay, as the public comes on, I want to remind you two minutes, please, and uh, make every effort not to repeat what the person before you has said. Um, we're, we're happy to hear your comments. Um, be succinct, as Stephen would say. So we have Christian Miles, then Peter Hale, Virginia Chase, 
Um, and then Emily Molden. Great. Can't. Oh, here we go. Hi, Christian. Welcome. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Christian Miles of at A Crooked Lane. Uh, I thought Sarah made a, a fabulous uh, presentation for uh, that voiced so many of the thoughts of uh, of the neighbors. Um, my wife, who uh, grew up here in Nantucket on in the summers, was here long before uh, that club was ever formed. So I don't know. Uh, why uh, the attorney felt he needed to body slam everybody around him because, you know, we're not against the club. We just wanted to, it wanted its growth to be throttled back so that it's, you know, what you all are very good at studying the intensity of coverage of buildings on the site. But as a practical matter, really what Sarah is describing and all the rest of us know is the amount of coverage of people, noise, activity has accelerated over the uh, last few years. Uh, and to a point that, uh, that the place is really uh, in, inconsistent with the overall residential uh, nature of this, of this locale. So uh, <clears throat> I agree that if you did uh, a comprehensive impact study, this place would be found to be a, a real a troublesome issue. And I, I, I'll stop there. Thank you, Christian. Peter, welcome. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity and I also appreciate all of the time you all spend uh, considering these matters. Uh, I, uh, I, I'm at 24 Pilgrim Road and uh, we've had our house there, I think we bought it around 2007, 2008. So we've been there through a, um, the growth of the club really. Uh, they got there right after the original uh, club was built. And I think one of the, the great changes, great meaning large changes, not necessarily good change, uh, it, it has been left off the, um, uh, the, the materials that the club has furnished to you, and that is the increase of the membership. Uh, the membership, I believe, was originally uh, limited to 480, and it was increased uh, over 20% to 580. And, and we have seen, those of us who live around it, this in, you know, really huge increased intensity of use of the club. Why are the facilities being expanded? Why are there more tennis courts? Uh, why, uh, why, why, why? And it's because there are more people that they have to serve. And um, as, as Sarah mentioned, this is, this is not a public club, it's a private club. And uh, the, uh, the amount of use that it gets is current, constantly intensifying. Looking specifically at the cottage, um, that uh, is being proposed for the, uh, I guess it's the east end of the tennis courts, an area that has been open certainly since I moved there and well before, that's where the Field of, field of Dreams used to be. But looking specifically at that cottage, um, one of the things I wanna point out, that building and occupancy of that building brings the club approximately 300 feet closer to the Pilgrim Road abutting neighbors. Um, uh, one, if one wants to talk about a, uh, a buffer zone that maybe has not been well-defined, that clearly is in the buffer zone. Um, uh, bring... yeah, I'm gonna ask you to, to, to wrap it up here in a second. Okay, okay. so then specifically as to that cottage, um, there is an open porch on the south side of that cottage. Uh, it, that's going to increase noise and bring the noise, you know, 300 feet closer to our homes than have been before. And it should not be permitted. We are not against the cottage. It just should go someplace closer to the club. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Virginia, welcome. 
Hi, um, I'm Virginia Chase, 117 Westchester Street. And I was here before the club was. I've been here, we built our house in 1974. In fact, most of the people on Westchester Street have been here before the club was here. And there is, and I want to say I oppose this cottage because I look on it as an expansion of Westmore. And I don't think Westmore needs to expand anymore. And this, the cottage isn't needed for operation. It's just going to be a little fun place to have, uh, which I, I, you know, that's nice, but we already have plenty of uh, buildings there. And as far as expansions of major commercial developments, which we discussed six months ago, I feel like I'm on this committee because I have been years now coming to all the meetings. Well, they, there have been many expansions of major commercial developments like the police, the fire, the airports, the schools, but those developments, they all benefit the whole town. This, if, it, if Westmore expands, it doesn't benefit the public. And so I'm really against this cottage. And there's an, another piece of unfinished business I'd like to bring up. Um, the pickleball noise. The pickleball has been put right down next to Westchester Street, and it's disturbing the whole neighborhood. It's constant aggravating noise all day. Crack, crack, crack. And it, it's the Westmore is not supposed to disturb the whole neighborhood. We had a, a wonderful quiet street and now it's unbearable. And I think, you know, I know buffers have been put up and different equipment to be quiet, but none of those work. The thing that would work is to move the pickleball courts up into a tennis courts in the middle of the development and I know people don't want to hear it up there, but we don't want to hear it down here. But that's the only thing that would help keep the noise out of the neighborhood and would allow us to enjoy our summers here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Emily. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Emily Molden for the Nantucket Land Council. Um, I first just want to mention that as an island nonprofit who's worked with the Westmore, we certainly appreciate them as an entity, but I do wanna just voice a couple of concerns. And um, really, I think a lot of this is uh, in response to um, some of Ms. Alger and Mr. Bailey's presentation. Um, we have certainly been concerned about the proposed location of the, co the cottage in such close proximity to the wetland. Obviously that's not directly under the planning board's purview. Um, it is a sensitive rental pool habitat, and I appreciate that it's been redelineated and there have been some adjustments um, based on that. Uh, but I also understand that that's still not been um, finalized as of yet. Um, I just found it interesting seeing the previous finding about the buffer to be maintained around the development and the um, uh, the club, which uh, sort of brings me to my next point. I, I do honestly think that it's there. The concerns are very valid for the continued uh, expansion over time and the number of amendments for the permit. I just think that it's absolutely worth considering. And uh, the point that was made about reviewing those findings and conditions from all of the pr prior amendments, I absolutely think that that should be done. Maybe it has been done already, but um, for this type of use and this type of, of permit that's seen so many amendments, I think prior to um, permitting another one that those prior uh, conditions and findings really need to be evaluated to make sure that they're still in compliance. And then um, finally, I think that it is would make the most sense to hold off on issuing a permit until the appeal has been finalized, but I recognize that there may be no requirement or necessity to do that, but it just, it certainly seems premature to finalize this while that appeal is outstanding. Um, so that's just another final comment. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Emily. And, and thank you everyone for keeping it at two minutes. We appreciate it. Jane, welcome. 
Hello, thank you for recognizing me. Um, my name is Jane Gato. I'm a neighbor and a butter uh, from 92 Cliff Road. Um, as other people said, this is a very intensive operation that the Westmore Club is operating. And I absolutely support uh, employee housing for their staff. And I'm so glad that they've increased that. But the fact remains that any business employing over 100 people is a major operation. And I don't think anybody can dispute that in this residential neighborhood. And um, this housing is not really employees, employee housing. This is owner housing. I'm not really sure that it's you know alleviating an, an, an affordable housing issue on Nantucket. Um, so I think that really needs to be recognized. As to you know the expansion over the years, we are all realists on this call. And we expect an expansion in size and scope of the club. And that has occurred, but it's occurred beyond what's reasonable. And that significant buffer that they're not just, you know, that it's not just a nice thing to maintain, that they're required to maintain. That was a condition of their permit. Um, and, you know, that's that's going away to the Westmore Club's credit. It has, despite other issues and some non-compliance with their permit over the years, they have at least complied with this one crucial requirement of their special permit, and that's maintaining the buffer. And not, until now, because now they're proposing to take it away and they want to build on it. And like several other Cliff Road and Pilgrim Road neighbors, our house surrounds the wetlands and the vernal pool is on our property as well. I do not at all appreciate Attorney Cohen and Mr. Goldsmith's very unneighborly attempt to minimize my status as an abutter because my house is located more than 10 feet from their property. All of our properties encompass a portion of the wetlands and all of our houses are sited where they are because the wetlands and especially the vernal pool have restrictions. The rest of the neighborhood, we've embraced those restrictions. We comply with them and all of our lots, the neighbors and the Westmore include unbuildable land. So I urge you to find that the Westmore Club should continue to respect that buffer that their permit requires and sit if they're gonna have to build a house situated away from the eastern perimeter, it would be far more appropriate to build that house on the more densely developed area internal to their grounds, then the Westmore Club could build their house, they could maintain the buffer, and they could appropriately respect the fragile wetlands. So please consider that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jane. So Dan's on here twice. I'm thinking one is Dan and one might be a client. Um, so I'll bring them both. It, it might be it might be me. Can you hear me? Yeah, it, it is Jean Francois. You have him now. Yes. Okay. 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 Great. So, so thank, th thank you, David, Mr. Chair, and and Megan. Uh, uh, Jean Francois is a client. Um, he wants to speak, and then I have a okay. ten second comment. All right. Great. So Francois, if you can keep it two yeah, minutes, we'd love yeah, to hear Mr. what you have to say. Mr. Chairman, I'm. Thank you. I'll try to be very brief. So. I don't know what the club was in 2004 to uh, some of the points that was made. I wasn't there. But what I see today is that the club has become disruptive. Uh, I want to restate the numbers very quickly just to bring to one point I want to make. So 16 tennis courts, six very noisy pickleball courts, uh, housing for eight employees, two large pool, a large gym, a spa, uh, eight, eight events a year with amplified music, almost 600 members, 172 72 parking space. So how could you compare it to a dozen families around the wetland who respect each other and value our collective commitment to what we hoped would be a quiet and serene residential area? I don't think it is fair to make that comparison and it, it does not feel good as a resident. There is already room for 80 employees so why does it need three more bedrooms right in the middle of the buffer that has been respected for so many years? And with an outdoor deck, is it really for employees? Will they entertain the co-workers there? As Peter said, it's going to bring the noise 300 feet closer to us. How do we enforce the no rental and restrictive covenant uh, on, that, uh, on that property, actually on the club? What would the planning board suggest here? How do we ensure that employees will not congregate there when they already are congregating late at night on Westchester Road in the dark, which is a, lo a little bit startling at time? So I would urge the board to consider fairness for the resident. And we are not opposed to some solution for the club, 
but we think that you should consider trying to straddle down on the expansion, the continued expansion of that club. Thank you. Thank you. Dan, you got a if quick I, one for us? If I could just have the last word on a, on a technical issue. How about it? The, the MCD bylaw provides that there has to be 20% open spirit, open area, and that that open area needs to be landscaped. Uh, when this was originally permitted, that requirement was 30%, but that has changed and it's now 20%. Open area, uh, to get really wonky, <laughs> under 139.11 of the bylaw, uh, says that it does not include walkways, patios, or structures. And then if you look at the definition of structure, it's the sort of typical definition of structure under both building codes and, and zoning codes, which is anything constructed or erected that requires fixed location on the ground. And then it says buildings, docks, decks, tents, and game courts. Before this board should do anything. And quite frankly, before you should have approved this, you know, the the uh, the transfer of 0.4 acres, you need to confirm that Westmore complies with this zoning requirement. There's nothing in there. They, they, Stephen talks about ground cover. Well, that's great. But this is a critical component of zoning compliance. And you don't have the authority to approve this until such time as they've demonstrated compliance with this. And I, I'll finish there. Thank you, Dan. Barry. Thank you, I appreciate it. I just wanted to give the public a chance to chime in and hear what they all had to say. Um, just a few things, and this will be provisional should the board approve this. Uh, again, we're back to the site plan and all of the inherent things that have to go with the site plan, um, just to make sure that everything's up to specs with landscaping, parking, setbacks, the whole Monty with that. Uh, should the board approve this, I'd probably strongly recommend that as we've done with some other things tonight, that there's no STRs that will be allowed on it, no special events, that somehow we write into the decision that it is a for residential use only as a single dwelling unit it is not to be used as a guest house in any way, shape, or form. Um, I have heard the neighbors, and I would probably dare say that somewhere around iteration six or seven, I believe we did a review of the MCD, but I think it's time to once again do that review of the MCD and make sure they're in compliance with all of the specifications that are there with the MCD. Let's check that box off and see where we're at with it. Now I know that's going to be uh that's going to be a big issue and that's going to take some time to do. Um and we're just about ready to face the fact that with changes in the in the plus department, we're going to be down a person for a bit. So at a minimum um, we're going to continue this, but I would like to at least continue this for two months out to be able to give people the appropriate time to do this. Okay. One month and, and everything else that's going on when I look at the list and what's still pending, that's too fast, too quick, too soon. So let's give, let's, let's be respectful of staff and, and make sure that the appropriate time is also there under which to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Leslie, are you still on? Is this is this suggestion from Barry viable? I think it is. And we have a zoning enforcement, uh, excuse me, zoning compliance coordinator whose um, job duties include checking special permits for compliance. So I believe this is something that could be assigned to him. And he would have time to complete that. And two months is a, is a fair fair window. Yeah, I mean, I will tell you that um, we have worked closely with the Westmore Club management over the years and have not had mm -hmm. any issues with compliance. So I, I don't think it will be that time consuming uh, to go through all the permits. Okay, great. Steven, or Steve, 
Stephen, wherever you want. There you are. You had your hand. Thanks, Mr. Yep. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, um, uh, I appreciate understanding what's going to be involved with the review, and it sounds to me like that's an important aspect to it. Um, I was kind of leaning, but I'm going I'm to say it in any event, even though we're going to do the review, that um, the review could, for the applicant, um, open a big can of worms. It doesn't sound like it's going to, but if it did, it'd be a big, ugly can of worms. And um, I, for one, um, having sat through several of these hearings um, over the years and um, also getting a better sense of uh, a better focus on the, the concerns um, and the size of the project uh, after the PowerPoint presentation that was made, I wouldn't be above uh, suggesting some horse trading. And I think the line of thought here is what, what are the concerns um, and what would be traded? And I think amplified uh, music, amplified sound is an important consideration. I think sound block on the um, pickleball courts, fencing and the uh, porch um, of this new structure, which is closer. Um, I think obviously the prohibition on short-term rental. Um, and I, I mentioned these in a couple of regards. One is this, it sounds to me like this may be um, part of a bigger, it's certainly part of a bigger project. It's not as simple as, not simply a special permit with respect to just this structure or potentially it isn't. Um, and to, you know, those poor folk, folks over at Forest Ave, I mean, they're, this, this, this project is surrounded by residential neighbors. Um, there, I, you know, I don't dispute, um, believe me, um, noise, I'm a um, stickler on, that the residents shouldn't have to be putting up with uh, sound crossing into uh, the property, crossing over the property line into their home after hours. Um, but I think that just as a fair and even approach, um, the applicant should consider some horse trading. And um, I certainly wouldn't be beyond some of those items I mentioned. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Stephen. Those are good thoughts. Um, anybody else on the board or, or in the public? One last shot. Uh, Stephen Cohen, please. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate the comments made by the neighbors. Uh, I guess what I would say is that many of them are good points and important points, but they are nearly entirely irrelevant to what's before you. And so what I would suggest is that there's really two issues here. One of them is whether or not what's proposed before you is something that you should approve under the special permit uh, MCD guidelines. And I would suggest to you that a four bedroom cottage of 1500 and something square feet that's supposed to be for the owner or senior management that is proposed with a restriction that it can be single family dwelling, no dorm use, no member use, no rent, no short term rental use propose, you know, that has no deliveries that does not have its own driveway that does not have its own, you know, basically anything is is perfectly approvable under the bylaw. Uh, and under the special permit and MDCD rules, because it has no impact whatsoever. If I if I came to you and said, "Hey, my neighbor is going to put a house within 275 feet to 350 feet, and I'd like you to stop it," um, you'd say, "What are you talking about? That's you know 200 times, you know 20 times further than what you're what's allowed." Um, the other thing is that the um, the 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 um, house that's that's proposed here is for the owner of the club. I can't imagine a better mitigation for nuisances than having the owner on site. You know, uh, Graham and Kitty Goldsmith are not, uh, you know, 30 somethings who are gonna have, you know, MTV parties out there. Although uh, maybe that dates me. Uh, I don't even know if MTV still exists, but, um, you know, having the owner on site is how you keep things under control. And when the Goldsmiths aren't using it, if it gets transferred, to be senior management housing instead, having senior management single family housing is, is something that normally this commission would think is a good idea because it mitigates problems by having the owner on site or the senior manager on site. Um, how are you going to enforce this? The same way you enforce every other rule in front of you. How do we enforce the employee housing? Well, you have a dorm maintenance plan that was adopted by the permit that was put in there, and that has annual reporting requirements and all kinds of things. You know, there's a lot of supposition and a lot of a lot of hyperbole here 
But at the end of the day, this application is entirely approvable. And I would suggest that the board approve it. Frankly, there's only one thing missing. The one open question is the emergency vehicle access approval from the fire department. We had originally proposed a driveway along the north side that is um, something closer to the neighbors than some of the, and some of the neighbors asked us to move it to the south. So we've agreed to do that. And now the fire department doesn't like that as much. And so I think what we're likely going to end up with is having the access for the owner or for the um, user to be through the existing driveway. But that we would do is construct an emergency vehicle access with a gate that would only be for fire or police. That would not be a driveway. It would only be an emergency vehicle access. I don't want to suggest that that's uh, approved by the fire department. It's not, but it's the idea that we have. It's one that you use all the time uh, or, you know, as applicable. And I think that resolves that issue. Um, I'm happy to continue for one more month if there's actually something that needs to happen here. But I think what we're actually talking about is an entirely different issue, which is that if there are concerns about either compliance or um, the appropriateness of the approved uses, then that's something that this board, through its special permit process, should open a process on. And it should review what's going on here and put in place any conditions it wants. You know, there were a bunch of horse trading suggested. We don't need to do horse trading, but what we should do is make sure that the uh, club is always a good neighbor. And so, you know, in 2018, this commission reopened the special permit and put rules in place to address the events that were happening to make sure that, the, that there were more clear rules and better rules and uh, good neighbor rules. And if that needs to happen again, then that should happen again. But I think that those are two separate issues. And so what I would suggest is that if we stick narrowly to approving or reviewing what's in front of you, that that is something that can be done uh, essentially with that one uh, emergency vehicle access issue approved through staff. And that entirely separately, every and any concern raised by the neighbors tonight is something that should and could and will be addressed both through a staff uh, review of the permits and, and through a uh, public hearing if the board determines that one is needed in order to make adjustments. But I would suggest that those are two separate issues. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Carl. I think we're missing a little bit of uh, perspective here uh, from the neighbor's opposition. Um, um, based on my experience with me and my family, um, we came here in 1969, and I was four years old, um, into a residential area off Hummock Pond Road. Um, been here for 53 years, and I've seen a lot of big changes in this neighborhood. Um, I live near my grandfather's farm, Pumpkin Pond Farm, Surfing Hydrangea Nursery, My Comic Golf Club, Cisco Brewers, 167 Raw. Barlett's Farm, Cisco Beach, and Walter Ballinger Sustainable Nantucket Farm. Um, I don't have the solutions for overgrowth and overdevelopment. What I do here is my job. Um, I think the neighbors need to keep this into perspective here, um, that this is a private club that's that doesn't have as much traffic as all those businesses and farms that I mentioned, which I have to live with on Hummock Pond Road, getting out of Burn Swamp Lane every day. Uh, I take my life in my hands with my vehicle getting out of here. Um, lots of drunk driving uh, uh, that's possible. Um, dangerous. Um, so, you know, I'm dealing with big changes in my neighborhood over the years, traffic, noise, congestion. Um, I'm not diminishing your, your rights to your property for peace and quiet. Um to, to Sarah's point that they're encroaching on, on, on neighbor's property is just simply not true. Um, if you walk down there, the, the cottage is not encroaching on the neighbor's property and it's within the buffer. It's not even on the buffer. It's only about 20 feet from the, the fence of the tennis courts. Um, I understand that the, some of the opposition is, is referring to it as 300 feet closer. That's true. But if it's 1,500 square feet and four bedrooms, with a couple who happens to own the club living in it, I don't see that as a big problem. Um, I looked at all this yesterday. I, I have it in my head. Um, mitigation techniques are available um, to be worked out with the club and staff. If the pickleball courts are bothering people, let's fix them. Um, I'm a solutions guy. 
let's fix the pickleball court noise problem. That's not impossible. There's probably some down uh, um, sound deadening material you can use on the fences of those courts. Um, I think the compliance issues with zoning, um, I don't think that's an issue. I think if it was, we would have caught it in multiple openings of the MCD and a special permit, we would have found it. I, I don't think they're in non-compliance at all. I disagree with my colleague, uh, Barry. I don't think we need to spend two months looking at compliance issues of zoning. If they were doing that, we know about it by now. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. I don't believe it. I don't believe that, that one's dependent on the other. I mean, if if this board decides to to approve this in some way, we can still we can still have a compliance review. So, um, Barry, I'll be with you in a sec. Let me go to John and then to you. Mm -hmm. John, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, actually, uh, Carl just harped on something. He had a, a site review, and I. I'm not saying I haven't been there uh, a couple of dozen times over the years. I know the area, I've, I've seen it, watched it grow. Um, I've been on the site, but I think it would be very helpful um, not only talk about uh, continuance, uh, maybe not two months, maybe a month, uh, but also maybe we do something similar that we did with Richmond. Uh, see if we can coordinate a site review to actually see where the how, where the cottage is going on the on the land. Um, to see where the uh, the shed and the maintenance building are going, so we can get not only an idea of the uh, the you know the the improvements, but also from a, the neighbor's perspective, where they're seeing it, looking out at it, where you know where when we look out, where we're seeing the residential neighbors. So I think a, a site visit, if that's possible, maybe even a coordinated uh, time, so that it's not just individual and. Um, you know, if we can get a representative from Westmore to actually show us where it's going, where the, the buildings and structures are going. Um, if we can get a few people out there from the board, uh, not just walking around, um, you know, hoping to see where it's going. I yeah. think that would be helpful. Mr. Mr. Chairman, through you, I would say that that would be more than uh, something we could easily arrange for. Okay, great. Barry? Um, I think Nat had his hand up. I, I put it down. All right. Thank you. Sorry. I'm um, trying, trying to be respectful of my board here. All right. No, no, no. You I'm got, sorry. You, got, you, just, you, you, you can go to Steve. That's getting coming. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you got to move along. Move this along, guys. We, just, we do. <laughs> Steve. Mid nope. You're muted, Steve. Steve, you're talking yourself again. Wait, I don't want to make a habit of that. Um, I just wanted to say that I think, you know, it's important that um, we mm -hmm. do get, or certainly I get clarification through the planning director and our uh, land use special and our land use specialist offline, I think is appropriate. There's a lot going on and we still got a lot to do this evening on what, to what extent this, this um, matter before us does or does not involve horse trading. Um, I think just to clarify the spirit of my comment was there is a lot of meat on the bone here. And there's some room, I think, for good neighbor uh, actions. And I think that's just where I wanted to leave it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great. Um, I, I think we all, uh, I think we've all heard enough and said enough yeah. here. And, and Mr. Chair, I, I'd yeah. like to request a continuance to the next regular meeting. Um, but before we do that, could I just have ask Megan to show um, a photo that I uh, sent to her by email just before the meeting started. Megan, do you have that available? I'll just take a, two seconds. I do, just bear with me a minute. Yeah, while well, she's pulling it up. Dated. Yeah, it's something that we, we just got this okay. afternoon and it shows, you know, this cottage in its sighting, um, you know, which is roughly 275 to 350 feet to the nearest neighbor. And if we could end with that photo, yeah, there it is. So you could see. It's a tiny little thing next to the tennis courts in heavily screened areas. So I'm happy to, uh, with that photo, take a motion or re request a motion to continue to the next regular meeting. Thank you, Steve. Barry? Yeah, I'm going to make a motion we continue at this point, but I'm not necessarily going to let you have the next meeting. I want to check with staff to make sure that there's appropriate time available under which to do this. Yeah. Is, uh, well, we're, we're, could... we're, we're, we're the director of planning 
Andrew is leaving. That means there's going to be one person down. You've got two people taking over new positions at this point. I want to respectfully give them the time that they need under which to do this. And I'm not taking that lightly. Very, I want, I, I want, I just yeah. want to be respectful. So that's why I'm going to ask staff what would be an appropriate time frame here. Jerry, can please. I ask you something real quick? Yes, sir. Um, I, I just want clarity. What you're at, what you're suggesting or your motion is going to be is to include a review, correct? Is that where you're it, going? It, with this? I, I think I, I'm to, not denying you of it. I just no, want no, to let me, understand. let me finish. You're, you and I are saying the same thing. Yes, the review, I think a review once again is very, very necessary. Because I, you know, just as one topic tonight, the pickleball, the pickleball thing, I'd love to see if there's complaints filed against it or are we hearing something new? Yeah. You know, this is this is part of what's required for that MCD to work in a in a constructive fashion. Yeah. So I'm sorry, I've gotten a little off topic at this point. I apologize. And I want to go back to where I was to just ask staff respectfully, what do they need to accomplish these tasks? And I want to stand by that with them. So, Mr. Chairman, offhand, you know, I, I can't commit to the staff having that done by the next meeting. I think it would be reasonable um to continue to the next meeting for now and if we get closer to the meeting and it's not finished we can revisit that um you know i don't have calendars with vacation schedules and other things like that on hand right now so you know i don't know how much manpower we will have yeah. uh, we could always re i agree we could always continue Listen, let, i'd rather have the ability to move forward if we can but we can I'm always i'm not convinced that that the rest of the board wants to review so let let Barry make the make the motion and see if it if it goes. All right. So I'm gonna make a motion at this point based upon what staff has told me that we continue to our next meeting. And if need be, it will be a staff decision to be able to defer that above and beyond. And I will unequivocally support that. That's my motion, sir. So your motion is is for a a MCD review on this product. Correct. Okay. I just want to be clear. Do we have a second on that? Second okay. for discussion. Oh, go ahead, Bear. Uh, John. No, if you have discussion, I was just going to second, move it along. Yeah. It's, it's what Leslie kind of said, what Barry said. So that's fine. Okay. So, the, okay. so okay. Well, Okay, so I've had a continuing uh, to the next meeting, but they'll tell us if it can't work. They're going to let us know. If it can't work. Motion made by Barry, seconded okay. by Nat. Barry? Aye. Nat? Aye. Carl? No. John? Aye. Stephen? Aye. So that passes. <clears throat> Thank you. Good job, gang. That wasn't an easy one. No. Um, <clears throat> thank you, everybody. Don't go anywhere, Stephen. 21 Pilgrim Road Trust, Stephen Cohen Trustee, Sophia's Way Homeowners Association Trust, Stephen Cohen Trustee, Sophia's Way Subdivision 4, 21 Pilgrim Road. Stephen. Mr. Chair, I'm going to defer to Dan Malloy if he's on. Okay, great. All right, I'll take it. Take it. All right, evening again. I'll, I will promise to be very quick. Uh, Dan Malloy for the applicants. So we're looking to do an amendment to the existing subdivision called Sophie's Way. Uh, the amendment consists of essentially reducing the length of the right of way by about 13 feet, adjusting the interior lot line between two lots. Uh, and, the effort, and the reasoning for both of these changes has to do with both of the lots have been acquired and sold and transactions occurred. And as a result of all those property movements and acquisitions, what you're seeing on your screen now uh, is the proposed plan. And what you'll see uh, in the upper right-hand side of lot two, uh, the lot has been 
Right, yep, right up in there is that's lot two. The right hand side of that whole lot has now been restricted from in terms of what can be built and where. Um, that was part of a negotiation with an abutter. So what that essentially that's brought us before you in order to accommodate the restrictions and keep everybody happy from the two abutters on this. <clears throat> we're shrinking the road. You can see the lot line between one and two being pulled back as well. Uh, in essence, to accommodate the restrictions that everybody's agreed to. So we're not looking to increase the density. If anything, this application really reduces the density by re restricting what can be built where. Uh, and one of the other requests we had, there was a condition, or well, there is a condition in the approval that talked about a 15 foot setback on the corner lot at Pilgrim Road and Sophie's Way. And it wasn't necessarily clear. It talked about a 15 foot setback, but it didn't really state from where from. So we're just asking if the board would entertain modifying that language to either remove the restriction or at least make it clear on lot one that the 15 foot setback requirement, which from what I believe was intended to be from Pilgrim Road. Uh, that is it. Great. Thank you, Dan. Comments from the board? This is not that long ago, right? This project. This is like a couple of years ago, right? I didn't do the original approval. It was probably this is ours. To be built within 10 years. Okay. This isn't the one that Art just did, Leslie. This is a different one. You know, Art did the original, right yes. Yeah, he did the original oh, okay. one. Okay, that's not that long ago. Okay, I remember something about this 15 foot thing, but I can't get, you know, I'm not gonna be able to remember it that vividly, but I do remember something about this. I don't think it was the road, but I could be wrong. Um, I can add some light to that just from, from some of the recent abouts. So some of the abouters have sent in emails and comments on this, and I have no idea if they're on tonight or if they'll make you know, follow through with their, their questions. But one of the abutters did apparently sound like they were present previously and mentioned that it was their opinion that the 15 feet was to Pilgrim Road yeah. uh, to be to be consistent well, with all the lots and houses on the road. Okay. It, and also maybe because of the width of Pilgrim and the condition and some other stuff that might have been part of it. I think it was actually at the other end not okay Carl. Carl lot one he said when I was looking at the Westmore Club to the west um, I drove down to this road and I looked at it um, I understand that the lots have been sold um, there was an issue with some folks about the swales on both sides, there's only one with gravel on one side, and it doesn't look like it's two feet deep. It looks like it's one feet deep, one foot deep, and it looks like it needs one on the other side. The other issue that I would have for you, Dan, is can you build a drainage structure at the base of that road that does not wash into the road and make a big puddle? Because it looks like the road's been graded right now, um, and there's no puddle, but there was a picture in the packet about it uh, from a neighbor. Um is there a way to, to mitigate water coming down um, into the swales would help if it was a second swale built? Uh, they were both expanded to two feet deep with gravel, perhaps. And then is there a way to engineer a water catch basin at the base of this road so it doesn't wash into Pilgrim Road? That's it. Thank you. So I think I saw that comment from one of the abutters as well. I think it was an email sent into the board. And we can certainly look at that. What I can say is that I do know looking at the original subdivision file, I don't have it in front of me now, unfortunately, but I know the road was designed, it was approved, it was constructed. Uh, I know an as-built uh, was sent in, and I believe all of the road construction was signed off as have, as have been completed per the approval. Uh, we can certainly look at that and see if, if one of the one of the swales is... So I don't know off the top of my head if there were supposed to be two or if they're only supposed to be one. Uh, but certainly if, if a swell needs to be maintained, we can certainly do that. 
Uh, if it has to be realigned, it has to be excavated. That's certainly something we can accommodate as part of our construction. Um, I'd be a little hesitant to go into Pilgrim Road and do work within the road itself other than cleaning it up. Great. Thank you, Dan and Carl. Um, any any other comments? Megan, do we have um, anyone in the public that's lasted this long? Yes. Uh, Peter Hale. Great. Hey, Peter, just to remind you, try to keep it within two minutes, please. Great. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate being heard a second time tonight. I'm, I'm, I'm one of the butters who wrote and I sent in that uh, picture. And I also sent in, if uh, Megan could put up, I think it's the 24th page, the second to last page of the um, packet. Um, yeah, that that's it. Uh, the It's a the, the point of, of this is I believe it uh, was part of the original application. And if you look very carefully along that, um, uh, the road, uh, the road lot, uh, there's wording that uh, calls for two swales, one on either side. And as one of the commissioners or board members said there, uh, you know, as, as I've stated, there's only one swale. And we're having this uh, continuing problem. Um, so I would encourage you, I, I agree with staff recommendation, and perhaps you could add to that, just that, uh, uh, that the uh, swale requirement or any other engineering requirement that will solve the problem um, be required uh, for um, this project to go forward. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Peter. Megan, do we have anyone else? No. Great. Um, board, any more questions? I think we got the 15 feet figured out. That is definitely Pilgrim. So agree with Mr. Hale's points and the swale issue and staff mm -hmm. recommendation for that. So, yeah, if we could add that into the into but, staff recommendations into the decision, the swale, yes. Yep. <clears throat> Anything with else? With that said, I'm ready. Are you making make a motion, a motion to close? Make that motion to close, Mr. Chairman. Great. With a second. Second. Um, motion made by Nat, second by Barry. Nat. <clears throat> Aye. Barry. Aye. John. Aye. And I'm an I myself. Oh, I needed to. Nope, I didn't. Nope, just because we can't. Great. Okay. Uh, that's unanimous. Um, <clears throat> moving on to. Make a... oh. oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Next yeah. motion. Sorry. Make a motion to approve. The applicant's recommendation uh, approves the applicant's request is uh, the findings number one, and that the setback, the conditions are that setback is remains at 15 feet for lot one, and that swale decision, Leslie, to reword that from the original decision, make sure that's in this. Second. Great. <clears throat> Motion made by Nat. Second by Barry. Nat. Aye. Barry. Aye. John. Aye. And I'm an I as well. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to Ac Londro. Butcher that. LLC for Hannaby Lane. Who's representing this? Dan? I am. Oh, I'm still Linda. alive. Oh. This is Linda. Linda. I'm still well, alive. It's going to be Microwave City tonight. Well, get on with it, please, Linda. Simple, simplest one tonight. It's an existing commercial structure of Dan Malloy still on. He can speak to uh, some of the infrastructure on it and his uh, meeting with the uh, applicant. It's a um, commercial structure. There's no dwelling unit at all. There's a mezzanine on the second floor where there is an office. It, the uh, new tenant is going to use that as his office. 
and the first floor as a um, it's not an auto detailing. He takes, you know, high end vehicles like Land Rovers and stuff and tricks them out. So it's not actually I'm changing your tire. I'm changing your gasoline. I'm changing your oil, changing your fluids and stuff like that. So there's no servicing of these vehicles like that. It's sort of a custom detailing kind of thing. And I sent him off to um, Mark Willette over at the uh, water company, and he signed off on it. And there's like nine spaces in the back. So I think it's um, it's pretty benign, actually. It's a single guy. So we have to come back for a special permit for that or to modify the original one, which was for storage. Thank you. I think you. Megan might have something to add to this. Uh, anybody on the board? Barry. I'll be, I'll be real quick. I just want to make sure that it's all exterior to the vehicle, that he's not um, upgrading transmissions or um, suspensions or things like that, which really does involve a different level of, of uh, detail and what's the word I'm searching for? Sloppiness that, 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 that comes out of it just because you're moving fluids around and stuff. So I just want to be clear that that's all it is. It's just exterior. No, and when they built the building, uh, I don't know if Dan Malloy is still on. When they built mm -hmm. the building, they mm -hmm. had to put in this whole catch system, and it. Mm -hmm. uh, Megan has the uh, plan. You've you've just answered my question. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I think it's below that one. Yep. There's a whole drainage system there and a whole catch basin system there off to the right. So the building is was engineered pretty intensely to begin with just for storage. But now that someone has uh, come in and asked, there's no um, thing back there on the right hand corner. So it's pretty, pretty calming, pretty calming out there. Probably the least used building on the whole street. Great. Um, Carl. For you, Mr. Chair, to Dan, um, is there a maintenance plan in this? I didn't see one in the packet for cleaning and maintenance of the of the uh, stormwater system. There is a maintenance plan. I don't know that it was included with this application necessarily, but there is one, and we can certainly make it available. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks, Carl. Stephen. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I flu I think it's about fluids. And um, I just, you know, obviously, we'd want to get uh, Ed Petschy's input on the adequacy, and maybe if there's any particular limitations on fluid release or type of work. Other than that, no concern. Through you, through you but, Mr. Chairman, they're not doing any of that type of maintenance. Uh, Mr. Chair, my comments stand regardless. I think we should just document it as staff. Thank you. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you Stephen. John. Yes, uh, just um, uh, again, you, everyone's touched on uh, my concerns. Um, uh, water company, if they're okay, that's great. But also uh, in conditions to be determined, was there something that we were waiting to hear from? Or is that you know something like no commercial servicing of vehicles without coming back to the board for a special permit? Um, you know, something like that, I would add, so it doesn't become a, uh, a traffic where people are coming in there every day to service their vehicle. I understand this is specialized. And if you're looking at a, a, a vehicle like the uh, Land Rover where they're going to trick out, it's going to take an ex, uh, a certain amount of time to do that. It's not going to take one day. So you won't have that traffic of people coming in on a daily basis or hourly basis. It's probably going to be something over the course of a month mm -hmm. or so or two, whatever. So I would just uh, suggest maybe, you know, through staff, if we needed to add a condition, no commercial servicing of vehicles without um, board approval. Uh, if we could even add, go as far as saying no engine maintenance and no body work that involves paint, Bondo, or any such. So I don't know how to put it, but I, I think that um, a side question for Dan, if I could. 
Dan, is this building engineered to legally have a repair shop in it? Yeah, so the building has a couple. So the building itself, separate from outside, there's floor drains inside the buildings. Mm -hmm. and those are separately plumbed out <clears throat> to a specific gas and oil water separator outside the building, which goes to the sewer system. Uh, and then on top of that, there's an exterior drainage system that services just the roof and the parking driveway area uh, <clears throat> that infiltrates all the surface uh, stormwater runoff. So it's by code, it was required to have the interior floor drains regardless of the type of use. And it's sprinkled as well? Uh, sprinkled, I don't in. know. No, it's not. It doesn't need to be. There's no dwelling unit in it. Okay. Um, Megan. I just threw you, if I could respond to John's suggestion about the TBD and the comet. Um, Yes, exactly that. I think that was there because this is in the public wellhead recharge district. Um, how this application was presented to the water company as I understand it and why they approved the use as such is because it's exactly as it's been described to you today. So I want to make sure the decision or the language in the decision clearly reflects that. And there are some very clear conditions um, that you know, no heavy commercial servicing of vehicles, no use and storage of hazardous materials and those sorts of things would be allowed on this site without some further review uh, from this board and perhaps from others as well. That would be acceptable. Yeah. Well, any of those conditions would be fine. If you could add paint and bodywork to that as well. But I would be I'll careful about the word bodywork because if, if he does something to the doors or, you know, it, puts laminate or something on them. I don't want to do body work, but painting absolutely requires a, um, a whole different ball game with it, with it enclosed. I had to deal with this out at Holgate's. It's an enclosed situation with all kinds of stuff. So no painting of vehicles. That's fine. Do you mean body work as in um, like major repair? Major Is that what we're getting repair. at? Like, major like body repair? Do it Norman Moore's. Right. Okay. Um, and then yeah. I'm also, if it's all Not right with you, it. suggesting to, to make that to make that maintenance plan available um, to have that in our files as well. Yep. Mr. Chair. Yes, you. I may. I think it's important that we indicate too, and this may already be covered, but if not, there's no exchange of fluids, uh, no exchange of vehicle fluids on the property. That's servicing. Thank you, Stephen. You get that, Megan? Perfect. Um, anybody else from the board or should we move on to the public? We have anyone with any, any survivors out there, Megan? Now they've all gone to bed. Oh, uh, yes, God. Emily Emily, Mold, Emily Molden with her hand raised. Perfect. Welcome back, Emily. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I didn't want you to think that I'd gone to bed. Um, I just would say that I support what you guys have talked about. I think um, those additional conditions sound great. Those were all of the, the things I was going to raise. So I appreciate the discussion. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Emily. Anybody else, Megan? Not seeing motion, anyone. Motion to close public hearing, sir. And we'll need to activate someone, please. Uh, okay. Activate Stephen here, I think. Second. All right. Uh, who seconded that? I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, motion made by Barry, second by Nat Barry. Hi. Nat. Aye. Carl. Did I say Carl? No, nope. Steve. I'm sorry. Aye. John. Aye. And I'm an eye. Fading here. Mm -hmm. the, okay. Your background needs to get to be dark time. It's still daytime back there, Dave. <laughs> it's the only thing keeping me awake, Linda. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, entertain another motion. 
I'll make a motion at this point that we approve the application with the uh, findings and conditions plus the additional conditions that we've added on tonight. Second. Great. Motion made by Barry. Second by Stephen. Barry. Aye. Stephen. Aye. Matt. Aye. John. Aye. And I'm an I myself. Thank you. Good luck, guys. Thanks. Um, Ableway Subdivision, 156 and 158 Cliff Road. Good evening again. Dan Malloy from the applicant. Uh, again, I will make this really quick. We're here before you this evening, 156, 158 Cliff Road, and <clears throat> looking for the board's approval of a four lot definitive subdivision plan. And similar to the other project uh, presented to you uh, tonight, the purpose of this is strictly to show what can be done so we can follow on with a rear lot subdivision plan. In this case, uh, more so to prove, to prove what could be done. The definitive plan shows four lots. The draft of the rear lot plan, uh, which I believe is yes, part of the application, uh, which we intend to come back with is three lots. So, and the overall intent would be the same as what you saw for Surfside Drive uh, with the similar conditions. If, if in fact something were to be completed or followed through on the approval required plan would have to come back to the board and, and get more detailed plans, but it's completely our intent to follow up with the rear lot subdivision. Great, thank you, Dan. Members of the board. I'm gonna be activating you on this, Carl. Um, Mr. Chairman, I can make a point. This is a subdivision application. So oh, okay, that's right, no, you're right, I apologize. I think it's an AR, Dave, Mr. Chair. Well, that's for you, Carl. <laughs> you won't be activated. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Um, uh, board members. Seems pretty straightforward. Yeah. There was no public hearing required with this, right? Sorry, the hour is late. Yes, there is. Uh, this is a public Thank hearing. You. All right. So let's, let's get public Megan, testimony. Who do we have in the public? I think you've got Emily. There we go. There we are. Hi, Emily. Welcome back. Hi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I know that it's late. Just a couple of quick questions. And I didn't raise this before, but Looking at the plan and the, the list of waivers, I am just curious if the, um, specifically the waivers for the, the roadway um, and the roadway layout of 40 feet that's typically required and I know is waived um, somewhat regularly. If that was not waived, would that actually result in a change of the number of lots um, that could be created? I also recognize that this will ultimately turn into a rear lot. Um, yeah. But I just was curious if that was uh, ha would have an impact. And then my other question, I just sort of thought of this and wanted to throw it out there. Um, and again, I know it's late, but I saw in the um, the recommendation for prohibiting uh, tertiary dwellings on these lots or restricting it. Um, and I was just curious, given the restrictions that are on tertiary dwellings as far as um, year round, would the planning board ever consider, and is it even possible to think about a restriction on secondary dwellings and allowing tertiary dwellings because of um, the requirements for ownership? Just a couple of thoughts. Thank you. It's an interesting thought, Emily. Um, thanks. Wouldn't the secondary or tertiaries become the secondary if we eliminated the secondary? It would be it's yeah. interesting. But tertiary topic. is third. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if it was by tertiary just, standards. Right. Yeah, I think that's what she's talking about. But, but then I don't <laughs> think, I'm not sure we would be able to attach the year-round restriction to it because it's not really a tertiary. Yeah. Um, but we, I think it's uh, that's, that's a discussion for another time. <clears throat> um, we, 
Or there, is there, I'm sorry, I, I'd closed the public hearing, but I don't know if there's anybody left in the public. Yet. No, I don't think we closed the public hearing yet. So, is there, is there anyone so, left? No. Okay. Not that I see. Did you make a motion, John? I did close the public hearing. Okay. Second. Very second. Okay. Motion made by John. Very second. John. Aye. Barry. Aye. Matt. Aye. And I'm an aye. Thank you. Oh, that's just the public oh, move oh, on the sorry, sorry. Oh, oh, my, That's my move, Dan. That's my move. <laughs> uh -huh. I'll we make a, a motion to approve the applicant's um, um, uh, proposed um, fine. What? I'm sorry. Uh, make a motion to approve with the findings uh, from staff and the conditions one through thirteen. I'll second that. Great. Motion made by John, seconded by Barry. John. Aye. Barry. Aye. Matt. Aye. And I'm an aye as well. You're welcome, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we're all getting a little punch drunk here. Um, <sighs> we're on the Dave Kim Smiley LLC. 10 and 12, Dave Kim Lane. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to go on record saying that I'm going to recuse from this because I'm on the abutters list, but I do want to make some comments as a property owner later in the public hearing. Great. Thank you, Leslie. <clears throat> um, do we have a, someone representing on this? Uh, so we have, yeah, we have Arthur Reed and Don Bracken um, and a few others that I I think I brought everyone over. All right, great. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, there was an email going around among the other people that I was bringing onto this meeting a little while ago saying that we weren't going to be reached tonight, uh, <laughs> assuming that you were going to want to go home and have dinner. And uh, I assured everybody that uh, the members of the Nantucket Planning Board are made of sterner stuff than that, and uh, <laughs> uh, that we would, in fact, uh, be reached, however late it may be, and however hungry we may all may be. Arthur, Arthur, are you, do you know how the nuggets in the heat are doing? Oh, <laughs> on it. so anyway, uh, I represent Dave Kim Smiley LLC, owner of the land at uh, ten and twelve uh, Dave Kim Lane, uh, and uh, my client proposes to construct a self storage facility containing approximately 101,000 square feet with five levels, uh, two uh, below ground and three above. In addition to the self-storage facility, there will be a duplex uh, with two um, units, uh, two three-bedroom units, uh, at, and that will be at the rear of the property behind the building, which will be uh, facing out toward uh, Dave Kim. We're asking for a waiver of parking, as the staff report points out, and as I think is well known to the board, uh, the uh, typical calculation of one parking space per 900 square feet of commercial or industrial space, not otherwise classified, uh, is really inapplicable to a self-storage facility, which uh, it's well established is a very low generator of either traffic or parking requirements. People tend to go to the facility, put their stuff there, and then visit it uh, very seldom. Uh, and so we're providing 13 parking spaces on the side of the lot on the westerly side, and uh, another five spaces at the rear in the vicinity of the duplex. One of the duplex units will be dedicated, and this would be a condition of the decision, for the staff of the uh, self-storage facility. The other one would be uh, available for rent to an outsider. We're also providing, uh, or, or proposing to provide uh, a uh, 10 uh, space um, covered storage for vehicles uh, on the side of the property. That, that's not counted in the parking spaces and that will be open uh, it won't. It'll be. There will be no do doors on the on the bays. It'll be open, uh, 
and in response to a, a question that Ed Pesci had raised on this, uh, uh, under those circumstances, I don't believe it's been considered to, con to constitute ground cover. It's like an open porch. Uh, the easterly part of the lot uh, toward the top of the screen, as you're looking at it uh, on, on the screen, uh, is subject to an exclusive use easement of the adjacent property, which is why we're not proposing any uses in that uh, in that part of the lot. Uh, the uh, hours of operation were uh, raised as an issue, and uh, we've had a discussion about that. And our proposal would be that uh, the office would be open from 9 to 5.30, Monday through Friday, 8 to 4 on Saturday, and 11 to 3 on Sunday. Uh, and that access to the storage units by the uh, people running them uh, would be available from uh, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. seven days a week. Uh, the other question raised by the staff report uh, was uh, about any additional screening at the rear of the lot. Uh, we're, we are proposing screening in that area. Uh, and uh, we consider that the fact that the duplex residential structure will be between the storage building and the residential area to the rear helps break up the um, impact of the uh, storage building on the residential neighbors to the south. Uh, and Don Bracken will uh, discuss with you the specifics as to what we're proposing by way of, um, of, of screening. Uh, I think we've pretty well addressed the various other questions and issues, all of which were very legitimate questions, as Ed's always are, that Ed has raised. Uh, and, and Don can take now uh, anything related to the screening together with any other uh, issues relating to the uh, engineering and design of the project. Thank you, Arthur. Don, uh, you're you're muted. You're muted. Sorry yeah. about that. <laughs> um, sorry to extend this any further, but a uh, few other things to mention that, uh, in addition to what Arthur said, property is made up of two separate lots that are going to be combined as one. Uh, the total lot area is 1.2 uh, acres. Uh, there's some mixed uses around the property. To the east is the um, Cape Cod Express, uh, sort of like a trekking terminal. To the south. Uh, which is uh, R20 zoning district of two residential properties. And to the west is sort of a mixed use as a commercial use to the back and a residential uh, use to the front. Uh, the lot's fairly level, has a three or four foot drop going across it. Um, the lot is located in a zone two wellhead protection area. Uh, the proposed footprint is just over 20,000 square feet, just under the maximum 40,000 square foot ground cover. Uh, there are six proposed bedrooms uh, for the duplex with separate parking, uh, five spaces for that. Um, the project has 23.7% uh, open space, uh, where 20% is required of vegetated areas. Uh, all the parking areas uh, will be paved and curved uh, the, uh, with a combination of uh, Cape Cod berm and uh, vertical concrete curbs. Uh, utilities on the site, uh, town sewer, town water um, uh, and uh, independent uh, uh, private uh, drainage system design that's uh, been designed in comp compliance with the Stormwater Management Act uh, for being within the zone two um, uh, as, as reviewed by Petchy Engineering. Uh, this, some of the specifics for the landscaping plan, uh, there's a split rail fence uh, along the front with a viburnum hedge uh, along the west is a combination of six foot board fence with columnar uh, oak and uh, climbing ivy on the fence. Along the south uh, toward the residential area, uh, six foot board fence and viburnum hedge. And along the east, another six foot board fence with climbing hydrangea. And um, all the lighting is uh, according to the uh, landscaping plan is compliant. Uh, with the new updated lighting bylaw passed at the recent uh, town, town meeting. Um, also to note, the uh, uh, there's been some significant 
uh, planting and fencing uh, recently added uh, along the northern north border of the residential abutter off to the uh, at the southwest portion of the site. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to answer any engineering or landscaping questions. Thank you, Don. John. Uh, yeah, actually, Don answered a couple of questions already with the uh, lighting and the screening and throughout and the landscaping plan. Um, I, I guess um, just a couple of questions with security. Um, are there going to be gates or access? I know you have different hours of operation, uh, but you also have, uh, you know, for access to the car storage, um, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, and I'm just wondering, since you don't have doors and things on the on the, on the um, uh, where the cars are or, or vehicles are being stored, um, if it's accessible to anybody at any time, let alone the uh, six to ten, um, you know, uh, what's what's your uh, plan for that? I didn't see any gates or or uh, pads or anything like that, keypads or something like that, you know, to the facility. Um, as far as I know, there's not going to be a gate across the driveway. Um, uh, someone else on the team may be able to speak. Uh, towards that or about security well uh, and then obviously that adds the question really it doesn't matter if it's six to, or 10 o'clock p.m because if there are no gates there's no security there's then somebody can go in there at three o'clock in the morning and retrieve a car or it opens up to insurance liability obviously if you're storing cars for a client and then somebody goes in there without any kind of security i'm i'm guessing there's got to be at least cameras or something and does damage to a parked car that's being stored by the commercial entity entity that opens up liability so i would uh i would just say con consider um some kind of security measures there um, if it is a gate uh, but really, it's you know hours of operation is generally for the opening of the storage facility, not necessarily for the uh, retrieval of a car. If there's no no nothing to stop somebody from going in there, right? We we haven't discussed that uh, with the group up to the present time, uh, and uh, it's it, I understand the point, and uh, it's something we can. Uh, think about and uh, and uh, get back to you on as far as that's concerned. Great, thank you. Uh, is that it for you, John? Yes, thank you. All right, Carl, I'm gonna tag you on this before you say a word, so you're gonna be it and uh, you got the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, to echo John, um, security fence with an entry code seems like it might be something to look into for you folks and a uh, surveillance camera system you know with the with the uh, computers in the office for the office staff to monitor and have available that's it thank you thank you well very thank you um i just want to agree with my colleagues that again security will be an issue that i think you're going to need to wind up addressing um the other two things are is there any special flooring requirements drainage requirements given that it's long-term storage in there um stranger things have happened i'm just curious if, if that's something that has to be factored in and i'll have one more question for you i, I I probably can answer that. Um, I, there are no interior uh, floor drains or any uh, storage allowed within the building of hazardous materials. That's in, you know in the bylaw. As far as where the vehicles are parked in that structure, it uh, it's good. It, it's going to be the same. Even though there shouldn't be any runoff on those surfaces going into the drainage system. Obviously, there may be some with wind and and so forth. But the the drainage will be designed. Uh, you know. It, but with like the rest of the parking lot to handle any potential pollutants for the runoff. All right, that sounds great. And just one last thing, any sense of contributions to the Lover Lane, uh, Lover's Lane uh, reconstruction of the uh, streetscape there on the bike path? So just, that's gonna be a primary means of access and egress. Arthur, do you want to answer that yeah. or just talk? Yeah, about I, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not completely clear what you're getting at on that. There. Um, generally, what what I'm talking about is that you know, with since this is a new um, property that's going in, um, commercial in nature, I'm just wondering if there was any thought by the applicant about doing any types of contributions to 
either the reconstruction of Lover's Lane um, streetscape or, or the bike path that's running through that area. Again, that ha that issue hasn't come up, and I'm not sure that the primary access to this uh, property is going to come from um, Lover's Lane. I think it's going to be coming in the the new roadway within the Richmond property. The uh, what is it called, Ironstone or something like that? Hmm. <laughs> Thank you. I think what Bear is referring to, I think what he's referring to is the feeder roads to lovers that will eventually be improved. I mean, eventually they will be. They can't stay like that forever. Yeah. All right. But maybe this is the time we we discuss that a little bit as well, too. Um, if it's not going to be lovers lane, maybe it's one of the feeder roads because I know the roadway system. You know, Lover's Lane, thank God, is going to be improved, but the roadway system deteriorates rapidly into that area. So um, it's I think it's something for us to, to at least be a little focused on on this board. Thank you. Sorry, now I just want to chime in. No, 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 I'm not. I'm just trying to help. Stephen. Well, uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, um, a lot of comments that have been made, I agree with and uh, share concerns. I'd like to kind of switch gears a little bit over to the duplex. Um, if uh, through you, I'll ask the applicant's agent to speak to kind of elaborate on what the use will be. You know, obviously it's residential, but is this gonna be targeting employees of the facility or is it gonna be used for other employee housing on the island? And if so, um, uh, other employers on the island. And if so, should we be looking at some discussion about a management plan or something to that effect? Um, there are, you know, residences immediately abutting very close to the property line. So I think that uh, that would be appropriate discussion if, if it is going to be some type of a dormitory situation or if in the future it could be. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great. Thank you. Um, response? Arthur, maybe to how that, that other yeah, I, I, I don't believe that it's going to be anything like a dormitory. And my, my expectation is that it will be uh, uh, that one of the units will be probably used as a family residence by the by the manager. I can't say for sure. That's something we'll have to discuss. The other unit uh, would be rented to the public. And uh, uh, as in a, another situation that came up earlier tonight, under no circumstances, would that or should that be used as a short-term rental? And that would be uh, prohibited uh, specifically by the decision. Uh, uh, obviously, we're anticipating that uh, whatever use of the property will be essentially uh, uh, effectively workforce housing. Great. Great. So we can add that in the decision. Thank you. Um, have we ever permitted an MCD with two, two levels below grade? Yeah, I, I think the Tomahawk storage facility is two levels below grade. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. And was there anything particular to that MCD that that would apply here? I don't think I was on the board when we did that. Just a question. I think it's a parallel situation, certainly. Uh, there, there are some differences, yeah. but it's size and uh, and uh, and nature and and the and comparable in the area where it's located and I have not heard that there have been any issues or problems with regard yeah, to the immigration and, and I'm not and that's not what I'm insinuating at all Arthur I just want to know if there was any any particular things that we put in the decision on that project particular to the two two floors below grade I don't um, believe if so. not we, we didn't then we didn't that's great just a question. Um, Offhand, I'm I'm not sure, but I'd be happy to take a look at that for for the next meeting. If you don't mind, Megan, that would be awesome. Um, anybody else before we go to the public? Mm -hmm. We have anyone with their hands up? Leslie Snell. You're muted, Leslie. There we go. My internet connection's not as good in this part of the house. Uh, so Leslie Snell, 23 Woodland Drive. 
And I'm not opposed to the use generally. I think it's probably a quiet use for that property, but I do have some concerns and I have some questions that I'd like to express. So with the hours of operation, I think the business hours are totally acceptable, but I do have some concerns about the 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. access to units, particularly if there's not a gate or anything to really keep people within those hours. Um, I'm concerned about noise as early as 6 a.m. and noise as late as 10 p.m., as well as lights and, and other things that would disrupt a residential neighborhood to the south of the site. Um, so lighting and noise. Uh, I'd like to see a lighting plan. I don't think that one was submitted or if, if there was one, I overlooked it. Um, but I would certainly hope they're looking at low level lighting, um, bollard lights, wall mounted lights, that type of thing, not tall pole mounted lights. Um, I'd like to ask the applicant to extend the taller trees around the corner to the south side of the site. Um, there used to be a berm there, which was removed, and it totally blocked that site from a residential neighborhood. And now the view is completely open to the commercial, um, which again, I understand it's zoned commercial, but it would be nice if there was a, a better buffer with some taller trees proposed. Um, let's see what else. Uh, I didn't see any rendering. So is my question is, is there external access to the storage units or is it all internal to the building? Um, I would be concerned about, you know, commercial activity expanding into the storage center that it's not just used for, for storage. For instance, you know, contractors using it for active storage and coming and going from the site as if it's their shop. Um, so that's something that I'd like a little more information on. And um, I had a question about the dorm or the duplex in the back, but that was answered. So I, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Um, on any any response to those concerns? Yeah, I can uh, I can respond. There there is a lighting plan. It was the second sheet on the landscape plan that shows the lighting details and the light locations. Um, <clears throat> on the site plan, we do show the egress uh, points um, to the east is one main door. And to the south and the north is one door. And then, I'm sorry, to the west is uh, one main door. It, and to the east, there are three access points with a sidewalk. Um, I, I believe that, yeah, the architectural plans that should show those points. Um, certainly, we can talk to the landscape architect about extending the taller trees um, along that parking area, I assume, up to where the duplex goes. That will, that will add, I think, to the vertical buffer. Hopefully that answers the questions I could answer. Anyway. Yeah, and, and these are geared to be storage, right? Not shops, not, right. not yeah. paint mm -hmm. shops or carpentry shops or anything like no. that. It is just storage. No, it's mm -hmm. storage, storage and warehousing. Yep. Not not uh, not ancillary storage for a contractor or anybody else, as far as that's concerned. Storage per se. Yep. Great. <clears throat> Um, do we have anyone else in the public? Megan? I'm not, I'm not seeing anyone. Okay. Barry? Yeah, um, not seeing anyone else too. I, we've got a few issues that I think we need to resolve with this. So it might be prudent, I hate to say it, continue to our next meeting just to resolve some of the issues we've talked about, like with security fencing and uh, straightening up the landscape. Yep, I agree. And and maybe like I said, looking looking at the general area too and see if there's any improvements that have to take place. I'll second that. Uh, <laughs> uh motion made by Barry, seconded by John Barry. Aye. John? Aye. I think I tagged Carl on this. <clears throat> Carl, you here? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, we're voting to continue. Okay. And your vote is? Aye. Thank you. Matt? I'm an aye. I'm an aye. Thank you. And I'm an aye as well. We'll see you guys next month. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.
Um, <clears throat> the KMP Muldoon Family Nominee Trust, 9 Arlington Street. Mr. Chair, I need to recuse myself from this. Okay. Thank you. Great. So that means I need to choose two on this. And it doesn't look like Abby's around, so it's going to be Stephen and Carl. Um, is this you, Dan? Yep, Dan Malloy again for the applicant. So we have a little bit of a different application here with this one. Uh, so we have a residential lot in Log 3 and 9 Arlington Street. Uh, <clears throat> property's been owned by the same family for quite a long time. And they're trying to do something with the property and they're running across pretty much everywhere they go. They're running across issues or restrictions or regulations prohibiting what they can do. So the application before you tonight, they're seeking a special permit for a primary use residential garage. Uh, and the reason for that, to quick, try to make this a quick rundown, uh, due to regulations from septic systems and wells, the property cannot support a septic system or a well. Uh, we did go to the Board of Health and ask for variance relief from them, that was denied. Uh, so this is strictly being proposed as a residential garage, period. There's no, the only utilities is electric. There's no water source. There's no bathroom, um, no septic system. It can't, it ain't, on top of that, it can't be commercial. So what they're looking to do is basically get permission to build, instead of a residence, just a garage where a property owner, whether somewhere in Tom Nevers, if they wanted to buy the lot, uh, could store their vehicles. You know, something, if they don't have room on their existing lot, they want to store a vehicle, they can store their vehicle there. Uh, but again, it's residential use only, it cannot be commercial. And essentially, this is the owner's last stop to try to find some use for a property they've owned for generations. Um, really, unfortunately, their own their own, their own long-term fault, if they had developed the property 30 years ago or 40 years ago, like others had, then we wouldn't be here today. Uh, but they've essentially been regulated out of every other use of the property. So we're looking for the, asking the board to issue a special permit to allow a residential garage to be constructed uh, only because of a residence itself, a dwelling can't be constructed. So it's a primary use, a uh, special permit for a garage. That's it. Thank you. Dan, do, do the owners abut this property? They do not. Are they in within? Uh, no, they're not. The property has been listed for sale. Uh, oh. I think uh, I know that's in the app. Uh, Thanks, some of the abutters. I, that's common knowledge, apparently, at this point. I, I wasn't aware at the beginning, but it is, is listed for sale. Oh. Um, so they're looking to develop the property with a garage on it so they can basically get some value back for all the ownership and taxes they've been paying on it. Thanks, Dan. Um, Steve, I see your hand up, but I'm gonna go to the board first. Anybody on the board? Nope. Okay, Stephen, go on. Sure. Mr. Chairman, um, you know, I represent uh, Ingrid Kolb, who's one of the abutters in the area and um, already opposed this at the um, Board of Health and I'm here to oppose it now um, for you know, different reasons based on the area of jurisdiction. Um, you know, I, I personally am sympathetic to this family that they have land that's essentially unbuildable, but the idea that they're proposing a nearly 1500 square foot garage that's 60 feet wide uh, suggests to me that, that they're not even remotely trying to be uh, considerate of what's appropriate. Um, you know, so the planning board has authority to to allow for garages as a primary use on a structure on a on a lot, but in my understanding and experience, that is essentially only done when the garage is associated with a residence that is you know either across the street or nearby. Um, this is often the case in town and in Scottsdale in little lots where there are garages that are historically on lots um, that are separated by a road or, you know, two houses down or something like that. Uh, it's common, it's appropriate, it makes sense in those situations. Here, there's no residence associated with this property whatsoever. The building is larger than nearly any house in the neighborhood. And, you know, it's likely to become a, a warehouse or something. Like, I just, I, I can't imagine 
what is approvable here. It's too big and it's not associated with anything. Um, and I would urge the board to reject this application. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Members of the board. Um, sorry. Oh, that's Steve's and um, Mr. Chairman, just I, I didn't, that's that is it is a big garage and it's and it's wide so that means how many how many doors you know is there going to be three four or five cars in here Dan I mean we first question that came to my mind is this is like a sort of like a paper street if they tried to sell portions of this to the abutters and just make their lots bigger in an area that's already got messed up lots anyway from many years ago. I don't think these are those gigantic lots next door to these, right? These are small ones, right? Yeah, I can answer those. So I'm not sure if honestly, I don't know if there's been any direct contact with the buyers to sell it, but from a benefit standpoint, there's no, <clears throat> there's no, Due to the abutting lot sizes and the size of this lot, there's really no benefit to the abutters to own this other than open space. It doesn't offer them, basically everyone in the neighborhood is restricted with well and septic requirements. So having more square footage for someone isn't necessarily going to improve their value allowing them to build anymore. Uh, in terms of the building as proposed, mm -hmm. yes, it, you know, we proposed something that would fit. And with the intent of getting this in front of you to see what the board we're willing to entertain. So the building you're looking at, yes, it's large. It's it's big enough to have a four big four garage doors on it. Uh, or obviously willing to shrink that down. We'll drop it down to two cars if that's something we would entertain. But we're, we're trying to get something for the owners so they can recover some use of their property. And if it has to come down to a two car garage, then so be it. Uh, in addition to that, we've shown in the plan, you know, the landscape and we can have restrictions on landscaping around the buffer, uh, around the perimeter. There's no reason, again, we don't need to clear cut this whole lot. So we're certainly looking at ways to get something, some beneficial use of the property, but also preserving the vegetation and the abutters at the same time. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen one, anything like this before that I can remember. Um, I totally understand all the minimum ground cover and the state and the undersized lots and blah, blah, blah. Tom Nevis, I, I get that. That's why I'm wondering why, the, you know, I don't see, I mean, I, I agree with you, Dan. I understand you know more than I do, but if you add 4,000 4, square feet to each about his lot, that has to be something. Um, if this family's owned this land that long and has been paying who knows what kind of taxes on something that's unbuildable, it's not free to build a garage. It's expensive, even if it doesn't have any amenities in it. And in this market on the Nantucket, yes, we just had an application for, there's a lot of, there's a market for parking cars in, on, undercover. I go to these houses and see these vehicles that sit outside. I mean, it's brutal what happens to these vehicles, how rusty they get underneath. So there's a lot of market for that. But I'm just looking at it from a practical standpoint that this is, it's kind of expensive to, to try to recoup something like this, to do this now. I mean, it's their business, I'm just saying. Um, definitely got to make it smaller. I, I already asked staff about this bylaw, this part of the bylaw that we put in for these kind of lots. So I understand what we are allowed to do with this as far as a special permit. So you definitely got to make it smaller for starters. Because that's, I mean, it's got commercial written all over it, even though it isn't. And you know, understand? I mean, that's there's even if there's no water, sinks, toilets, etc., it's not going to magically turn into a house. So that's not a problem. But the use is going to be, you know, the issue in the, in the massing. So that's all right. I have for now. Thanks. I mean, I, I for me, I, I just, 
there's so many ways that this could go sideways in a residential neighborhood is my concern. Um, and, and I feel for feel for the applicant. Um, if it was smaller, maybe I just still I, I think that it has such a opportunity to be abused by whoever buys it. And that's not your applicant's fault, but it's something I think we need to, to think about. <clears throat> Anybody else? I'll go, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you. Uh, I agree with that. I think, you know, it's kind of a crying shame in addition that there's not some way to make a lot like this work through a town program for affordable housing. Um, but in any event, uh, it's too large for what's proposed, um, including, as the chair said, a chance for this thing to go sideways. I think if it's approved, it should be approved with pretty much every condition that can be applied uh, to prevent any problems from arising. And um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Carl. I think this is a um, quiet residential neighborhood with folks, families, and children and grandchildren riding their bikes and carrying on on this road, one of those uh, many, many uh, Tom Nevers roads, A, B, C, D, F, or whatever they are. Um, I think it's inappropriate to put a 58-foot wide garage on this property. And uh, I think it should be rejected. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Neighbors should buy it and turn it into a park. Almost like owning a land on Co2. Kinda. I feel for the applicant, but I just <laughs> yeah. Um anybody else? Megan, do we have anyone in the public? Mm -hmm. Yes, we have quite a few people <clears throat> in the public. We have Ron Arrigo, Arthur Reed, Kathleen Cavanaugh, Sarah Bartlett, Sarah Alger, and Leslie Lloyd. Wow. We'll start with Ron. A garage that I've never seen show. such a good turnout. They've already, <laughs> had, they've already had dinner. Thank yes, I have had dinner. For, I, I acknowledge two minutes of time and I thank you all for your service. I do quite a bit in our hometown of Sherburne, Massachusetts. So thank you for this. Um, I live my wife and I live at five Arlington. Um, as to the question, Mr. Malloy said, what what can the owner do? I will respond with they should do what we did, which is in the fall. We completed purchase of number three, Arlington, which is also a small lot adjacent to our home. We expect to uh, increase our ground cover, enjoy the property as a green space, or perhaps uh, build a garage adjacent to our property future, but no plans. Um, as uh, Carl mentioned, it is one of those classic Tom Never streets. It's a sand street. It's narrow. There are no sidewalks. It's full of children on bikes as a dead end street, enjoying summertime uh, with concern of Amazon trucks and UPS uh, up and down the street. Um, but it is a family neighborhood and we expect uh, and hope that you will honor that. Uh, and again, um, the neighbors, uh, the previous family who owned number three reached out, the Foley family owned for generations and uh, through the neighborhood email distribution list, we were able to contact them and secure the property for $125,000, not the uh, current uh, marketed price of 529, um, which uh, Mr. Malloy didn't represent. It's more than looking to do something and recoup some of their three or $4,000 a year taxes. It's looking to profit big time. Appreciate your perspective and thank you for listening to me tonight. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Arthur, welcome back. Thank you very much. Uh, my dinner is now getting cold and my wine is getting warm. Uh, but I think it's important that we address the issues involved in this. I represent Leslie Lloyd, a uh, direct abutter to the property who is also on the queue to speak. The history of residential garages under zoning is that for a long time, they were strictly an accessory use. And in fact, 
uh, it, you could not have a garage. It would require a variance to have a garage, uh, a residential garage on a lot that didn't have a primary use, which in residential zoning uh, is a dwelling. And the issue came up uh, that there are a number of situations in which people would have a garage across the street or they would have a small lot and no garage and would be able to buy a lot across the street or something like that so that they could build a garage. And it would be residential in nature because just as if it were on the same lot, uh, it would be effectively accessory to the residential use in the immediate neighborhood. Now in this situation, if as my good friend, Mr. Malloy was suggesting, this would be able to be used to be uh, rent it out to uh, other people in the neighborhood who might want to store cars or other people who might not be in the neighborhood who would want to store cars. That's not a residential use. This isn't a residential garage if it's going to be used in that way. And a commercial garage would be prohibited in this district. This is, and, and obviously the idea of a 1500 square foot or 1450 square foot footprint for a garage even if it were cut down from that, as was indicated, you're still dealing with something that's large and is essentially commercial in nature, regardless of its size. <clears throat> so I think that the obvious point on this is that uh, uh, the lot is not a buildable lot. It, the, the same family apparently has owned it for a long time and it's been inherited and so on. Uh, so be it. They, uh, as a result of uh, uh, the conditions on the site, the fact that it can't support a uh, well and septic, it's just not a buildable lot. And as in the situation that Mr. Arrigo, the previous speaker, was uh, addressing, the only practical use of this property is to sell it either in whole or in part to one or more abutters. Uh, and not expect the value of a buildable lot because it isn't one. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Kathleen, welcome. Thank you. I'm just finishing up my dinner at crew. I've been on since four o'clock. Can people hear me? Rubbing it in. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, my concern about this lot, like that everyone has, is that first of all, it is like a commercial garage being built on a lot, and we don't even know who's going to be taking care of it and managing it. And in addition, I have a 40 by 100 foot lot right next to me, and I think this is, will start a horrible precedent where we have these little lots in Tom Nevers, and people are going to be building garages. So um, that is why I, I, I object to this being built. Great. Thank you, Kathleen. Hey, thanks. Sarah. Hi. Um, thank you so much. I cannot believe uh, how long you guys do this all night. But um, um, Stephen, thank you. Great points. Um, I am an, a butter here on Arlington. We have owned this property for 30 years, um, as has Kathleen, um, Ingrid, um, and we are a tight-knit little community. Um, and it, Kathleen brought up the point of, which is one of my big concerns, is no one monitoring it. Um, a couple of the, our neighbors could not be on the call. Um, and we are concerned, what if you are, it's that 1400 square feet, and I don't want to approve even a one car garage where there's no adjoining owner present. But if you, this one can actually, I looked up, could ho ho host six vehicles in it, six unmonitored vehicles with gasoline storage, with things like that. You know, we are such a fire hazard here. These houses are so close. We have that fire break behind us um, to um, help prevent if we have any um, ish issues here, but we're a dead end. We would, if that, if anything happened there, we would be trapped on the back end of this street. Um, and like, um, I can't remember whether it was Dave 
or Stephen that brought up about that it definitely reeks of commercial use of renting it out to someone else. I just, I, yes, I feel badly. They didn't do anything. I can't remember when the stuff changed. What was it like 2005 on um, being able to have a different setback between the septic and the well to have it buildable. Um, but we have a lot of these little paper roads type small lots. It's 0.18 acres. Um, and, um, there's quite a few of them and there are no other, I sat with Megan. She looked in the town. The only one she thinks she could find that had a garage that the owner was not exactly adjacent, um, was, um, over by the airport, um, where it's a street with, if you go down it, um, it's next to like Wampanoag or one of those that has a whole bunch of commercial vehicles sitting on it. Um, so and I'm going to ask you to, to wrap it up if you could. Oh, please. sure. Um, and so I just, we just have so many concerns about that. And one of our other, it's really setting a precedent for these non-conforming lots. One of our other neighbors wrote me tonight, said, um, it seems that Article 3 Use and Intensity Regulations 139.7b Four, would preclude the construction of a garage in our neighborhood since it is not in keeping with the character of the neighborhood and would be deleterious in its functioning. Um, those are not my words, um, but she asked if I would pass that on. So thank you very much for considering this and hope you can shut it down. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. On to the next, Sarah. Welcome back. You're muted, Sarah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, okay, we can. Great. I'm going to be super quick. I couldn't say it any better than the previous speakers, particularly Arthur. It's too big. I mean, you're, a normal two guard garage is 24 by 24, which is 576 square feet. This is just about 900 square feet more than that. These things should be tied to residences in the area. It's just overdone, and that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Have a good night. Leslie. Yes, hi. Thank you so much. My name is Leslie Lloyd, and my family and I own the property that abuts 9 Arlington. We really do appreciate having the opportunity to raise our concerns, and we appreciate all of you that have stayed up all night, presumably without your dinner, to listen to our all of these petitions, including our concerns. Um, by way of background, we've owned our home at 12 Berkeley Street for about almost 15 years, and we've raised our family in this town and in this home. Um, and we love our little neighborhood in Tom Nevers West. It's, um, if you haven't spent time there, it's a neighborhood that's full of year rounders, longtime seasonal owners, children, dogs, and a lot of bunnies. Um, our kids bike and they jog and they scooter. They visit their friends from house to house on our unpaved roads. And by and large, our neighbors take really great care of their homes. Um, by Nantucket standards, our homes are modest. And most of us have these three bedroom, two to three bath homes that are upside down and that were built by Jeff there. We have really grave concerns about this proposal uh, to build a primary use garage. Uh, first, you know, this intended use is quite a concern. Um, obviously, as we talked about, this request for a septic system um, really, you know, implies that the intention is to use this space for housing. And the just the language primary use implies that there's a secondary use. Um, and just a few streets over, I don't know if you know this, but on Clarendon Street, a garage was put up with a second story dwelling despite not being approved by the Board of Health. So in this case, given how outsized the proposed building is planned for, it really calls into significant doubt that they truly intend for this to be anything but a dwelling. Uh, secondly, like everyone else has said, we're very concerned with the scale of the building and that it's not consistent with our modest neighborhood. This large garage would be 58 feet by 25 feet. That is humongous. The square footage of just the first floor of the garage exceeds the combined first and second floor uh, floor pans, plans of many of the surrounding homes in totality. Um, and I didn't see anywhere on the plan where the height of the building would be indicated. Um, and particularly of concern would be whether there would be a second story. 
Um, as others said, this garage would easily fit five commercial trucks. With the landowners living off the island and certainly with their intent to sell the property, um, you know, it is inconceivable that this property would be used to store residential uh, vehicles. And honestly, this is a very modest neighborhood with really down to earth neighbors. And the possibility of any future owner having a five car garage for their personal use is absurd. Uh, so that really brings us to the reality that this concept having having a ask you to wrap it up, please. Okay. So we are concerned about noise coming in at all hours, the safety of our kids on scooters. And then lastly, I just want to say, you did ask at the beginning, one of the board members, um, whether they tried to sell the property to an abutter, and we are uh, a very close abutter, and indeed they have not. So thank you for your time. We appreciate all that you're doing. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, is that it for the public, Megan? Barry. That is, yes, it is. Thank oh, you. hold yeah. on. One, there is one more. Donna DePriest. Okay. Hey, Donna, welcome. Yes, we're, we're keeping uh, it to two minutes, please. Sure, I'll be quick. Um, I live at 13 Arlington. Um, and I just want everyone to remember that we're a neighborhood. And a neighborhood is an area where people live and interact with each other. And an empty building of any size that does not have people living in it does not lend itself to a neighborhood. And it just lends itself to problems. Anything that's uninhabited, leads to nothing but problems down the road. So I just want our neighborhood to be preserved as a place where people live. That's really all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. And we have one more, Ingrid Kolb. All right. Hey, Ingrid, we're keeping them to two minutes. Okay, I'll be less than two minutes. Stephen Cullen awesome. is representing me and representing me quite well. Thank you, Stephen. I just wanna give a big ditto to everything that everyone has said. We are a neighborhood, we are a residential neighborhood and really concerned about the fact that a commercial, what could be a commercial garage would be constructed in the middle of our street, changing the character of our neighborhood, lowering the value of our properties. That is a great concern to us. And especially what Kathleen Cavanaugh was talking about, the precedent that this could potentially set. We have a lot of small lots sprinkled all throughout Tom Nevers and the prospect of garages being constructed on them for people outside of Tom Nevers to come and park their cars does not sit well with any of us at all. So respectfully request that the board uh, deny the special permit request. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, if you're taking second round, Sarah Bartlett has her hand raised. Sarah, if you can make it super quick, I think that two, two seconds. I forgot to mention that uh, the um, I was told that the neighbor directly behind them um, did offer to purchase the property, and I'm sure it was a nominal amount compared to the 539 that they were looking for, but um, that they were not interested in that. They're looking for the larger um, profit on it. So great. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Barry. Just real quickly, you know, the current way that lot is configured, you're not going to get anything out of it. It's just in such a bad location, it's not even funny. I mean, I've, I've looked at the GIS map and stuff, and, and really the only possibility, which is kind of far-fetched, is, is to talk to the people at 13 Berkeley, see if they're interested and in reconfigure the lots and reconfigure Norwood Court. It's possible. It is possible that something can happen. But again, there's there, there's a lot of moving components to that. But I, I I concur with my colleagues that in its current configuration, it is just ripe for potential abuse. And the and the problem will be is how is that going to get monitored over time? And when it does get monitored, let's just say for the fund, it does report itself back out. Eventually, the question now will come before the board at this point. Now, what do we do? So I'm going to encourage a proactive role here at this point. Thanks. Thank you, Barry. Um, I'd entertain a motion if there's no other hands in the public. Oh, I think Mr. Malloy had a comment. Well, I'm sorry, Dan. I'd like at least to 
entertain the idea if the board is willing, uh, obviously to reduce the size of this down to a simple two car, two car, one story garage. Uh, and obviously emphasizes can be conditioned. And I understand, and I'm not going to speak to some of the things you butter said, I can't say who the owners have spoken to or they haven't, because I, I do not know. Um, obviously it could be sold to a butters, but then it could be sold to an abutter and they could turn around and ask for the same variance or the same special permit. So I understand their concerns, but as a property owner there, they have the right to ask for the permit, obviously you don't have to grant it. Uh, but I'd ask you give them some deference <clears throat> if they do reduce this to a two car garage, single story. Uh, we are proposing to landscape it and screen it. And it can be conditioned, I think, from the board that it can only be used, for, it can only be used by zoning period for residential use. And it can be conditioned as such. And it can be, I don't think it'd be very hard to police it. If, if it's something that's not being right there, it can be easily reported and shut down. Uh, so I'd just like the board to at least give it some consideration to the property owners to at least have some use of their property, uh, even if we shrink it, like I said, to a two-car garage. That's all. Thank you. Uh, my problem is if there's no one living living here and it's not a garage for a neighbor, that that it is going to be problematic. And then we put the neighbors in a position of dialing the zoning enforcement officer every other day. And I just, I, I feel terrible about this, but for me, I just, I can't see building a structure for someone that doesn't live adjacent to it or even have access to it for the most part if they don't live on island. Barry? I'm gonna be very brief. Just through you to Leslie at this point, have we ever approved anything in terms of, of a concept like this with a two car garage or one car garage? I can't remember over my tenure here, but I just need to cross check. I'm sorry, could you repeat that real quick? Yeah, I'm just I'm just curious if we've ever had a similar circumstance crop up on the board before where not as large, but maybe a one or two car garage that is completely isolated from everything else has ever been come before this board. Um, I just can't I, remember. I can think of a couple that have been approved where the um, owner had a house across the street or next door. I think there was one approved on Marianne Drive where they did not currently have a house, but maybe had planned to build one later. Um, I can't think of a completely isolated residential garage that was approved by a special permit. Right. Thank you. I just wanted to see if there was any precedent that had been set. Thank you. We have one more Hello. member of the public that just joined with his hand raised. Play um, Twombly. Bring them on. Okay. Hi, Clay. Welcome. We're trying to keep the comment short, so two minutes, please. We'll be very brief. Thank you. It's Clay Twombly and Joe Olson, and we we um, actually own uh, Seven Arlington, and we're the ones that I believe Sarah Bartlett were, was referring to that had made an offer to them, and they turned us away. Um, and Sarah Alger has spoken on our behalf. So we just wanted to um, say that, um, just put our two cents in. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Barry. Mr. Chairman, seeing no one else from the public at this point, and we still have some hearings, I'm gonna make a motion that we close the public hearing. Do a second? Second. Uh, motion made by Barry, second by Nat. Barry. Aye. Nat. Aye. Carl. Do I need to be activated, Mr. Chair? Yeah, I think I activated you guys in the beginning. Both oh, Steve, Steve and I? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, yes. Steve. Aye. Thank you. Steve. Aye. And I'm an I. Uh, uh, Dan. Uh, well, I think I may just save the board the trouble. So I think we can see where the 
without asking for a straw vote, I think I can see where this is directed. Uh, so if it pleases the board, I'd like to request a withdrawal without prejudice. That would be my motion then, sir. Do I have a second? Second. Second. All right, motion made by Barry, seconded by Stephen Barry. Aye. Stephen. Aye. Nat. Aye. Carl. Aye. And I'm an I, unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dan. And I'm sorry. I mean, I wish I wish we'd come up with something better. Um, on to the next. Um, Joseph J and Marsha J Aguiar, Marksway Subdivision 68, Fairgrounds Road. Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, I believe the next two are subdivisions, if I may be excused. Yes, you may be. Excellent. Um, you guys have a great evening. Thanks. Hold on. Yeah, right? We're good. Megan? Yep. Eat for me. And drink for me. Um, Dan, are you representing this as well? Mr. Chair? Yes. You need me for the rest of the meeting? Have a good night, Carl. <laughs> Goodbye. Yeah. Thank you all. Yep. Nice job, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Carl. Take Thank care. You, Carl. Whether you mean it or not, thank you. Dan, are you all right? right. Yeah, Dan Malloy again uh, for the applicants on this one. This one will be very quick again, similar to several other applications you've looked at tonight. So it's 68 Fairgrounds Road, the property is zoned R40. Uh, we've got a definitive application in front of you tonight to show that uh, two lots are possible under an approval required subdivision on the road. And again, our intent here is to follow this up with a rear lot subdivision with two lots. And uh, that's as quick as I can make it. Great, thank you. Again, another straightforward one. Um, board, welcome back, John. Thank you. Go to the public, if you would, sir. Okay, anyone in the public? Seeing no, no. hands up. Seeing none. I'd entertain a motion. So moved, close public hearing, sir. Second. Uh, Barry made it, made the, oh, God, I can't even speak anymore. Barry. Aye. John. Aye. Nat. Aye. And I'm an aye as well, to the merits. So motion to approve at this point with the conditions and findings as identified by staff in the report. Of the second? Second. <clears throat> Second. Motion made by Barry. Second by Nat. Barry. Aye. Nat. Aye. John. Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Down Thank you. Stretch we go. PM Reese Trucking Inc. MJ Way Subdivision 10 Green Meadow. Hey, uh, again, Dan Malloy for the applicant. And I think this will be another fairly quick one. So we're in front of you tonight for a two lot approval required subdivision. Uh, I'll start off quick on this one. So when we filed this, we did file it obviously as an approval required. It certainly can show that two lots are possible. They're oversized lots, so we could actually do more. Uh, and one thing I think we somehow overlooked maybe in the amount of these going in lately, uh, this property is also eligible for rear lot subdivision. Uh, which was not presented to you as part of this application. But having looked through it uh, this evening, I guess what I would tell you is that you have an approval required application in front of you, similar to every other one you've seen tonight. However, I expect we will be following this up with a rear lot subdivision for two lots as well. Uh, we have seen the staff report. We're perfectly fine with the conditions that are in the report. Uh, I think there's only a question mark whether or not you wanted to do discuss any type of gifting as a condition of anything in there. Uh, otherwise, uh, we're okay with the approval or well, the conditions as drafted, and we intend to follow it up with a real life subdivision. Great. Thank you, Dan. Uh, board members. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, just did we have any restriction or or on, on the 
uh, on the next lot. It looked like it was subdivided at one time. So did, was there any restriction for second um, further subdivision? Which, which this lot is, hasn't, was hasn't this been subdivided. First, oh, this is the first, yeah, that triangular. I thought maybe that was a subdivision right here, the one to the left of that. Maybe that was once a part of a, a larger lot that was subdivided, and maybe there would have been a restriction for future subdivision. No. Okay. That's my only concern. Thank you. No. So um, there's no language in here pertaining to once approved by the A and R that he that he needs to come back. Is there, like there were in the previous ones? Not in this application because it wasn't at the beginning presented as that. Um, but I think we can. So put can that. we add language to? We to... can add that language, like from the Perfect. others. Great. um any anyone from the board just a uh, uh, discussion about contribution to um okay. yep. utilize the area improvements suggested contribution um one thing from past history with the board's done is i don't know if this has changed but typically i recall if they're Entertained offers, I think it was two thousand dollars, roughly per building permit, something mm -hmm. to that effect. Yeah, that sounds fair to me. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Great. You can add that into the decision, please. Um, anyone else on the board before I go to the public? No, nope. Megan. Uh, Jill Sandol. Sandoli. Welcome, Jill. Sandoli, sorry. That's all right. Welcome, Jill. Hi, everybody. Thank you for staying up so late. I, uh, I've always appreciated everybody who serves on boards, but I have a bigger appreciation <laughs> since I've been with you since four o'clock. <laughs> but I got to take a <laughs> break. Anyway, um, um the abutting neighbor at 12 and I've lived here in this peaceful neighborhood for 28 years and raised our son here. It's a very family, lovely neighborhood um, where most of the people have lived here as long as I have. And um, the structure, one structure is already going up, um, you know, 10 feet from my backyard and it's been upsetting to me. So I probably should have figured out how to do something about it, but I knew there probably wasn't anything I could do because I didn't get warning in October when Miles came and plowed down every tree, every surrounding tree and bush um, where there was a ton of wildlife and gave privacy to my, you know, between our properties and then to poor Leanne, a former student of mine from CPS, and her mom, I couldn't even see her house. And now it's just totally open. She's going to have this monstrous staff house duplex. We both are in the corner of our properties. And um, it's already, it used to be a very quiet neighborhood. And with like Essex, you know, I forget how many years ago, but that went in and it's lovely for all the people that have places to live. But just on Sunday, there's screaming and loud music like Sunday evening, getting into the like, people partying like crazy. And it happens all the time surrounding my common app, you know, and we have this lovely dead end. And now apparently it's a duplex. So it's going to be four more vehicles. There's already two vehicles on that lot. And they also drive in with the big trucks at lunchtime and let the dog out. And I mean, all his guys over the years, I've always gotten along with them. It's just a small house on the property. And I, I just, it sounds like you guys are already like going to approve that he can possibly build even a third dwelling and sub make a subdivision in our little family neighborhood. It just doesn't seem appropriate to me. 
and um, I'm surprised that other people in the neighborhood aren't here, but um, attending the meeting. So um, I don't know what else to say. I, I, I don't think it's appropriate. Um, I know he already has permits to do what he's doing. It's huge. And I just hope you're not gonna allow him to build another structure on the property and make like, it's like miles, re, you know, commercial zone here on our little dead end neighborhood <laughs> that all these little kids are biking around all the time. And it's what my child was able to do. And um, I, I don't know, was it, did, did anyone else from my neighborhood write in? There were a couple of people that said they were gonna attend, but maybe, not that I know of, Jill. So, yeah. so, Jill, he has a legal right to do this. Um, but when he comes back for um, a rear lot, we can ask him to put up appropriate buffering at, um, between a you. Rear lot? What, what do you mean a rear lot? The whole structure is already uh, going to be in the whole the, rear. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure what you're talking it, about. It, Jill, Jill. Sorry. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, right, I'm, I'm, I'm out for one sec. Time out for one sec. Hold Matt, on, Matt. You respond to Jill. It's fine. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna help Jill. I'm gonna come by and we're gonna have one of our chats. Okay. <laughs> and I'm gonna explain. Well, lucky Jill. I don't want you. To, I don't want you to say things that are making people like go, oh my God, she doesn't know what her own zoning is. Okay, because that's what every single person is thinking right now. So I, I don't want you to be embarrassed. All right, I I, I understand. This neighborhood, I understand about this neighborhood was this, this neighborhood was RC two. It has oversized lots, but at the time when things like this were built, this is around eighty four area, I believe. It could be off a couple of years. When we when lots were laid out back then, five hundred lots a year in the eighties, they didn't think about value and what could be done with the zoning that we had, even though that zoning allowed a lot of stuff to happen, way more than now, but the value was zero. No one thought about it. And when you're on, when you own a piece of property that big, that can have that much development on it. It's, which there isn't much land left and that's what's going to start to happen in these neighborhoods. That's why we changed the zoning to reduce what could happen. Even though it seems like a lot, it's less than what could have happened. So I, I'm sorry that you live next to that, but you, I don't know how many square feet your lot is, but you can do a lot on yours too. And so can the other people. And that's what Dave is alluding to. So. I enjoy my backyard privacy. I don't want to <laughs> overbuild. And I understand that, but I'm just saying. <laughs> so sorry, Mr. Chairman. I didn't mean to interrupt the way I did, um, but I just, it, it, I just didn't really understand because it seems like the whole back area is going to be this huge new structure. And so I, I just don't understand where another thing would go. But um, I, we understand your frustration. Um, and we will do our best to help mitigate it for you in the next step. Barry. So that just brings it right now. That's provided there is a next step at this point. Leslie, I just need your help for about five seconds. Or Megan. Maximum vegetated buffer that can be put in place, setback only or additional. Maximum vegetated buffer, where can it go? Is that the question? Yeah, across, uh, with the property as the way it's configured with her property, being mindful of her property. Is it going to be 10 feet max or could we make it even more than that for a vegetated buffer? Um, you guys usually offer. don't require buffers for residential subdivisions, but if no. you... No, I was just thinking if there's a way to get a, a um, relatively dense vegetated buffer into the setback just uh -huh. to provide something, you know, in terms of doing that. But go ahead. I have to admit, I closed my iPad. Megan, can you? Uh, I just need some I help. Don't, I don't have any, 
Yeah, but what I don't have in front of me um, is where the second dwelling of the initial lot has been approved mm-hmm. and what where that is on the setback. So it's R5, it would have a five foot required setback. Um, okay. And off the top of my head, I don't know where the placement of that Pardon, structure I can tell you, is. There's a duplex being constructed pretty much where your mouse is right, right now in that corner. Okay. Right. Dan, okay. Dan, Dan, would would your would your would would your client be be willing to plan a substantial buffer bet- along the property line? I guess is the, yeah. the question. Um, well, I, what I would say is I could certainly bring that up with them, and I'd probably, assuming we come back for real lot subdivision, um, okay. I think that's when we'd have that discussion. I don't want to. I can't promise something tonight. So I'm just not. No, but, but could you would you please ask him for when you come back? Uh, we we will certainly bring it up. Okay. Um, Thank you. I mentioned um, that he. I had a nice talk with Miles a couple of weeks ago before they dug the foundation. I've always had a good relationship with him. He did offer to help with fencing, but I now I appreciate that, but that's not really enough because okay. fencing isn't going to kind of be as good of a buffer as some kind of trees or something but we're we're, we're going to work on this jill um and th- this is not yeah. this is not over okay so yeah don't, don't lose sleep over it thank right. you i really appreciate okay. all your time and i'm sorry to be a pain in the butt <laughs> all good jill thank you're you not. you're not all good yep um anyone else megan I'm not seeing anyone. Entertain a motion. Close the public hearing, sir. Yeah. Second. Okay, great. Thank you. Barry made the motion, not seconded it. Barry. Aye. Not. Aye. Leslie, did you have a question? No, 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 I'm good. Okay, John. Aye. And I'm an aye. On to the so, merits. So motion to approve at this point with the conditions and findings that we've talked about and suggest a contribution of $2,000 per lot and the addition of the fact that um, this has the potential coming back as a rear lot subdivision. And that's per permit, uh, Barry, not per lot. I'm sorry. Yeah. Per building permit. Yeah. Per building. Okay. I'll second that. I, I would that, say and, per building permit for a dwelling unit because you want to tie it specifically to the intensity. You don't want to be charging them $2,000 every time they need a re-roof or change a window. Right, thank you. And all the verbiage surrounding the the A&R that was in the, in the other decision, decision similar to this. Yeah. Perfect. Great. I have a second. second. Thank you, John. So uh, motion made by Barry, second by John. Barry. Aye. John. Aye. Nat. Aye. And I'm an I. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And we're uh, done. We're almost done. We have public comment for items not listed on the agenda. Oh. Boy. So Jill has her hand up. Jill, is that a leftover? I think it might be. I, I don't have my hand up. I, I pressed oh, the okay. local hand. So I thought I pressed the lower hand. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Bye, Joe. Miss, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. How about a motion to adjourn? I'm not ready yet. Hey. Oh, <laughs> well, okay. Great. We're going to hang out for a while, see if we get any additional comments. Do I have a second? <laughs> Do I have a second? Second. Second. <laughs> Made by Barry, seconded by everyone. Um, <laughs> But I'll give it to John. Barry. Hi. <laughs> John. Hi. Matt. Hi. And I'm an I. Well, welcome to hey. your first meeting, Mr. Chairman. Good job, Dave. Good job. Too late there you to take it back, John. It's not too late. <laughs> I'll be better next time, guys. I promise. You were good. Great tonight. Thank you. Now we Thank we you. had a lot. Thank you. Have a great night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Almost good, night. good morning, but <laughs> good night. <laughs>